Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to What and Where to Invest 2022. The show must go on. Whilst uncertainties and disruptions may still linger in the world, at fsm1.com, we believe that investing is for the long term. It's not about timing the market, it's about time in the market that investors should pay attention to. In order to help you invest globally and profitably, we have an exciting and insightful lineup of presentations today, featuring ideas and sectors that will be beneficial for your portfolios. In addition to these presentations, we've also lined up some exciting activities which you can take part in throughout the day. Now, show your hand and try your luck in our lucky draw. Eight lucky showgoers will each walk away with a $100 FSM1 cash account credit. We've also got three grand prize winners who will receive a $1,000 FSM1 cash account credit each. You can also gain more chances to win the lucky draw by attending the event on both days, visiting sponsor pages, joining our daily quiz, and sharing the event via social media. Each time you do those things, you add to your tally of chances. But do ensure you always use the same ID and email address when logging in. You can also show off your knowledge and participate in the daily quiz. Six winners each day will walk away with a $100 cash account credit each. Do take note of what is shared throughout the event as these will help you in answering the questions. But on top, on top of that, of course, by remembering what was shared, it will be useful for your portfolio. All prizes for these activities have been sponsored by our partners and we'd like to take this opportunity to thank CSOP Asset Management, East Spring Investments and Nickel Asset Management, BlackRock, Franklin Templeton, JP Morgan, UOB Asset Management, Allianz Global Investors, BNY Mellon Investment Management, Newberger Berman, and Schroders for making this event possible. Now, as we gear up for the start of the sessions today, let's kick things off with a poll. To participate in the poll, firstly, click on Agenda and Activities on the menu on the left hand side. Under the agenda, look for poll number one. Then simply click join poll button. The poll window will be displayed on the right. If everyone is ready, let's see what questions we have for today. The poll is a game of never have I ever. If you're ready, question number one. Never have I ever invested in these markets, China, Singapore, US and Europe, emerging markets. For some of these questions, you may have noticed you have more than one valid answer. In these cases, simply pick the one you feel is most relevant. I repeat, simply pick the one you feel is most relevant. Which is your answer? Let's check out the results. While it seems we have 52.94% choosing emerging markets, China is a choice as well at 37.25%. It seems Singapore, US or Europe is one of the more popular markets with only 3.92% choosing Singapore and 5.88% choosing US and Europe. Question number two, never have I ever invested in these asset classes. Options are unit trusts, bonds, stocks, ETFs, managed portfolios and robo portfolios. Last option, none. I'm new to investing. I'm curious about the options you have chosen. Once again, we have many options and if you have more than one valid answer, simply choose the one you feel is most relevant. Never have I ever in these invested in these asset classes. Let's take a look at the option with the biggest vote, 46.15% choosing managed portfolios 
and robo portfolios. It seems that it's a pretty new option, so it's quite fresh in the market. Unit trusts and bonds have also taken a good percentage, and the one with the lowest is actually none. I'm new to investing. All right, let's take a look at question number three. Never have I ever invested in these product types. We've got Forex, cryptocurrencies, options, futures, and CFDs, sustainable and ESG products, real estate and physical property, investment-linked insurance products, ILPs. Never have I ever invested in these product types. We've got quite a lot of options for you today. Make sure to pick the one you feel is the most relevant. Wow, 48% have chosen cryptocurrencies. And Forex and CFDs have also taken a good percentage of our votes. And ILPs seemingly are the ones that are the most popular in our market among our audience today. Wow, this is a pretty good spread and real estate, physical property, sustainable ESG products are all quite common among you. Question number four. Never have I ever invested based on gut feeling, social media posts, unverified news and rumors, analysts' recommendations, and the last option, tips given by family or friends. This is one of our most fun questions today. I'm quite curious to see your answers. Once again, choose the most relevant. Never have I invested based on unverified news or rumors. Well, I, I see we have a lot of very uh, smart and well-versed investors among our audience today. 52.25% of you have chosen unverified news or rumors. And let's take a look at the option with the least votes chosen analyst recommendations following up in second place oh wow gut feeling thank you all for participating that is the end of our poll for today thank you for participating once again now let's begin our very first segment of the day top markets and macro themes to take the crown in 2022 by inviting a few special guests to our show but before that have you watched any memorable movies or TV shows in 2021 that inspired the way you invest in 2021? Let's find out from our panelists. With us today, we have Rusmin Ang, the co-founder of The Fifth Person, Catherine Chua from the investment advisory team at fsm1.com and Jean-Paul Wong, general manager at fsm1.com as they invest in as they discuss investment lessons we can learn from the movies and TVs in 2021. Good morning everybody. Thanks so much uh, for joining us at Why and Where to Invest in 2022. So my name is JP from FSM1.com and uh, I have uh, Catherine from our investment advisory team as well as Rosmin from the fifth person. Hello. Very happy to have all of you join us uh, today, early morning, to listen to the views from our different uh, panelists and uh, investment analysts and fund managers throughout today. I'm very happy to have Rosmin and Kat as well to talk about uh, the investment lessons we can learn from movies and TV shows. Maybe uh, when we talk about movies and TV shows, we don't really think about investment uh, lessons that we could uh, you know, take away from. But uh, I believe uh, my panelists would have uh, very interesting insights uh, to share uh, with you today. So uh, I wanted to go just go through the first uh, question. So have your uh, investment decisions been inspired by any popular movies, TV shows, ads or books and any quotes that have really you know, stood out and uh, stuck with you, you know, all through, throughout all these years of investing. So I'll start with Rosmin. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, okay, good morning, everyone. Um, okay, so I think the one show that I would like to bring up probably this uh, show called uh, Squid Game, right? So I think Squid Game has been very popular over the last couple of months. It's been all-time high for Netflix in terms of viewership. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that was a game where I think based on uh, some Korean childhood games, right? And the players were supposed to play the games and you know the, then the, if they failed the game, they would get eliminated, right? So, mm. uh, and I still remember th the show, uh, okay, if you have not watched uh, Squid Game, obviously there's going to be a major spoiler ahead, right? <laughs> because I have to review some of the games right, yes. in order for, for me to share with you some of the learning lessons. Uh, and the first game was actually this uh, game on uh, red light, green light. 
Uh, you have this uh, some uh, you know, gigantic uh, robot, you know, the lady. Yeah. Right? That's <laughs> and slightly scary looking one. Huh? Yeah, and yeah. you know she start to sing, right? So basically, the game is very simple. Right? The players in the game have to finish the uh, cross the finish line by a certain timing, right? But they have to start uh, whenever there's a green light. Okay, they move, right? When the song stop, they have to stop, right? So that's very light, right? So, uh, so when the game started, there was this guy rushing over, right? And then all of a sudden, he died because he didn't follow the rules, right? Mm -hmm. And he got shot, okay? Uh, and after that, when then the, the song started to sing again and the players started to move, and, but they, this time around, quite a number of them followed the rules, but quite a bunch of them didn't follow the rules, right? And in the end, quite a, a lot of them actually got shot, okay? And you know, when you start to see people getting shot and killed on the spot, on, at the game itself, okay, so a lot of people were panicked. Okay, and they were all trying to rush to the exit. And you know, at the time when these people were not following the rule, they all get shot and they all in the end get killed. Okay? So why this game has a lesson for us in investing, okay, is mainly because how you play the game is how you play or invest in the stock market. Okay? So a lot of time when you play the game under a very stressful env environment, right, you well, your behavior, your, your emotion, all will come up, okay? And yeah. this is the same thing, right? Investing is a very uh, emotional uh, journey for a lot of uh, people. So at the time, you can see that uh, people were panicking, and this is exactly happened in the stock market crash, okay? So uh, I still remember last year, 2020, or two years ago, all right? Yes. <laughs> uh, now we're in the new year. Uh, and you know, when the market crashed, uh, you can see that there was a big dip, right? And that was the fastest correction ever, I ever experienced, right? And it was within, I think, one month, the market has corrected in the US market about 30 over percent. It was a big dip, okay? And a lot of people got scared. And I have some uh, customers actually coming to me saying that, you know, uh, what to buy, okay? But for our customers, it's different because we have trained them, you know, whenever there's a crisis, you need to buy, okay? So I was speaking to uh, Captain Rina, uh, I think the, the other, the, yesterday, uh, and I was sharing with you that he got, she got a lot of calls from your customers asking her which stocks to sell or which fund to sell, okay, at the time during the meltdown. Okay, yeah. so it's quite common to see people panicking whenever there's a crash. Okay, so that's why it's very important, you know, um, in investing, you need to have a rules, right? So same thing in the games that they play, that they play in the squid game. You need to have a rules to follow very strictly. So if you are someone who, uh, you know, figure out that you want to do long-term investing over the long run, okay, you don't panic in this kind of situation, right? Whenever there's a big sell down, you got to seek through your principle. You don't move, right? Otherwise, you're going to get killed. Okay, because when people move, when they are not supposed to move, in the stock market, basically they sell. When they are not supposed to sell, that's where they buy high, sell low. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I think that is something that uh, the squid game is a very interesting game I shared because it reflects a lot of our behaviors. Right. Although we don't play the game, but you get to see a lot of how people behave, and that's actually very similar. A lot of parallel that you can draw in between investing and also in the game itself. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Seems like you're a huge fan. Uh, <laughs> I'm not the just me, I, game. Think <laughs> <other people. laughs> I don't know whether Catherine, you also uh, got bitten by the Squid Game bug as well <laughs> last year. <laughs> yes, actually, um, I also uh, did watch the show, and um, I mean, apart from the game itself, uh, mm. I do think that there's a lot of um, parallels in terms of the personal finance um, perspective, because like. Um, um, what actually draw um, most of, in fact, all of the contestants mm. into the game is because like how they have actually poorly managed their finance. Um, so like for instance, the protagonist, um, he actually, um, uh, how do you say, um, uh, hooked on gambling and then like um, he borrowed a lot of money um, and then he, he just like trying to um, bet on a single like a horse or like um, those, uh, I would think it's something similar to um, investing as well. Sometimes yeah. people just want to go for the quick guard. Uh, quick buck and want to make like um, get rich quick yes. so they'll just try to put all their um, eggs into one basket and yeah. um, hope that um, this kind of situation would turn around in their favor and you know they can get rich quick yeah which um, I do think is very dangerous especially um, and also um, the parallel that um, the protagonist um, the mother went into the hospital mm -hmm. um, because of some uh, diabetic um, problems and they had to actually go for surgery and I thought it was very upsetting at um, one point that um, the, the parents actually, I said the mom uh, actually could not go for the surgery because um, he said that they had terminated all those um, insurance um, or all those um, health policies. Yeah, so I do think that it's
is like um, a, a very uh, sad, a very sad tone and that was what actually urged him to go into the game um, and play all these. Even the um, protagonist's um, childhood friend, um, he also sold his um, mom's store and the home um, to leverage up on his dad and yeah. to play on all these um, very high-risk instruments, <laughs> which I do think that there's really a lot of high-risk instruments, especially you're talking about speculative stocks and all. So I do think all... crypto th and me yeah. stocks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So uh, I think it's very dangerous that, um, I mean, should we invest a very huge chunk of our investment portfolio in these these kind of uncertain um, um, stocks. I mean, yes, you may get rich quick, but um, at what ex expense? Like, you could lose everything the next day. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, in real life, there's no squid game for us to play, so um, <laughs> it's really a very high risk um, yeah. Yeah, option for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I'm the only one who haven't watched the show. <laughs> spoiler. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of spoiler alerts here for me, but uh, I'll probably catch it after the event. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to yeah, uh, just catch on uh, a couple of points you shared. Uh, I think first, uh, I think uh, the psychology, I think investing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I remember reading uh, a couple of phrases or even in the Intelligent Investor by Benjamin uh, Graham that uh, actually... I think the chief problem we all have uh, as investors is actually our mindset. Uh, it's not maybe the fact that uh, the interest rates are going to shoot up faster this year in March instead of June. Yeah. It's not maybe because inflation is going to rise up by 100 basis points more than expected. Or whether you know, the regulators are going to crack down harder, let's say on Chinese tech and so on. It's really what we do. And I think uh, behind all that is uh, what's the plan? Uh, or why are we investing? I think if we know why we are investing, uh, a lot of things just become uh, clearer in terms of what we should do, like the few steps. And maybe you'll have your, uh, your red and green lines in terms of what you shouldn't do no, or I can do yeah. or cross, right? Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and so on. So that's uh, how I think, uh, uh, that's one of the things I think I took away from many years of investing and also from last year. Yeah. So I'll move on to last year. So last year, uh, just to go back to how the markets have performed, um, you know, the U.S. Uh, just continues to uh, do so well, uh, you know, just keep getting uh, or reaching record highs, uh, would be the S&P 500, Dow Jones, or even your NASDAQ. And the uh, U.S. market here, uh, as you can see, uh, one of the top performing behind Taiwan. Uh, but of course, uh, Singapore, our whole market, uh, did uh, fairly well too uh, last year. Uh, despite you know all the challenges uh, that we have gone through the last two years uh, because of the pandemic and also you know uh, the restrictions and being a very open economy, obviously that has an impact on us. But I think uh, low base from 2020, 2021, then uh, uh, it got better in terms of earnings outlook for a lot of the Singapore companies. The interesting stuff here as well, it's uh, I think China and uh, Hong Kong uh, to some extent are very related. So those uh, performed badly. I think uh, the, 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 the surprise there was really the Chinese uh, authorities coming in uh, to crack down uh, on various sectors. Really, uh, 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 and that I think uh, surprised quite a number of uh, investors in terms of the in, uh, extent and impact. And uh, digital economy as well, I think our team uh, of analysts at uh, IFAS, we were also cautioning a bit. We like the team a lot and we still have exposure to it in our managed portfolios, but we felt like the valuations have gone up quite a bit. And I think last year uh, is actually down, uh, despite you know, uh, all this uh, positive news about uh, digital uh, economy-driven kind of stocks, right? But I think because they have run up a lot in 2020 especially. Yeah. So 2021, there was a bit of a correction. So that's a bit of a backdrop. So uh, I just wanted to ask uh, the two of you, for you, what was the Oscar-worthy moment from the markets last year and uh, why was it so impactful for you? Yeah. Kat? Okay, so uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll start first. I think like the Oscar-worthy moment that was like, um, uh, it's about the China tech regulatory um, concern. Like after its peak in February, um, it just went downhill even till today. Uh, I think year to date it's more than 40%. Uh, I mean, since the peak, it has been more than 40% losses in this segment. So I do think that it's really very Oscar worthy because it's something that um, uh, nobody has, uh, f had expected it to happen. And also, um, 
um, the later part of 2021 is also within the Chinese um, equity space, but more of the um, property developers, like all those um, highly leveraged property developers. Uh, I would think it's like very drama-like situation because um, it's like really week after week, um, we do hear um, negative news uh, from various uh, different companies. So like even, uh, I think it's Oscar worthy because like, is something that we have never seen is unprecedented like the yields for all these um, high yield bonds even for like a triple B bonds typically they will raise that at like about 2 to 3 percent but we are looking at triple B bonds going at like 9 to 10 percent it's really unheard of and um, I really thought that um, like it could really be the end of the world I mean uh, I mean China is so strong on its um, developers um, uh, property development real estate segment yeah, so I do think this is really very um, Oscar-worthy, uh, yeah. Yeah, really like one of the highlights and uh, like what Rosemi was saying, probably quite a number of clients uh, contacted you as well yeah. uh, over, you know, concerns on uh, China, to some extent, Asian high yield, China high yield bonds, right? Yeah. yeah. So Rosemi, how about you? What's your Oscar-worthy uh, moment? My Oscar-worthy moments will probably be the pace of how the stock market actually has changed over the years, right? So I think the full cycle of the stock market before the pandemic, it was usually the 10-year cycle. Uh, and, you know, the last one, the previous one, the before the lemon butter collapse, it, we actually saw that uh, the cycle started to have a bull run in 2003. Right? All the way to 2007, it peaked there, and then the market started to correct down in 08, 09. Uh, that was where the bottom is, right? And then it started to recover, I think, fully recover only by 2012. So it took almost 10 years for the full cycle. But, you know, last couple of years, it's mm. quite interesting. We saw the whole full cycle in that short span of uh, two years. Yeah. Okay, so that was a moment where, you know, for those who started to learn investing, obviously that is a good thing because you don't need to wait that long to see a full cycle. Now yes. it happens just within that two years, okay? And uh, what I also realized that another Oscar moment was that there's a big shift in terms of how information is actually being delivered. In the past, it used to be broker, right? Yeah. That can move the market or some stock manipulator that they work each other, you know, you call it chunky, right? Yeah. Uh, and also some media, newspapers, sometimes you write certain company that Shepard will move up. But nowadays, it's no longer moved by all those stuff. Uh, it's moved by social media. You have uh, Twitters, you have your TikTok, people yeah. recommending stocks to buy, uh, cryptos, and then a lot of meme, meme stocks. Okay, yeah. Those are what I call it as meme stocks. Uh, and that actually has shifted. Uh, so the way we invest, and we actually now being exposed to a lot of noises in the market. So I just want to cautious, you know, all of you here uh, is that you know when you start to open your YouTube or even uh, Twitter or even you know some of the TikTok, you, know, you start to follow some many financial influencer, right? And you start to get influenced by them subconsciously, right? whether they like it or not. When you hear to their pitch, you know you will be influenced by their idea. Okay, so it's important to choose the right people to follow. Okay, that's important. And second is that uh, if you choose the wrong people to follow. Uh, you're going to get flooded with a lot of noises. Okay, so when you're flooded with a lot of noises, at the end of the day, you will get very confused. And that's why if you, for me, I do a lot of uh, fundamental investing, long-term investing. So uh, I feel that there are a lot of more noises out there right now versus 10 years ago before the smartphone became very popular. Yeah. So that has been a dramatic shift in terms of uh, how we actually make decisions today. Okay, so you need to be very aware of that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree with you, Rosmin. Uh, just uh, the perspectives have changed so much in just a short period of <laughs> yes. time. And if you imagine if you started investing, like uh, you know, you were saying in the last one to two years, uh, it just seems so easy to make quick money, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's yeah. like uh, what crisis? Uh, I mean, they probably like say, "What? You're, you're not buying crypto? Then you're a boomer, right?" <laughs> so things like that. And I, uh, I also would like to, uh, of course, uh, caution that. Uh, uh, you know, just now there was a poll, right? Uh, uh, never have I invested uh, right. in cryptos. So 50%, 48%, close to half. So actually quite a bit of uh, viewers and investors yes. are actually have started uh, taking uh, their first step in the crypto uh, market. And I think um, uh, to me, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit of a red flag, I think, uh, if uh, you know, uh, investors are just focusing on, let's say, crypto to, to plan out their investing plan. So it's back to my first point just now about having that plan and why we have the plan because uh, it's going to be super volatile because it's not based on fundamental uh, factors uh, of investing. Yes. I think when we buy a stock, um, it's really based on uh, you know, fundamentals as to whether it's attractive to, let's say, buy into this company because of its earnings potential in the next one to two years. 
because of the management team, we think it's solid. They are yeah. not uh, smoking us, we think, yeah. uh, and things like that. So there are concrete fundamental factors that drive us to think, okay, it's cheap to go in even after it has crashed, say, 30%. Uh, but for crypto, after it has crashed 30%, People are saying, some people are saying, oh, buy on the dips, but based on what factors? Uh, so it's based on just, oh, well, uh, it's 30% cheaper, and that's it, uh, essentially. So uh, that's a bit of a concern, I think, as well, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the trends. And I see some of my friends already buying into it, so they're probably part of the, uh, you know, almost half yeah. of the, now <laughs> the when audience. Goes, yeah. Now <laughs> when you go social gathering, it is, uh, it is, uh, it, NFT cryptos are the NFT, topic now. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So, and uh, it just gets a very uh, blurry as well. So, you know, the conversation on metaverse and NFTs and your cryptos just gets all uh, lumped together. <laughs> uh, but I think there are very different uh, considerations, uh, even like blockchain, even if it's a solid technology, uh, today and in the future, it doesn't mean that uh, crypto will benefit because of blockchain technology, for example. So I think uh, we need to be clear on the separation of these uh, different concepts. Yeah. And uh, it also brings me to uh, another point. Uh, I mean, I didn't watch all the Squid Game shows, but uh, uh, I was just trying to think uh, what movie uh, or what line from a movie that I remember. And I, I remember this, uh, this line from Forrest Gump. Yeah, I think it was the end of the show. Uh, when I first watched it the first time, I was quite uh, young. Uh, so the movie came out in 94, by the way. So uh, 1994. So I remember he, he was like looking at a letter. So it was uh, sent from the stock company. And there was uh, that little colorful uh, logo sign. So he said, oh, uh, apparently uh, he heard that he has made a lot of money because uh, there was some money uh, that was invested for him in that company that he calls a, a, a fruit company. So make a guess, what's that fruit company? <laughs> With a logo sign. <laughs> I have no idea. So it's Apple. Apple, <laughs> yes. ah, okay. So imagine he, he without him knowing, uh, he actually bought into, uh, someone bought for him. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, if we fast forward to, let's say today, that investment, I think, uh, it, I was trying to check on Google, I think it was like equivalent to about 3% uh, back then in Apple. So uh, that would be worth, I don't know, tens of billions of dollars. Uh, today. And uh, the interesting thing about that, of course, is also that I think Forrest Gump was saying, uh, oh, uh, oh, I made a lot of money, uh, one worry less. And I think that is uh, something that is uh, very true. Uh, money should be a way for us to achieve uh, our objectives that we want. So whether it's for me to want to have uh, retirement money, passive income, whether my kids have their education funds in place. And uh, to me, if I can have a solid plan, then it's one worry less uh, for me. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I got a rush. I think we talked quite a bit <laughs> and quite long. <laughs> we can go on for quite long, I guess. So going to 2022, just maybe what's your favorite uh, ideas or investments? So I'll start with Rosmin. Um, I think I'm very aggressive in uh, Chinese uh, market uh, because the valuation has actually been very attractive, especially the Chinese uh, tech scene. I think the valuation is actually at all-time low. Uh, if you compare to the last uh, COVID 2020 low, it's actually way lower than that. Okay, So Chinese tech space is an area where I think you guys probably want to look at. Although uh, it has been uh, politicized in the West or where a lot of Americans actually view Chinese stock as uninvestable because it's run by communists, a bunch of communists, right? So I think that is not true because China is actually very similar to Singapore. So we can totally understand how China, China is actually being run. And, you know, the, and a lot of our quality companies are actually being punished and traded at a historical low valuation. Okay? So that is the area where I think it should be aggressive, but more, I'm more conservative toward U.S. market. Like you said, U.S. is one of the best performers last year, but then you don't want to go into that area because in the next couple of years, that may not be the best market to be in. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, actually, riding you? on um, Rusty's point, uh, <laughs> I was actually also going to talk about the same segment uh, for yeah. a tactical exposure. Definitely, uh, Chinese tech stock looks very attractive. And I want to bring up a quote um, by Warren Buffett. He always says that um, be fearful when everyone is greedy and be greedy when everyone is fearful. So right now at this valuation, uh, you look at all the shares, um, the prices where they are trading at, um, even big names, they are even lower, in, lower than 2018, like pre-US-China trade war um, time.
time. So, I mean, if you're looking at companies today, the revenues are still growing, um, their fundamentals are still solid, and we do think that these kind of uh, regulatory um, pressures, uh, probably they are not meant to stifle the growth of the companies, um, and I would think this would benefit the companies in the long run. So, if um, investors had not yet to be invested, uh, I do think it's a very opportune time uh, to look into this, and it's definitely one of our house call um, for 2022. Yeah, and also um, if those who had already invested, say uh, last year or you know just right before the peak, uh, I do think that uh, if it's not a very huge chunk of your portfolio yet, you may consider to dollar cost average in as well because um, yeah, this are a space that we like. Um, we still like the companies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for all these ideas. I I, I, I agree with them as well. And uh, I was talking about the plan. So I think plan. Uh, one way I do it is have a core and a supplementary. Core is all your you know your big uh, investments, solid foundation ideas. So within that space, I would say I'll go for Asia, X Japan equities. Of course, a lot of it is in China. So mm-hmm. why? Well, it's really because the valuation uh, point of view is uh, is some is bashed. So. Uh, it's, uh, it's fairly cheap compared to a lot of regions. I think Europe also looks uh, good in that core uh, portfolio. Supplementary, try to keep it smaller, 10, 20% of the overall size because these are your more tactical, a bit more high-risk kind of uh, volatile ideas. So I say within that space, Chinese stack, yes. And I think Chinese semicons as well because of all the yeah. uh, catalysts and support from the government to push their own you know, homegrown sectors, including semicons. So uh, those uh, would be my key ideas. So just to wrap up, so if you're going to be a character for a TV movie or a show, which one would you be, Rosmin? Uh, my actual character that I, I admire is actually Charlie Munger, not so much on the show, right? So okay. I think this is a guy that is brilliant, you know, he knows, he writes so much and yet he's still so humble, down yeah. to earth, yeah. He has never made a mistake before, <laughs> so I couldn't learn from him, but he shared a lot of psychological stuff when it comes to investing, which yes. is, uh, a lot of people don't touch, you know. Psychology yeah. is a big part of your investment that actually influences on how you make decisions yeah. day in, day out. Yeah. yeah, totally agree. It's all about the mindset and <laughs> how you stay calm when people are panicking around you, right? Like yeah. you were saying in the first example for Squid Game. Yeah. How about you, Kat? Um, for me, I would prefer uh, to be the character in one of the um, shows on Disney, uh, Loki, uh, <laughs> the guy who is... Uh, they call it he who remains. So basically, he guards the sacred timeline, uh, and he has a team of timekeepers that will um, prevent any deviation f- uh, to create a multiverse. Yeah. So basically, this dude, uh, why I like him uh, is because he knows everything. So I would think in this, um, in a real life situation, he will definitely be the Mister Know It All, and uh, of course, he will never ever make a mistake as well. Maybe like <laughs> Charlie Munger. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I'll wrap up by saying that uh, Charlie Munger is, I think, one of the, the related. Uh, uh, grandfather of uh, value investing, Benjamin Graham. If you haven't yeah. read that book, uh, Intelligent Investor, it's, it's a great, great start uh, to look into fundamental investing. That's really going to help you uh, throughout your investing journey, I think, uh, for many, many years or decades. So with that, uh, that brings uh, the panel discussion of the very first one, why and where to a close. Uh, we still have a lot of programs. Colin is coming up next on his best market ideas for 2022. So once again, thank you to the audience uh, uh, for being with us and to Rosmin and Kat so much. Uh, thank you so much for all your ideas and sharings. So thank you. Thank you, Rosmin, Catherine, and John Paul. And John Paul is right. Our next speaker is Colin Lo, Assistant Manager, Macro Research from IFA Singapore. Colin will be sharing views on the current market narrative, top macro themes in 2022, and what this means for your asset allocations for 2022. So, let's welcome Colin. Hi everyone, welcome to What and Where to Invest 2022. I'm Colin, Assistant Manager of IFAS Macro Research Team. And today in this session, I'll be sharing the top markets and macro teams for the year. I'll begin by sharing our views across asset classes, in particular, global equities and fixed income. And next, I'll talk about one of the biggest macro teams of last year, which is inflation and the interest rate outlook. Subsequently, I'll share our views on the major developed and equity and emerging equity markets before concluding with our views on the fixed income universe and in particular the IG bonds as well as the high yield bonds. So uh, right, let us uh, start to take a look at the global equity markets. So for global equities, we expect fundamentals to remain supportive and will be a pivotal factor in driving equity upside this year. We expect the global economic recovery to continue, fueled by more reopenings, particularly in Asia. 
While the Omicron variant acts as a growth risk, global COVID death rates have fortunately remained low and vaccination rates are climbing steadily. Therefore, in our base case, we do not see Omicron Omicron as a severe growth risk holding back the recovery. And looking ahead, we expect global GDP to continue its growth at 4.4% this year. Similarly, global earnings recovery should also continue its run. As shown on the chart by the right, we expect global earnings to grow by 7% this year. While there will be some EPS normalisation moving ahead, growth rates should remain positive this year as well as the next. Overall, fundamentals should remain robust and continue to lend support to global equities. Contrary to uh, equities, 2021 was not a good year for fixed income. As shown on the chart, bonds had a pretty lacklustre run last year. Fortunately, uh, unfortunately, it is, un it is likely that this year may remain challenging to fixed income and we view the asset class to be relatively less attractive as first, many segments are now offering limited value with credit spreads trading extremely tight relative to history. Second, with yields relatively low versus history and credit spreads having little room for compression, we expect moderate upside for most fixed income segments this year. Third, the macro backdrop this year remains challenging for fixed income. With the Fed likely to hike interest rate in 2022, the asset class remains vulnerable to price declines. Also, elevated inflation levels are now eating to real return for these bonds. Therefore, taking all this factor into consideration, we expect equities to outperform fixed income this year and prefer to stay overweight the former. So now let us talk about inflation, which has been one of the major macro themes for the year. So over the past two quarters, it has become increasingly obvious that US inflation is taking longer than expected to dissipate. If you look at the inflation data, US monthly CPI has remained above 5% since May last year. Furthermore, data are now showing higher prices across inflation components such as wages and shelter which are sticky in nature and tend to result in more, more stubborn inflation. And moving ahead, our team expects inflation to remain elevated in 2022 as well as 2023. And in line with that, we also expect the Fed to kickstart its rate hike cycle for this year. Investors should therefore stay away from longer duration fixed income assets. And the other thing to note here is that higher prices are now starting to have a material impact. And as shown on the chart by the left, the US PPI data has surged drastically in 2021. In fact, the CPI to PPI spreads are near the lowest level since 1974. And this implies that businesses are having trouble passing the along the entirety of the higher costs to consumers. And as a result of this, it is very likely that we might see some profit headwinds for US businesses this year. And this is something that we are watching for closely. So now let us move on to DM equities, starting with the US. So US equities have had a good run last year as the easy monetary backdrop, robust economic recovery, as well as a strong earnings growth fueled US equities outperformance. However, equity valuation remains a key focus. Valuation metrics are currently very stretched and has priced in many positives, leaving little room for risk. For instance, the S&P 500 index is currently trading at around 30% premium to its historical average in terms of forward PE ratio. Even compared to other DMs such as Europe and Japan, US equities are trading at a larger than average premium. And another thing to note here is that while valuations remain uh, elevated, earnings growth has slightly peaked in 2021. We expect earnings growth to normalize, coming in at around 8-10% to for both this year as well as the next. Consensus remains optimistic on US earnings, but we, however, remain vigilant for and looking for signs of earning weakness. And beneath the hood, if you look at the US corporates' uh, earnings data, we can find that US corporates are now facing rising cost pressures given higher material costs as well as higher wages. And these have begun to show up on the various cost metrics. While the impact on profits uh, at the current moment uh, remains slightly mild, we expect the earnings uh, itself to come under some pressure later on in the year as the profit compression might build when the cost builds as well as when economic growth moderates. Further, as shown on the chart by the left, the positive earnings revision for many major sectors such as your IT, consumer discretionary as well as comm services have also stalled last quarter. And on a bottom-up basis, the magnitude and number of companies beating earning estimates are also declining as well. At the current valuation level, we therefore see rising likelihood of valuation contraction given a potential profit compression and earnings disappointment later in the year. 
Overall, based on our forecast, we expect low upside potential from US equity by end 2023. And instead, we see better options elsewhere, especially in other DMs, and recommend to underweight US equities moving ahead. So uh, now let us shift our focus uh, from US equities to European equities. And despite the challenging month in December due to Omicron fears, we believe European equities remain an attractive value cycle play on the global recovery given three core reasons. First, the index itself has a globalised revenue exposure where international revenue makes up almost 60% of the index. Two, the index also possess a pro cyclical tilt. And three, the ECB has relatively more dovish policies. And this means that an ongoing uh, global economic recovery, which is our base case, should be very supportive of European equity performance. Furthermore, if you look at corporate earnings, uh, which themselves are very leveraged to the global economy, are expected to grow above long-term trend over the next few years. To put things uh, into context, EPS for European equities grew at a 10-year uh, KGA rate of 4% before COVID hits. And looking ahead, we expect EPS growth over the next few years to double at around 7-8%, to 8%, as illustrated on the chart by the right. Additionally, European equities are now trading at attractive valuations, which is decent on a historical basis, but cheap on a relative basis. Firstly, European equities on aggregate are trading below our target fair PE of 16.5 times. And secondly, European equities are trading at an increasing discount to US equities, denoted by the declining relative forward PE ratio shown on the chart by the left. What made this interesting is that performances for both equities were roughly the same during this period as shown by the flattish price ratio. And a quick look at relative valuation shows that European equities are in fact trading at a 27% discount to its US counterpart, which is significantly larger than the historical average of 16%. And taken all together, this implies strong relative value coming from European equities. Therefore, we believe valuation expansion in conjunction with decent earnings growth should drive a fairly strong upside potential of around 13% by end 2023. That said, we do not expect a smooth sailing journey ahead and we are watching for possible near-term growth risks as well as uh, we expect higher price volatility given the surge in Omicron cases. Next, let us move on to one of the top markets we have this year, which is Hong Kong equities. And if you look at 2021, uh, no doubt it wasn't a good year for Hong Kong equities. But aside from the poor market performance, we note that fundamentals themselves have not materially worsened. And a quick look at corporate earnings show that EPS has been revised upwards in 2021 and growth estimates remain res resilient despite the market turbulence. Furthermore, our team sees double-digit earnings growth for this year and expect the strong growth to be fueled by the Chinese tech giants as well as the Chinese financials. As shown on the ta top, uh, table by the top, consensus expects the major Chinese tech giants to generate considerable earnings growth this year as profitability remains firm despite the ongoing regulation. Furthermore, if earnings growth can meet market expectations, we expect valuations for this company to be rate higher, thereby driving the index equity performance. For Chinese financials, it is evident that the sector itself is receiving more support. We expect a healthy rebound in loan growth this year and further credit stabilizing policy by the Chinese government. This market as well as policy-driven factors should altogether bolster the bank's profitability. And another major factor why we like the Hong Kong equities is the ongoing reform for the Hang Seng Index. So with this reform, effectively the number of its components will likely increase to 80 by mid-2022. And the proportion of new economic stocks in the HSI will certainly climb. And essentially the inclusion of more high-growth companies should also greatly boost the index earnings growth as well as the re-rating potential over the longer run. While one may argue that there is more exposure to regulatory risk from this reform. We believe that these headwinds are likely shorter in nature and much have been baked in equity prices. Ultimately, we expect these headwinds, which are longer term in nature, these uh, tailwinds which are longer term in nature, to outweigh the headwinds. And that said, we believe Hong Kong equities demonstrate a high growth, low valuation characteristic, which we favour, and we therefore expect an upside potential of more than 50% by end 2023. So now let's move to EM equities and starting with China. And many of you may already know that 2021 was a challenging year for China equities where the region's performance was severely held back by a mix of regulatory risks as well as economic growth concern. And that said, we believe things may change this year. 
While economic growth has indeed been slowing in China, the good news is that policy direction is now decisively in easing mode. Over the past quarter, we have seen multiple easing measures implemented by the People's Bank of China and also policies by the government to stabilise the housing sector. We are therefore closely watching for the China's credit impulse, which is shown on the chart by the left. The 12-month net change in credit impulse, which is often a leading indicator of economic momentum and earnings growth, is now showing signs of reversing as more easy policies kick in. Another major positive factor is that base effect should also be turning easier and supportive for economic data in a couple months' time. Additionally, based on our observation, the tightening of regulation across the different industries has also moderated lately. While regulatory pressure, in our view, is likely to remain this year, the good news is that it will likely moderate given China's slowing growth. And therefore, in 2022, we expect regulatory headwinds to ease and economic growth to stabilise, which may signal a potential upwards revision in GDP and earning estimates, and therefore lending support to China equities. We think overall China equities have priced in a lot of pessimism due to the regulatory headwinds. And this is reflected by the forward PE ratio, which has fallen by more than five points from a high of 19 times since February last year, captured on the chart by the RLF. And what made this more interesting is that the China equities are expected to generate strong double-digit earnings growth of 14 to 18% in 2022 and 2023, which makes valuation even more attractive on a forward basis. And last but not least, based on our projection, China equities boasts an attractive upside potential of around 40% by end 2023, driven by a strong mix of earnings growth as well as valuation expansion. So taking all these factors into consideration, we believe 2022 should be a better year for China equities, which are looking more attractive. And now let's move on to India. And India itself was a top uh, performing market last year. If you were to look at the macro data as well as the earnings data for Indian equities, they have both rebounded relatively strong. And the rebound itself took place mostly in the second half of this year where the COVID situation has greatly improved. As the domestic retail investors turned overwhelmingly optimistic, Indian equities actually rallied fast and hard and therefore have priced in this positive in valuation and therefore you can see that valuations have now reached new highs. And despite the brief derating in the previous quarter, most of the valuation metrics are still at an extreme and are also expensive relative to history as well as against EM peers. Take for example the forward PE ratio for the Sensex index, which is shown on this chart right here. It is currently trading at around 40% premium over the long-term average. And in, in our view, this makes Indian equities more vulnerable to valuation contraction, which we think can come from negative catalysts such as a rebound in energy prices, central bank rate hikes, and Omicron growth risks. So at the same time, when we look at the flow data, it suggests that the recent strong performance in Indian equities is arguably tactical in nature as investors shifted their exposure from China equities. So this may also unwind if equity risk builds. And that said, despite all these uh, drawbacks, we do see long-term growth potential in the Indian economy as well as the equity markets, particularly with India's position as a key beneficiary of the global supply chain relocation from China. And all this arises partly due to the ongoing US-China tension and China's shift away from a manufacturing growth model. So broadly, our team sees this as a multi-decade trend that should serve as a structural tailwind for Indian equities. And overall, with the risk-reward for Indian equities fairly balanced, we maintain a neutral uh, rating on Indian equities moving ahead. But we may revisit our stance should valuation turn more reasonable. So moving from equities to fixed income, let us now take a look at investment grade bonds. So starting with the positive, we expect a continued corporate recovery this year given the supportive macro and policy backdrop. All this should result in stronger corporate balance sheets and improvement in credit metrics for many issuers. Global liquidity itself should remain supportive as well, while the Fed's pace of asset purchase will reduce this year with the, uh, with the probability of it uh, reversing, we still see the asset balance, uh, balance sheet itself remaining uh, much, much, much higher than what we've seen pre-COVID. And overall, the higher policy rates, uh, which many of the investors are, con ha are having concerns about, uh, should likely occur only in the second half of this year. And as such, given those factors, we think that liquidity backdrop itself should remain supportive for credit for most of the year. And that said, uh, we look at the drawbacks for IG bonds, it is quite obvious. So the drawbacks are that credit spreads are extremely tight. 
So spreads itself, as shown on the chart right here, are near historical lows for many of the key segments. And in our view, the IG bonds offer limited value. So the other thing to note here is that yields for IG bonds, which are relatively low to begin with, have declined significantly. So this poses uh, many challenges because, number one, rising inflation, which is our base case, reduces the real return for IG bonds. And two, the risk-free rate uh, of US, uh, the, the risk-free US treasuries are now becoming more attractive given the comparable yields, which may result in a reduced demand for IG bonds. So within the IG bond space, our preference lies with the Asian IG bonds. So our preference is anchored, in fact, by three main reasons. Firstly, Asian IG bonds is one of the few investment grade segments which offer relative value. Yes, the higher spreads itself may imply more credit risk, but over the past few quarters, credit fundamentals for Asian IG has stabilized. So for example, if you look at the Moody's upgrade to downgrade ratio for Asian issuers, <coughs> you'll find that the ratio have seemingly bottomed out in the third quarter of last year, as more issuers are now seeing credit upgrades relative to downgrades. And second, Asian IG bonds boast a, higher, a more attractive combination of higher yields as well as a shorter duration. And overall, this implies that the segment itself is more resilient to higher interest rate as it takes a larger rise in interest rates to offset the yield over a fixed period. And lastly, we see the scope for Asian IG bonds to outperform its peers given its higher yield and room for spread compression. In particular, the incremental easing of policies in China should lead to spread compression in, Asia, in China IG bonds, which itself is a significant component within the Asian IG bonds. So now let us move on to the high yield bond space. And as I previously highlighted, corporate fundamentals and liquidity backdrop should prove supportive for riskier fixed income segments. Additionally, the rebound in energy prices, the restart in manufacturing activities, as well as the recovery in global consumers have really supported many large risky sectors such as your energy, industrial and consumers. And therefore, with this development, as well as a more supportive backdrop, we believe that the credit risk for issuers will likely be manageable this year and will not be a key concern for high yield bonds. Also, as a result of the improving credit fundamentals and the ongoing hunt for yield, we expect demand for higher yield bonds to remain firm from both a retail as well as an institutional player perspective. And from a technical uh, standpoint, high yield issuers should be met with favourable demands and strong inflows with, which will be supportive for the asset class. However, with the tightening of monetary policy in the US and to some extent globally as well, we do, not expect more vol we, we do expect more volatility in credit spreads for high yield bonds as compared to last year. But nonetheless, we do see stronger upside potential for high yield bonds relative to IG bonds and thus prefer the former moving ahead. Within the high yield space, we prefer Asia high yield bonds. And the primary concern for Asia high yield bonds is definitely on the Chinese property sector. While we still believe the property sector will still be under pressure this year and we do not rule out the further defaults. However, we base, based on our estimates, the default risk should be manageable as one, the policy direction in China is decisively in easing mode. And two, there are more policies targeting China policy, uh, property sector. And lastly, key officials, including President Xi, are all now in agreement to stabilize the property sector. Furthermore, we believe credit spreads for Asian high yield bonds, which are around 8 to 9%, have priced in the heightened risk of the Chinese property issuers. And the spread compression in 2022 looks likely based on the macro outlook of, China, uh, of Asian markets, as well as the direction of Chinese policy. And also, if Asia high yield bonds are able to manage the upcoming bond maturities this year, which many are concerned about, it may also lead to further spread compression. And lastly, Asia high yield bonds also boast one of the highest yield to duration ratio amongst the high yield bond space, which means that prices are now more resilient to interest rate movement. And overall, we think that the risk reward for Asia high yield bonds have certainly become more favourable lately. And we, moving ahead, we do find that the asset class remains attractive. And our recommendation, of course, for investors is to opt for an active approach when investing in Asian high yield bonds. All right, and with that, I've come to the end of my presentation. And I hope the viewers have some valuable takeaways through today's presentation. And once again, thank you for your time and have a great year ahead. Thank you, Colin. China equities had a woeful 2021, plagued by drastic regulatory changes, power and production changes, as well as bond defaults. But 
we believe the market has the potential in 2022 to rise from the ashes of 2021 like a phoenix. To give us more insight, we have with us Danny Tang, fund manager from IFAS China, to share about the three sectors we are most positive on in the world's second largest economy, that is China. Also joining us in this discussion is Chloe Halim, equity analyst at IFAS Singapore. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm Chloe, an equity analyst from IFAS Singapore. With me today is Danny, a fund manager from IFAS China. Danny will be sharing more about what's next for China in 2022, as well as three sectors in which they are positive on. Following which, we will have a Q&A segment. So Danny, would you like to start? Uh, hello everyone, uh, this is uh, Danny Tang from FS uh, China Research Team. Uh, before I give you our view on what's next for China in 2022, I want to give a brief review on our past uh, views towards China's market during past several years. Uh, because it's important for you to understand what's our view uh, for China in 2022. At the beginning of each year, uh, we will give our pretty straightforward outlook uh, after over 30% drop uh, of China Asia in 2018, uh, most of investors had very negative feeling towards the market. However, for us, uh, we see a great potential. We state that 50% uh, upside potential uh, in two years by the end of 2020 uh, in China, even at least uh, US China trade friction. It turns out the market has raised over uh, 30% uh, in 2019 alone. Investors start uh, to doubt if the market will still uh, rise uh, in 2020. Uh, our, our call still stick to uh, our call at the beginning of uh, uh, 2019. Uh, uh, there is uh, still a 20% upside potential in 2020, uh, even after a 30% increase in 2019 already. The result have proved our view. Uh, China Asia has become the second best market uh, in 2019 uh, and, and 2020, if we look at the accumulative return. Uh, time to early 2021, uh, we saw the market sentiment become very hot after two years of bull market. Uh, we start to ask our investors to calm down and lower their return expectation within the next two years. Uh, we did another two years forecast and uh, we will only have 10% upside by the end of 2020, as uh, started from the beginning of 2021. When we lost the uh, forecast, a lot of investors uh, in China uh, didn't believe us uh, because the market was too good in 2019 and 2020. The positive sentiment was still there at the beginning of last year. By the middle of uh, February last year, the market uh, has already raised 10%. But uh, after the Chinese New Year Festival of uh, 2021, the market has a huge correction, uh, around 50% drop. Uh, by the end of last year, the market had a negative return of uh, 5.2%. Uh, for the whole year. So now, uh, what's the forecast uh, for? Uh, is the forecast of a cumulative return a 10% in year 2021 and uh, year 2022 still hold? Uh, what's the next for China in 2021? Before I give the answer, uh, I want to give a little bit of information of how we did the projection. Our methodology is uh, fundamental analysis. Uh, this is a, uh, there is a ratio called the PE. Uh, which I believe most of, of our investors uh, know it. Uh, it is a ratio that measures a company or a sector's current share uh, price uh, relative to its earning, uh, which equals to a price divided by earning. Uh, after we do a little bit uh, modification to this equation, uh, we get the price equals to the earning uh, multiplied by PE, which means if the price market wants to go up, uh, it is either has to uh, has good earning or its valuation 
uh, is uh, very attractive, and the PE uh, needs to go up. By the end of uh, uh, 2018, uh, we see China Asia's PE ratio is uh, only 10.3 times, uh, compared to its fair PE 13 times. Uh, there is a 30% uh, increase of PE, and the, the and we analyze the China Asia as a whole. We have uh, around 20% uh, increase from earning in 2019 and 2020. Uh, therefore, uh, when we compare it together, we have a 50% upside potential in 2019 and 2020. Using the same methodology, uh, the, situ the situation become very different by the end of uh, 2020 or the beginning of 2021. We can see after two years of bull market, the China Asia was uh, not cheap anymore. The PE went up to 16 times, 6.1 uh, times, which is 23% uh, uh, expensive than its fair PE. And uh, we projected due to the low base effect in 2020, uh, 2020 uh, the year whole economy was hit by the pandemic. We calculate the earning growth rate should be 19% and 15% in 2021 and 2022, respectively, which means over 30% increase from the earning. Therefore, our conclusion was that from the beginning of 2021 to the end of 2022, two years, China Asia will only have 10% upside potential. For 2022, we still believe the projection we uh, did, uh, at the, did at the beginning of 2021 still hold 10% uh, upside within two years. Last year, we can see the market has dropped 5.2%. Uh, no, uh, therefore, by calculation, our statement is that there will be a 15% 15, 15 upside potential uh, in this year, uh, 2022, for China, Asia. 15% uh, upside potential doesn't mean investors can make a 15% return if the investor chooses the wrong sectors to invest. By using the same methodology we did for CSI 300 index, we did the fundamental analysis for each sectors. Uh, and uh, we are a bullish toward three sectors, a telecommunication, a financials, and healthcare. Uh, in China, uh, sector selection is very important. I think uh, uh, investors should put a lot of attention to this if you want to invest in China. Uh, take the past 10 years, for example. Uh, if you put one million into uh, China consumer stable sectors uh, 10 years ago, uh, you will get over 5 million uh, principal plus gain uh, by the end of 2021. However, uh, if you put uh, one million into China energy sector, you will only have uh, half million by the end of 2021. Uh, there is uh, 10 times difference uh, in terms of what you will get. Uh, so uh, here is the end of my brief uh, presentation. Uh, I believe uh, we can go to the next section. So with this, we have reached our Q&A segment of this presentation. For this segment, I'll be asking Danny some China micro-related questions as well as some sector-related questions. So let's begin the first question. So for the first question, can I ask, following China's strong initial rebound from the pandemic, the recovery has clearly stalled in the second half of 2021, given that China's latest economic data fell below expectations. So should investors be concerned moving forward? Uh, okay. Uh, the potential growth uh, in China is slowed uh, significantly uh, from double digit uh, in 10 years ago uh, to around 6% before the pandemic, and it is expected to slow further uh, in the future. But without the happening of a pandemic, uh, we could see a 5% of growth annually. Uh, this slowing down reflects China's aging population, uh, slowing productivity growth, a shift in growth away from high-speed growth uh, to a high-quality growth economy. The pandemic has made this interrupted. A, hu a huge drop uh, in year 2020, especially the first half of 2020, only uh, negative 1.6% uh, GDP growth. Uh, due to the low base effect, we can see a large jump 
uh, in the first half of last year. The low base effect has disappeared in the second half of last year, since China's economy has almost back to normal in the second half of 2022. Therefore, we see the recovery is already slow in the second half of 2021 uh, when we do a year-on-year -year comparison. Uh, looking forward, uh, we believe we shouldn't overinterpret the China's economy data uh, in the second half of last year. Uh, in 2022, uh, we believe uh, the growth uh, will gradually converge but remain below uh, to its pre-pandemic trend. Uh, after reaching over 8% in 2021, uh, China's uh, uh, we, our projection is 8.5% uh, in 2021, uh, and uh, we believe the Chinese growth is projected to slow to 5% uh, in 2022. Uh, this is our projection. Okay, another question I have is that real estate volatility has also been one of the major concerns for Chinese equity markets in 2021, following regulatory actions and concerns over Evergrande. So what is the expected impact on the broader market as we enter 2022? Uh, okay, uh, China's government has initiated this real estate uh, developer uh, deleveraging for a long time and uh, draw uh, three very clear right line to those uh, real estate companies. Uh, if you cross one of these right lines, it uh, will become very difficult for you to borrow money from domestic banks. Uh, well, uh, some real estate uh, listened, uh, like Banky, uh, the biggest real estate developer in mainland China, and uh, some companies didn't follow the uh, regulation. Evergreen is one of them. So every grand group actually breached all of these uh, three nights after accumulating large uh, liabilities in recent years. So looking forward, uh, I think the tightening of real estate is the right thing to do uh, in the uh, long term. It may cause some stress in the short term. And uh, uh, here are some key conclusions uh, I want to make here. Uh, uh, first, I believe the house activity is uh, will, has experienced a sharp uh, slowdown, and it will uh, in next several years. And uh, the borrowing cost uh, in U.S. dollar bond markets has increased significantly uh, for China real estate developers and uh, other risk borrowers. Uh, the government is expected to continue to uh, its focus on reducing the financial uh, stability risk, but uh, it will be less aggressive. Uh, in 2021, uh, then in 2020, uh, less aggressive in 2022, then in uh, 2021. And uh, then uh, I believe Evergrande's offshore debt uh, are more likely to default than its onshore debt. And uh, last, I believe the probability of uh, systematic risk uh, is very low. So Danny, I have one more macro-related question for you. I would like to ask about China's recent energy shortage and the surge in the prices of upstream industrial metals or materials. So with this in mind, will China face the risk of high inflation? Uh, okay, uh, consumption um, price inflation remain uh, pretty low uh, in 2020 and uh, most of the time uh, in last year, but uh, accelerated in the final months of 2021, or November of 2021. Uh, it's a hit 2.3% year on year uh, in November. The December figure hasn't come out yet, uh, but uh, we believe it is a pretty high figure. Uh, the increase uh, primarily uh, reflected uh, a higher upstream product cost. Uh, this is mainly showed in the producer price index. Uh, it's what we call the PPI index. Uh, PPI index has skyrocket in 2021. So it's the right line uh, on my left chart. Uh, has reached its historical high uh, in October uh, 2021. Uh, usually consumer price index and the producer price index is highly correlated in China, as you can see uh, from the historical data. Uh, we are also noticed the PPI is highly correlated 
uh, to the money supply. In China, the difference between M1 growth rate and the M2 growth rate uh, is the uh, blue line on the right chart. It's a very good indicator, a uh, very good six months leading indicator actually for PPI, which means M1 minus M2 rise or drop uh, produce price index uh, will follow within six months. Recently, we can see ME minus M2, uh, this indicator has started to drop uh, since last uh, since July last year. Uh, therefore, we believe uh, we are expecting the PPI uh, will fall soon, uh, given maybe two or three months, and this will conduct to CPI, uh, which is the key indicator for inflation, as we know. Uh, can still go up uh, for several months, uh, but it will start to drop uh, once its upstream product costs drop. So moving on to the sector-related question, I have some questions about the three sectors of opportunities in which you pointed out earlier. So let's start with financials. The global financial sector had a great run in 2021, but Chinese financial stocks have largely lagged behind their international peers. So why is this the case, and what are some of the growth drivers for this sector moving forward? Uh, okay, uh, actually, Chinese uh, financial sector is not only a nagger behind the international peers, uh, but also nagger behind other uh, domestic uh, sectors. Uh, it has dropped 11.8% uh, uh, in 2021. Uh, it's a more 6% uh, drop uh, than CSI 300. Uh, which represents the overall China Asian market. Among 10 big sectors of uh, domestic market, uh, financial sector was performed at the bottom of third place in 2021. Uh, why is uh, this the case? Uh, to answer this question, first I want to show that uh, what are some subsectors in financials? There are four uh, subsectors in financial uh, broker, uh, bank, real estate and insurance. If you compare the performance of those subsectors within CSI 300 performance, you will find out a broker and a bank sectors are actually outperform the market. And the real estate and the insurance are the major dragger. For the real estate sector, it's related to the previous question you have asked, which is due to the tightening regulatory action towards the towards a real estate. Insurance has hardly hit by the pandemic as more Chinese uh, rather uh, put uh, the money into savings, um, preparing for the risk, then uh, paying the premium to buy insurance. So uh, looking forward, uh, we believe the major reason for us uh, to encourage our investor to put money into financial sector is due to the low valuation. Uh, when we compare uh, financials PE and PB ratio with China, Asia, uh, CSI 300 as a whole, uh, it's much cheaper and uh, attractive for CSI 300. Uh, both PE and PB, uh, is CSI 300 is at the 50, 50 uh, percentile level, which is uh, uh, around the average. Uh, however, for financial sector, uh, the current PE is uh, uh, 6.7 times, around 10 percent tail, which means its valuation is lower than 90 percent of its historical time. The current PB is even more obvious. Uh, it's uh, only 0 0.8 times, which means the market price, uh, because the PB is the market price uh, to book value. So this means, means the market price is uh, 20 percent lower than its book value. This is a clear indicator that uh, I believe uh, it means the Chinese financial sector is uh, oversold. So thank you, Danny. So for the next question I have is about China's tele telecommunications sector. So what are some growth drivers that could actually propel this sector going forward? Okay, uh, in 2018, Eighteen, as we all know, that the China-U.S. trade friction began, and China was uh, affected by the supply cutoff of the United States in high-tech field. 
uh, which made the Chinese government realize the importance of developing uh, its own high-tech industry. Uh, therefore, in the past few years, many high-tech sectors in China has received a large influx of money uh, from both government and uh, VCs, uh, which is uh, why the uh, high-tech industries such as new energy, new materials, and semiconductors has experienced a huge uh, growth in the past few years in China. Uh, in, on the contrary, uh, some traditional industries such as the real estate we just mentioned, uh, or oil industry and the low uh, tech industry has been uh, su uh, suppressed. Uh, now, many high tech industry has seen very large gain and the valuation are already very expensive. However, the telecommunication industry is still a sector that has a no, uh, has not experienced a huge growth yet, but is a high tech. So even though China has uh, issued 5G license uh, to three major communication operators as uh, early as middle of 2019, uh, we have not seen a huge increase of stock price in the telecom industry yet. Uh, many of these companies have been suppressed by the uh, China-US trade friction uh, with the construction of more and more 5G uh, uh, base stations and the increase of a uh, uh, penetration of rate of uh, uh, 5G, as well as uh, the popularization of application uh, such as uh, auto driving, uh, telemedicine, uh, cloud gaming, and metaverse. The demand for 5G uh, will be higher and higher. And uh, we believe that the next uh, maybe one or two years, more and more telecom company uh, will have a big, huge benefit uh, from it. So Danny, I have one more question, one final question for you. So if we dive deeper into the various segments that make up China's healthcare sector, what are your views on the health tech sector? given the government's calls for greater regulation of the fast-growing internet healthcare industry? Uh, in China, uh, the population uh, aging has become a very serious problem in recent years. Uh, according to the data from the World Bank, China's population over uh, the age of uh, 65 has uh, exceeded uh, 7% as early as uh, 2002. Uh, which is considered by many international experts to be an aging society already. Uh, as of 2020, uh, the number of people over 65 uh, years old in China has even exceeded uh, 12%. And uh, China is facing a crisis of getting old uh, before getting rich. Uh, the Chinese government is uh, actively response, response to it. Uh, such as uh, freezing out uh, the one-child policy and uh, opening up to uh, two uh, or even three children. The, China, the, the government's uh, crackdown on the real estate and the training industry uh, in the past two years is uh, also aimed to reducing the cost of housing and uh, education for the citizens. So the, that everyone can afford to have uh, second or third child. Of course, we can also see the investment opportunity uh, in the aging pop, uh, population crisis, uh, among, um, among which the uh, healthcare industry has great opportunity. Uh, if we study the uh, healthcare industry in the United States, uh, you will find out that many of the pharmaceutical related stocks and uh, funds uh, has risen rapidly uh, in since uh, 2013. Uh, why is the case in 2013? Uh, this is has a lot to do with the uh, uh, demographics of the uh, United States. There's a generation in United States known as a uh, baby boomer, which uh, refers to people born from 1946 to 1964 uh, after World War II and they account for about one-third of the current total population of the United States. The retirement age 
uh, in the US is 67. And uh, 2013 happened to be the uh, age when the baby boomer began to retire. And uh, uh, when they retire, the medical needs began to sorrow. So uh, we could see the US pharmaceutical company take off uh, since uh, 2013. In China, we also had uh, a baby boomer. Uh, if you look at the right chart, uh, it's after great uh, China <coughs> Chinese farming uh, ended exactly in 2016 too, uh, which is exactly 16 years ago from today. Uh, in China, uh, six, 60 is the age of retirement. Uh, as the population over the age of 16 surges, the demand for medi um, Medicare and the, the Chinese society, uh, in Chinese society, uh, will soar, uh, which uh, will bring a huge profit to the medical companies, and uh, this will push the stock price to go up. So uh, this is the reason why I think uh, the healthcare uh, is one of the best uh, sectors for us to invest in China. So I think this is the end of my presentation and Q&A. Uh, I hope I give you some useful information uh, for you to invest in 2020, especially for those investors who want to uh, put some money in uh, China, uh, Asia. So thank you very much and uh, see you next year. Thank you, Danny and Chloe. We'll now proceed to our next presentation by Will Shum, Director, Portfolio Management and Research from iFast Hong Kong, will be sharing our views on the Hong Kong stock market, where we believe there is great upside potential. Will, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so this is Will. Um, uh, in my part, I will share um, my views over the Hong Kong equities and also um, why we are still positive on the Hong Kong market uh, despite its disappointing uh, performance last year. Um, as you know, uh, HSI, the Hang Seng Index, actually peaked at uh, 31,800 points in mid-February uh, uh, last year uh, before they paying uh, lower. So uh, last year, actually full of uh, negative uh, reuse for Hong Kong China market, um, like the Chinese uh, economic data um, uh, has been really disappointing. Then uh, you got the, uh, the PBOC took uh, numbers uh, measures to curb the RMB appreciation. And then we have this um, tech giants uh, were cracked down by the antitrust law. So this all happened um, in the first half. But what even worse is that uh, since July, the Chinese government issued several um, regulations, uh, um, uh, policy targeting various industries, and also approved the, um, the infamous um, personal information protection law, uh, which only impacts on the uh, China uh, digital economy. Um, so uh, um, many um, others uh, tech giants in the uh, new economy sector also affected. Um, then uh, Evergrande uh, debt prices also trigger concerns about the China real estate industry. So uh, with all these um, um, negative uh, factors, Hong Kong markets has been one of the worst performer, of course, um, uh, like HSI actually fell 14.1% uh, in uh, 2021, uh, one of the worst in our coverage uh, from the mid-February high to um, the end of last year, the Hong Kong stock market has actually lost 25%. We are talking about the drawdown 25%. But look at this table. Uh, what really surprised us is that uh, the fundamentals um, uh, did not worsen um, as many people may expect as we see that uh, the estimated growth uh, still being revised upward by 2.2%. There were no uh, earnings downgrade, but or, uh, only upgrade by 2.2%. And the earnings growth for 2021 remain uh, largely solid at 18.2%. Uh, so you can see that the fundamentals for the Hong Kong stocks have not really risen that much, even uh, with a background of, of full of the negative leaves. 
And uh, after declining, as I said, the drawdown 25%, right? Uh, since the peak uh, in mid-February last year, the valuation of HSI uh, became uh, even more attractive. So uh, here is the PB ratio. The price to book ratio uh, of the HSI actually uh, dropped below one time. So it happens only three times before, uh, which happened in 1998, uh, 2015, and also the tw uh, 2020. Uh, so this time is the fourth time that the PB ratio of the Hong Kong stock market has actually dropped uh, below one time. Uh, so we, we did some bad testing and also find that if you buy um, at one time or uh, below, um, uh, I mean, PB ratio, and hold for more than one year. The cumulative investment return are so uh, attractive and also the, the, um, the probability of the positive returns are actually very high. And uh, we also take a look on uh, an other valuation indicator, which is the PE ratio. So the low uh, level of the estimated PE uh, is 10 times uh, during this uh, correction, prolonged corre corrections. Uh, it's obviously quite cheap and also already taking account into many uh, pessimistic uh, expectations. We also did some stress tests on the valuation, you know, as many people's um, uh, uh, concern on uh, various negative factors. We want to make sure we want to check whether the current valuation has already fully factored in the potential downgrading uh, risk in the earnings. So with the uh, fair PE of 12.5 times, uh, the current PE actually implies a close to 20% uh, earnings downgrade uh, for 2022. So uh, for us, uh, it's quite hard to imagine that uh, numbers of uh, those large cap tech stocks and um, those so-called new economy stocks, which is supposed to be fast, um, fast growing stocks to plunge about 20% in terms of the earnings in the coming years. So it show, clearly shows that the valuation uh, is really cheap. And uh, I can actually expect the earnings of the HSI to grow uh, at 18% per, uh, percent for uh, 2021 and also uh, about 12% for the, uh, this year and also next year. Uh, so I think the uh, earnings growth um, numbers are actually quite impressive, uh, like the consumer discretionary sectors was uh, dread because of the uh, fines and uh, uh, penalties for the anti-monopoly law. Uh, for example, the market estimated that uh, Meituan uh, 2021 would turn uh, profits into losses and then result into a lo slower growth uh, for the whole discretionary consumer discretionary sectors, but the losses are expected to be uh, re reduced sharply uh, this year and uh, will expect to uh, uh, turn progress in 2023. So it will become the growth engine again for the overall market earnings uh, over the next two years. So overall, uh, as you can see, Chinese test stocks are expected to drive the earnings growth of the HSI, uh, while the financial sectors will also help uh, 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 the acceleration of the earnings over the next two years. So among the major uh, constituents, um, Alibaba, uh, Tencent, uh, Meituan, uh, Quantibill, 55% of the decline uh, to the index from the high level uh, uh, on uh, 17 February last year to the low on uh, 5th of October last year. So if a uh, if we can um, uh, in uh, Pinan, uh, AIA, and also Xiaomi. Uh, so these six stocks uh, contribute more than 70% uh, of the decline, 70% of the decline. So as long as these stocks can uh, actually uh, stabilize um, and also start to pick up, it will help uh, um, uh, significantly to the uh, overall uh, Hong Kong stock market. But here I want to explain 
saying more a bit uh, over a concern about the regulatory uh, issues. You know, uh, ma uh, many people tend to be overreact to the news regarding the, any uh, newly uh, initiated uh, laws or regulations coming out. Uh, just uh, an example, previously we heard some, um, uh, the regulator actually announced some restriction on the gaming sector, right? Um, so people uh, will, will tend, just tend to think in the worst way uh, for the worst outcome that, oh, um, um, Tencent gaming business will be done. Uh, but the fact is that uh, we saw the uh, officials stop or uh, slow the new game uh, approval process. But recently, they have actually resumed it again, just like uh, nothing has happened uh, for Meituan. Also, uh, China official actually imposed a fine for uh, Meituan uh, at 3% uh, of its 2020 revenues, which uh, is which was equivalent to around uh, 115 billion uh, RMB. So the total penalties uh, amount to 3.4 billion RMB, which was uh, around 80% of its total earnings last year. But the fines was already slightly uh, 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 lower than the expectation, and also the things had already been uh, settled. So uh, 3.4 billion RMB was uh, actually quite a small number if you compare uh, to its uh, last year revenue, what was over 100 billion RMB. So how come this 3.4 uh, billion penalties will make uh, May turns uh, to widen their loss and also their keep uh, earnings downgrades into their earnings by analysts. So the major reason is uh, they, they actually make even more investment on the new business. Um, the latest third quarter uh, result shows that um, they have uh, reach another record high uh, uh, quarterly revenue, which was over 50 billion RMB. But due to the monthly spend on uh, those new areas like um, uh, robotics, uh, uh, deliveries, uh, group uh, purchase, uh, uh, fresh uh, purchase, and also fresh food purchase, and so on. So, these are the key reasons uh, that drag may trans earnings and they keep burning cash uh, and also uh, for the new business. But people don't talk about uh, this and only uh, focus on the regulatory concern. But to, uh, for us, it's just more than only uh, regulatory uh, issues. For Alibaba as well, it recorded uh, its first uh, quarterly uh, losses. Uh, in the first quarter or the fourth quarter of its last fiscal year due to the antitrust uh, uh, fine, which was uh, about uh, 18 billion RMB. But the issue is uh, once again uh, settled already and its earnings result has not been uh, too strong, especially for the latest uh, quarter result. But there's nothing to do with the uh, regulatory issues. It's about the fierce uh, uh, competition between uh, other players like uh, JD and uh, also, also Pindodo. So uh, JD uh, uh, and also Pindodo keep recording stronger growth in terms of the MAU and also GMB, while Alibaba seems to seems to hit the growth bottleneck. So uh, I think you can't just blame the uh, regulatory uh, concerns, right? Uh, you can't blame even uh, the, the the pandemic issue coming back and affect the consumption costs. It is more about the business issue. Other players did better than you. So the share price already reflect the reality. Uh, but I think it's okay because uh, it just started already uh, at um, the uh, 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 JD. But what I want to explain here is that there's too much concern on the regulation. Uh, to me, sometimes, uh, uh, business and uh, earnings more matters. Do you think Charlie Munger buying Alibaba, will he concern about uh, next few quarters earnings? I think he more concerned about the business prospect, uh, whether the current share price is cheap enough for him to enter into the uh, buying positions and what's about the uh, earnings prospect over the next, at least five year times. So uh, right now you can buy Alibaba uh, with share price lower than what Ali uh, what uh, Charlie Munger pay. Uh, I think there's nothing to be too worried about. But uh, yeah, just go back to this table. In the middle of this table, um, 
a network many uh, people may think uh, major Chinese uh, tech giants do not suffer a huge blow by, uh, brought by the regulatory uh, factors in terms of the earnings or uh, forecast uh, either for uh, last year, this year, and also next year. So the earning estimated earnings growth uh, of the HSI over the next two uh, years uh, remain robust. Um, so um, the problem is not about earnings. It is uh, market has overreacted and investor uh, lost their confidence. So in the bottom part of this table, you can see Alibaba's PE has uh, fallen to the uh, lowest since its listing. Uh, the lowest here, I mean, uh, based on the data since its listing in uh, the US uh, in two, uh, 2014. And uh, Tencent PE also fell to the lowest since uh, 2014. 13, uh, since Meituan has not achieved sustainable profits, I use PS ratio, price to sales ratio here. Uh, but yeah, as you can see, also uh, already fall to the uh, lowest uh, since listing. So the market is too pessimistic about the regulatory factors. But if the earnings growth of the three clients can meet uh, market expectation and their PE will, uh, I believe that their PE E ratio uh, will be referred back to the historical mean, which will further drive the uh, overall performance of the entire Hong Kong uh, market. So um, uh, the earnings growth of the financial sector of the HSI uh, will accelerate uh, from last year 5.7% uh, 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 to 10% in 2022, uh, mainly contributed by uh, Pinan Insurance Group. Uh, Pinan's net profit in the uh, first quarter of last year actually dropped uh, 15.5% due to the provisions uh, for the impairment losses uh, of its investment in China Fortune Land. Um, and of course, coupled with uh, 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 some deterioration of its huge equity investment in the property sectors amidst the uh, China uh, uh, property sectors uh, debt prices, uh, yeah, market are now expecting that a uh, seventeen Y O Y decline uh, for its full year's earnings uh, uh, in last year, but its earnings will be normalized in this year will contribute positively uh, to the overall earnings uh, this year. Uh, but yeah, the earnings growth of the financial sector are expected to be uh, largely uh, stable over the next two years. Uh, we think some uh, of the positive factors have not been fully factored in uh, yet, uh, uh, like a different uh, the challenging uh, macro environment um, and also the property sector mounting pressure of the economic downtrend. The PBOC has already uh, uh, taking steps uh, uh, to relax some uh, restrictions on the bank loans, uh, also with the expectation on uh, more uh, policy uh, 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 to stabilize the credit. Um, and these actions already implemented. So uh, I think the total social financing may have bottom up. Uh, it is also expect the new loan growth will accelerate again, uh, which will further improve the bank's profitability. So coupled with the current um, low valuation and also high uh, attractive dividend yield level, we believe that uh, Chinese banking stocks will push, uh, will, will help uh, push the HSI uh, higher. So uh, uh, the reform of uh, conducted by the Hansen Index Company in uh, May uh, 2020 to conditionally include companies with uh, uh, rated Fourteen rise and also the second listed companies into HSI. So since then, the components of HSIs um, dominated. Uh, I mean, the newly added components of the HSI are um, mainly dominated by the uh, new economy stocks with high growth and also a uh, high valuation. And by mid uh, of next uh, of this year, uh, uh, the HSI company target to have 18 constituents into the index uh, and the final target uh, is 100. So the reform is trying to get more uh, uh, growth stocks uh, uh, in the index while uh, uh, lower the, the exposure of the um, 
against those low growth uh, sectors. So imagine that China mobile profits have been first stable at uh, 110 billion RMB. Alibaba and Tencent profits uh, uh, in 2020 was uh, uh, 170 billion and 150 billion uh, RMB respectively, but China mobile only shared 2.3% in HSI, while Alibaba and Tencent shares above uh, 8%. Meituan, which only has 4.3 billion RMB profits, uh, uh, already shares nearly 9% of the index. So do you prefer to invest China mobile-like uh, uh, company, uh, which provides you a stable earnings, but uh, it is already uh, uh, mature and do not have much uh, growth potentials, or do you want to invest in into companies like those uh, big tech firms, uh, which which are still fighting against uh, their peers, they are still burning cash, uh, they are still increasing their their, their costs to get more uh, market shares on the new investment. But uh, they are also more uh, uh, they they have more ex uh, exciting potentials ahead, uh, but may not offer uh, very stable, sustainable earnings just yet. So I believe that obviously HSI already opt for the latter. Uh, so the proportion of the new economy stocks in HSI uh, will keep rising uh, on one side. Uh, the index earnings growth rate uh, will uh, accelerate for sure. But on the other hand, uh, with if we talk about uh, the impact of the further regulatory crackdown on the internet sector, right? Uh, uh, for sure, it will be uh, great as well. Uh, but these are more a, a short-term pain. Uh, for the longer-term perspective, uh, the new economy sector will keep uh, uh, playing an uh, important role uh, under the uh, dual circulation policy, and will make uh, will, will keep making. Um, um, a significant contributions to uh, import uh, uh, to to the China uh, economic growth. We believe that um, uh, when the concerns are fully digested, HSI will certainly uh, benefit from increasing weightings of the new economy stocks and its high growth, uh, no valuation features will become even more uh, prominent. So, based on our calculation, uh, based on the FED of uh, 12.5 times, uh, HSI will rise to 35,000 points by end of 2023 uh, with a potential growth of more than uh, 40%. So that's uh, the end of my uh, presentation and sharing. So uh, I hope uh, our views on the Hong Kong stock market can give you some uh, useful information and also some uh, insights and uh, some inspiration as well. So uh, uh, that's the end of my part. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoy. So I will stop here. Thank you, Will. To cap off this segment on China, we'll now hear from Ken Wong, Client Portfolio Manager, China Equities at East Spring Investment. Ken is responsible for articulating the strategy, process, positioning and performance of the various equity strategies within the Greater China region. And today, he will be sharing with us about East Spring's China A strategy and how it navigates China's new environment. Okay, so hi, hi everyone. Uh, this is Ken Wong here from Eastspring Investments. Uh, it's my pleasure to speak today at the Fund Supermarket, you know, what and where to invest in 2022. Um, you know, my theme today and my topic is very specific in regards to, you know, sort of navigating through China's new environment. Because as we know, you know, there's been a lot that's gone on over the past, you know, six or seven months or so. And obviously a lot of investors now are asking, you know, what should they do? Just, you know, a very quick introduction into eSpring for those who might not be familiar with us as a firm. You know, we were founded in 1994. We're currently investing in over $250 billion in assets and we're the asset management arm of Prudential. Now, you know, let me provide a quick update, you know, in, in regards to some of the uncertainty and some of the questions around China. As we know, you know, in July of last year, 
there were, you know, sort of, uh, you know, a lot of regulatory concerns around education as well as internet companies. And then, you know, more recently over the past uh, few months, there's been concerns around the real estate sector again in China, especially with, uh, you know, some of the companies having uh, overgeared and, uh, you know, have actually had a lot of uh, some of their bonds not being able to uh, fulfill their uh, dividend payments. But the fact is, is that when you look at a country like China, there is a lot of regulatory periods, and then there's a lot of booming periods as well. Over the past 20 plus years, you can see here that, you know, whether it be in the mining industry, dairy products, high-end liquor, um, gaming and drugs, and, you know, pharmaceutical uh, related, you know, sort of medicine companies, there was a very strong uh, boom period followed by a regulatory period. Now, this is nothing new to China. So investors should not be too overly concerned about some of the recent regulatory crackdowns that's been going on because we see that all the time in China. That's the fundamental and the basics of investing in China where there will be certain sectors going through a boom and then a regulatory phase. And you know, this is something that we're just we just see and we've been seeing over the past 20 plus years. Policies matter in China. The fact is, is that policies play a key driver when it comes to the China A share market movements, and they have been for the past 10 plus years. You know, through a number of different periods, you know, whether it be it from, you know, whether it be RR cuts, uh, you know, leverage financing, new asset management rules, you, you know, the recent US China trade deficit, uh, trade conflicts. All these things, you know, have had a major impact when it comes to the China stock market. And also, this is one of the reasons why we feel at eSpring that, you know, having the top-down approach, uh, especially, you know, when we look at and understanding the macros and the policy cycles, you know, it, it's going to be very important to be able to fulfill and capture the full opportunity and the potential that it is within the China stock market, in particular, the Asia market in our views. Now, we're going through some slowing headline growth with structural shifts, right? No doubt about it, China's economy is slowing down, right? By all means, you know, we're expecting potentially to see maybe about a 5% GDP rise uh, at most for 2022. Now, there's a lot of investors who might say, well, is that going to be reasons for concern? But our belief actually is, is that, you know, you have to think about this in one way. You know, throughout the past decade, China has had very strong economic growth, but that did not lead to specifically the stock market in China doing well every single year. And so the stock market movements, as well as economic growth, are not correlated, right? They don't have any direct relations to say strong economy definitely means to strong markets and weak economy definitely leads to a weak stock market because that doesn't happen like that. And so this is one of the reasons why, you know, we're not too overly concerned that the economy is slowing down. And despite that, you know, if the economy continues to still grow at 5%, it's still going to be at a fairly strong pace. So this is not something that investors should be overly concerned about. Now, the other thing, and one of the things that we feel is going to benefit quite a number of different companies, especially within the A-share market, is China's path to common prosperity. The fact is, is that, you know, Common prosperity is becoming a very important social issue within China. You know, this is kind of one way of China tackling ESG. You know, when everybody's talking about ESG, one of the ways that China is going to tackle ESG, especially on the social side, is through common prosperity. You know, the fact is, is that, you know, China really wants to have a much bigger growing middle class. One of the key main reasons for this is that consumption as the percentage of China's GDP is still only around 56%. You compare that with the rest of the world, where consumption as a percentage of GDP in places like Singapore or Hong Kong or, you know, in the U.S. or Japan or, or Europe, they're more like 75 to 80%. So that's why it's very important for that growing middle class to continue to generate more wealth so that they can consume as well in order for the economy to continue to strive. Now, you know, previously, you know, there was a speaker who was talking about China A shares. And our view is actually very similar to the fact that, you know, we feel that China A share opportunity is a very good opportunity, especially this year, given the corrections that we saw last year, 
Um, given the fact that when you look at the China A share market, you know, it has, you know, much lower correlations with global developed markets. So the fact is, is that their movements with other equity markets around the world are not really similar. China A share market is definitely a much more diversified marketplace. Um, you know, and, and despite specifically what's been going on, you know, what we've seen is, is that, you know, over the past few years, you know, again, not 2021, but if you look at, you know, sort of the, the market performance over the past three, four years, you know, China A shares have done fairly well. But despite that, you know, because of some of the pullback that we saw last year, the valuations are definitely looking much more compelling. And, you know, the fact, as I mentioned earlier, because of some of the shorter term factors and the more key aspect is the policy backdrop and the policy tailwinds that can help support the markets, we feel these are going to be very supportive and accommodative measures for China in 2022, right? Our scenario is, is that, you know, what, what happened in 2021 with the regulations and the regulatory crackdowns, we think those will subside, um, you know, in 2022. And we think specifically, you know, investors, you know, should look for especially those stocks that has underperformed over the past, you know, six to 12 months or so. Now, in particular, you know, the first point that I had mentioned earlier, when we talk about, you know, China A shares not being very less correlated or not being highly correlated with global markets. The fact is, is that China A share markets, we compare that with, let's say, you know, Hong Kong or Asia X Japan or emerging markets or Japan or US, Europe. The fact is, is that, you know, their correlations is low. Anything in the green in this particular chart here basically shows that, you know, the, the correlations are tend to be a bit lower. And the fact is, is that the lower the correlation, the better when it comes to investors who wants to have a more diversified portfolio. And of course, you know, when we talk about diversification and when you invest in the China A share market, one of the key things that we talk about uh, being different as we compare the China A shares listed in Shanghai and Shenzhen, as compared to, let's say, the H shares or the red chips listed in Hong Kong or the P chips listed in Hong Kong or the US listed ADRs, is the breadth. It's specifically the amount of stocks that you can invest within the Shanghai and Shenzhen A share market. There's over 4,200 companies which are listed in the A shares. Compare that in Hong Kong, there's only about 1,200 companies or so, about 1,200 companies, Chinese companies listed in Hong Kong. And the US is only about 275. And of that, there's probably going to be even a bit less with more companies delisting or more Chinese companies delisting in the US. So when it comes to being able to pick stocks you know, across a number of different sectors, the A shares is definitely the way to go. And you know, we, when we talk about the compelling valuations and so forth, you know, the fact is, is that the China stock market, you know, whether it be it, you know, the offshore market or the A shares, they're some of the cheapest stock market right now. You know, the fact is, is that you know, the, the China stock markets, the Asian stock markets here are mostly, you know, much more compelling. And they're very much undemanding, especially from a global point of view. So this is also another reason why, where, you know, when we look at the underperformance, as I mentioned earlier, in 2021, and then when we look at specifically, you know, the much more attractive valuations as compared to, you know, a lot of the other countries around the world, these are very compelling reasons why investors should think about, you know, investing in the market like China, in particular, the China Asia. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, when we talk about you know China and some of the things that we're looking for, some of the longer term you know sort of secular views that we feel are going to be key macro drivers for China going forward will be a few things here, particular domestic domestic consumption upgrades, China's aging population, foreign capital inflows, and technology independence. Okay, these are all going to be key macro drivers which we're going to be seeing in China for the next five to 10 years. Okay. And some of the potential beneficiary sectors will include, you know, consumer discretionary as well as staple sectors, healthcare, large blue chip stocks, as well as technology companies. Now, you know, when it comes to investing and we, when we sort of have this sort of longer term uh, outlook, we also sometimes have to have some short term, you know, sort of cyclical, you know, sort of uh, views as well. And some of the views that we look at includes, you know, monetary policies. You know, last year there was China's 14 five-year plan. Some of the recent property market tightening measures. These are all things that we also have to look at as well. And that's why when I mentioned earlier, you know, when it comes to investing in China, 
you know, it's very important to pick stocks and select the right stocks. But with that said, you also need to be able to identify sectors which we feel and which, you know, we believe are going to provide actually, you know, much better, you know, performing stocks. And this is what we do here at eSpring within our China A share team. Now, you know, when we talk about our China A share uh, growth fund, the key aspect of this is, is that, you know, our China A share growth fund is being advised and being managed by an experienced group of, uh, you know, investment professionals based in our East Spring Shanghai office. You know, the, when you look at the lead investment advisor, you know, Michelle Chi, she's had over 21 years of experience, you know, investing and doing research work within the China A share market. What we try to do within the portfolio is, you know, we, we try to capture a concentrated all caps, best idea portfolios where, you know, we, we invest in roughly between 30 to 50 stocks, focusing very much on the long term growth perspectives in China. As I alluded to earlier, you know, we focus both on the top down macroeconomic situations in China. And then we also couple that with a bottom up fundamental approach, trying to seek to really generate, you know, as you know, as strong returns as we can for investors. And, you know, this is specifically the, the breakdown of the team that you can see, you know, with the team headed up by Michelle, together with the uh, the other analysts within uh, Shanghai office, and together with our colleague uh, based in Singapore as well, Jay Lu, who also, you know, sort of works very closely with Michelle in regards to this portfolio. You know, this whole investment process very much focuses on, you know, four steps, you know, from filtering and, you know, tr trickling down the initial universe from, you know, 4,000 stocks to down to a pool of around three to 400 stocks. Then we focus on the top-down macro views and the sector allocations. Then it comes to some of the strategic sector allocations and stock selections. And then finally, it's really building the portfolio and ensuring you know, the, the portfolio that we have is the most optimal. So that's just really kind of what we do. You know, and when we talk about the sector allocations, is, is, there, is a very important thing. You know, we think you know, at least a third and even sometimes even up to half of our funds, you know, outperformance really comes from sector allocations. You know, during situations where you know you have, let's say, a you know a strong economy, and let's say you know sort of strong liquidity as well, a lot of times that benefits you know some of the sectors like industrials, consumer discretionary, as well as consumer staple stocks. But again, you know, there's there's much more than just understanding the macro analysis, right? We have to understand the sector valuations. We have to also understand you know some of the long term growth drivers. To really come up with a full picture to understand, you know, which sectors we feel, given the current macro and policy situations, should actually outperform in, uh, in, in the China Asia space. And of course, you know, the stock selection, once we identify the sectors we want overweight, becomes very important, right? We want to identify the best stocks with the highest possible upside over the next 12 months when it comes to investing in that particular sector. Now, when you look at overall specifically, you know, how our fund has performed, it's performed very well when it comes to specifically, you know, sort of what we've been able to generate for investors. In particular, you know, sort of when you look at our fund since the fund's inception, you know, on average, we've been able to, you know, generate roughly about 23%, uh, you know, sort of on an offer bid basis and a bid bid basis of 25%. So when you look at it, you know, we've been able to outperform, first of all, the benchmark by nearly 11% per annum. And specifically, you know, when you look at the fund, since the fund's inception, we've been able to generate 25% returns. Even over the past two years, when you look at, you know, the overall returns per annum, we were able to generate 32% return per year, per annum. And specifically, you know, that created a, uh, an outperformance against the benchmark of about 6.5% a year. Now, when we look at specifically, you know, some of the sector positionings and, you know, what we try to do within the portfolio, you know, it, it is, like I mentioned earlier, you know, a, a very important aspect when it comes to top down and when it comes to, you know, sort of what we're trying to do, which is really identifying the sectors which will do well. And of course, if we look at, you know, some of the sectors right now that we have, you know, key overweights in, will include consumer discretionary, uh, will include specifically industrials, and also some of the material companies. Now, consumer discretionary, I talked about quite a bit, right? The fact is, is that, you know, because of the need for continuing rise in consumption, a lot of consumer discretionary related companies we expect should continue to do well. Industrials. Now, our belief actually right now on some of the industrial companies is actually a very key push and belief 
on you know EV car makers, specifically EV suppliers, you know battery suppliers, uh, specifically solar energy related with the renewables. These are some of the key areas from our point of view. We actually feel have a very strong uh, you know sort of policy support as the Chinese government is really supporting these sectors. And at the same time, you know, even going forward for the next few years, we think these are going to be be key growing sectors, which investors should continue to focus on. Right? The, you could see that potentially a new you know conflict between you know China and the U.S. could be is you know who can become green um, quicker, right? Who can become more uh, social responsible? Who can actually provide more clean energy or more EV vehicles, you know, at a much quicker pace? And in those instances, you know, a lot of these industrial companies are going to benefit. IT companies, the reason why we like those, in particular, what IT companies we like, it's more the hardware, the semiconductor companies, because there's a global chip shortage, right? And the fact is, is that, you know, China is really trying to develop its own, uh, you know, sort of semiconductor chips through various companies. And, th- and those are going to be exactly reasons why we feel are going to be key for China. And then when we, even when we look at, you know, some of the sectors like healthcare, you know, healthcare, the fact is, is that, you know, the areas we like with healthcare actually has more to do with cosmetics. So some of the maybe dental related companies, or let's say some companies which are focusing on cosmetics or facials, or let's say even, uh, you know, specifically beauty related products. These actually, from our point of view, even though they're healthcare, we think this is more of a consumer thing. Now, China is not going to crack down or, you know, stop people from trying to not have a, a better set of teeth or wanting to make themselves, you know, more beautiful. The fact is, is that, you know, that's part of consumption, right? If, if the middle class and others have more money to spend specifically on, you know, trying to make themselves look better. The fact is, is that these be key consumption areas where we think, you know, China has a huge opportunity in, in the coming years. And of course, if, you know, if you look at some of the key overweights and, you know, some of the, some of the positions that we hold, as I mentioned earlier, right, some of the EV or EV type of cars includes like Geely, right? Even though Geely Auto is a company that's listed in Hong Kong, the fact is, is that we like Geely because it's going to be increasing or introducing a lot of EV vehicles over the next few years. And, you know, given the fact that its valuations are you know, significantly much more attractive than some of the other EV players, that's going to be a company that we like. You know, other companies like, you know, Wuxi Let Intelligent or EV Energy, you know, these are going to be sort of, or even Ming Yard Smart Energies. You know, you can see that there's a lot of that theme here around EV, industrials, you know, solar, renewables. These are all going to be, you know, sort of key areas that we want to invest in. And of course, the one area that we actually have a bit of, a, you know, our biggest underweight in, which, you know, might be of a surprise to some investors, is our biggest underweight is actually in Kualchai Maotai, right? The fact is a lot of investors, and, and we know a lot of people, you know, definitely say, hey, you know what? Maotai is the biggest China A share stock. And so why do you, why do you underweight it? From our point of view, you know, in, uh, people who are buying Maotai aren't individuals who are actually consuming them. They're giving them as gifts. Right. And, and and we see a lot of that happening in China. And so as a result, from our point of view, we just think that, you know, given how valuations are, it's just really not that attractive. The growth process is that actually also not that attractive. So from our point of view, there's other companies that we would rather prefer uh, within the consumer space. And of course, you know, uh, to kind of, you know, I've, I've only got a couple of slides here to go. But, you know, I think another important thing when it comes to investing in funds is that, you know, you want to be able to capture you know, what this particular chart here is showing is that you want to be able to capture, you know, sort of the upside. So to be able to outperform when the markets are up. So anything above 100% here on this red, uh, this red bar here means you're able to do that. And you want to be able to be under on a downside, meaning that, you know, when the markets are going down, you're actually, you know, sort of the, the fund itself is actually down less than the markets. And that's exactly what we've been able to achieve with this particular fund. And so finally, you know, to wrap things up, I, I just want to, you know, come up, you know, sort of with this particular talk with a few takeaways for everyone to, you know, sort of consider and when, we're, when they're looking at investing. First of all, you know, from a medium to longer term perspective, you know, China's new regulations, you know, it's definitely going to lead to a more balanced economy in terms of growth drivers, as well as resource allocations. But this helps with lowering China's income inequality, which we feel will help drive consumption growth for the coming decade to come. You know, some of the recent regulatory concerns, you know, overshadowing some of the policy supports, we feel that, you know, despite everything that's been, you know, sort of said and talked about with all these regulations, 
a lot of people have been overseeing or, you know, sort of, you know, not really focusing enough of their attention on, like I mentioned earlier, the renewables, the EVs, the semiconductors, you know, the manufacturing. These are very much all aligned with national development objectives. And we think that especially within the A-share space, there's a lot of these exposures. And that is why investing in the A-share market makes so much more sense for investors who wants to have exposure to China. You know, A-share stocks have favorably sensitive or sens- have favorable sensitivity to potential fiscal policy easing. So anytime when, you know, China, China needs to loosen up some of its policies, A-shares always tends to, you know, p- perform well as a result. Um, you know, when we saw A-share buying, in particular, when we look at the flows, last year was tremendous when it comes to A-shares. So there's, there was a lot of foreign investors who actually invested in the A-share markets, despite of all the, you know, sort of concerns, because when you see a lot of the regulatory, you know, sort of crackdowns, that had an impact on Hong Kong listed China shares and the ADRs. But in fact, if you look at the A shares, they did not actually have a large negative, you know, sort of uh, returns as a result of that, because A shares tends to be more domestic focused. And of course, you know, when we look at, you know, foreign investors, the fact is, is that foreign investors still tends to be much more underweight towards China. And, and, and this is one of the key reasons why we feel that as more investors continue to understand what's going on uh, with more recovery coming from China, let's say with less regulatory, you know, sort of uh, concerns and specifically, you know, less crackdowns and so forth. We think 2022 is actually going to be a very good opportunity for investors to invest in the China Asia market. And so with that, I want to thank you very much for your time. And I'm going to hand the floor over back to the MC. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And that wraps up this morning's segment on China, the rise of the phoenix. We will now head for a lunch break and resume at 1pm right here. But don't go away. There are more presentations to come as we take a look at opportunities in Singapore, Asia, as well as in the US and Europe. If you have any questions regarding the presentations today, leave them in the Q&A section. We'll have our speakers address these questions later today. But don't go away yet, we have some exciting information for you. Receive 3,000 rewards points by opening a new FSM1 account. Already have an account? Refer a friend to open an account and both of you could receive 3,000 rewards points. The promo code to use is WAWTI. 2022. Also, from now till December, FSM1.com is offering 0% processing fees on ETF RSP. Pick from a wide range of over 60 ETFs listed on the SGX, Hong Kong and US exchanges. With ETF RSP, you can start growing your investment portfolio on a regular basis with as little as $50 a month. You can also take this chance to accumulate chances for the lucky draw where eight lucky showgoers will each walk away with a $100 FSM1 cash account credits. We will also have three grand prize winners who will receive $1,000 FSM1 cash account credits each. You can gain more chances to win a lucky draw by attending the event on both days, visiting sponsor pages, joining our daily quiz and sharing the event via social media. Each time you do these things, you add to your tally of chances. Do ensure you always use the same ID and email address when logging in. Be sure to join us again for even more exciting presentations starting at 1pm. We'll see you later.
the internet basically open up a, a new channel. You can reach out directly to consumers, to investors. iPlus TV is going to be so accessible and there will be a lot of programs, many different types. I'm here on FEX, please. Welcome to Last Station. Welcome to Retirement with Ease. Hey guys, welcome to this roundtable. Welcome to another episode of Our Two Cents. The ideas and plans we have for iFast TV gets bigger and bigger as we get more excited over all the possibilities of what we could do in this new department. And here's my investment resume. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Welcome to another episode of Money Masses. Welcome to the iFast TV Market Outlook 2022 series. Tune in to iFast TV if you want to hear all these different programs in the different languages and dialects. Welcome back everyone. I hope you've managed to have a great lunch break. Before we begin, I'd like to draw your attention to the promotions FSM1.com is running. Get to receive 3,000 rewards points by opening a new FSM1 account. If you already have an account, refer a friend to open an account with you and both of you could receive 3,000 rewards points. The promo code to use is WAWTI2022. And from now till December, FSM1.com is offering 0% processing fees on ETF RSP. Pick from a wide range of over 60 ETFs listed on the SGX, Hong Kong and US exchanges. With ETF RSP, you can start growing your investment portfolio on a regular basis with as little as $50 a month. Now, don't forget also to accumulate chances for the lucky draw where eight lucky showgoers will each walk away with a $100 FSM1 cash account credit. And three grand prize winners will receive $1,000 FSM1 cash account credits each as well. Gain more chances to win the lucky draw by attending the event on both days, visiting sponsor pages, joining our daily quiz and sharing the event via social media. Each time you do these things, you add to your tally of chances. Do also ensure you always use the same ID and email address when logging in. Following up, in the next segment joining us in this panel discussion to kick off, investing in our homeland Singapore are Lai Yu Huan, Senior Portfolio Manager from Nikko Asset Management, Adrian Chu, Vice President, Sales and Product Strategy, CSOP Asset Management. Yo Hui Shi, Equity Analyst, Stocks and ETFs Research from IFA Singapore. And Cyrus Ng, Analyst, Macro Research from IFA Singapore. They will be sharing about the bright spots of opportunities for Singapore and how investors can generate a long-term and sustainable stream of income, especially in uncertain times with local banks and S rates. From the break, we have three speakers today, Yu Huan, Adrian and Hui Shi, who will be sharing their insights on something closer to home, Singaporean equities. Thank you to our speakers for joining today. To start off, let's start with Hui Shi. The STI index climbed about 10% in 2021. What do you make of this performance and was it in line with your expectations at the start of the year? So the SDI's performance in 2021 largely came in line with my expectations. The economic rebound has driven a recovery in corporate earnings and in particular the three Singapore banks uh, which are DBS, OCBC and UOB 
who make up about 40% of the STI all did very well. So despite the low interest rate environment, they still managed to generate positive and strong earnings growth on the back of the easing loan provisions. Uh, Yu Huan, do you have any thoughts on what she said? Um, yeah, we agree that uh, you know, largely it was in line with our expectations. Uh, markets were driven, of course, by the reopening, and the first half of the year really played out uh, in, in that theme. Perhaps maybe what we uh, did not anticipate as, as, as well was uh, maybe in the second half of the year, the reopening, especially in Singapore, was maybe not as smooth as anticipated. And also, in, let's say, amidst the manufacturing boom that, uh, that happened, we also uh, perhaps didn't anticipate the, um, the bottlenecks that, uh, that occurred uh, uh, in, in the supply chain. But by and large, actually, the, the, the recovery in the economy and the market was uh, within our expectations. Thank you. Adrian, do you, were they in line with your expectations? Yes. Um, so I would say the total return for the STI came in about 13%, 13.55% in 2021, right? Uh, mainly driven by you know the the banks uh, means you know the macro um, you know recovery uh, expectation of interest rates highs which benefit from the bank's net interest margin. So like just to echo which is that the STI takes uh, has has about forty four percent in terms of banks right which rose about twenty two percent for last year. Top performer was DBS which came in about thirty one percent. Uh, on the flip side, you know, uh, Singapore REITs um, holds about 14% of the STI, um, gained about 3% uh, return for, for last year, right? And it benefited from the uh, reopening of the economy. Um, and the index as a whole, you know, is within our expectation. But for Singapore REITs, uh, due to the Omicron uh, late last year, um, sort of like affected the performance of S REITs and, and fell short, a little bit fell short of our expectations. Okay, thank you. Yep. You mentioned the Omicron as something that happened late in 2021. And in 2021, we saw the COVID-19 situation take multiple twists and turns. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you think we will finally be past this pandemic this year? And if so, which companies and sectors do you think stand to benefit more from this transition? Understood. Uh, so, I mean, it's a good question about the, the, the key concern is still the virus, right? And and it's very hard to predict uh, um, what COVID-19 will bring or the mutation will bring um, in the year uh, 2022, right? And, um, you know, globally, 50, about 59% is vaccinated. This, on the flip side, means that 40% of the global economy, global population is unvaccinated. And that, you know, gives more opportunity for the virus to mutate. And France uh, just announced earlier this week that uh, there's a new mutation, right? Mm -hmm. And according to Goldman Sachs research, um, they, they expect and they predict a large-scale inflation, uh, uh, a viral infection the, uh, in the first quarter of this year. And you could see that coming through uh, with U.S. reporting new, one, one million new cases a day um, it just uh, earlier this week. So that's, the, that's, the, that's the, um, the, 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 the uncertainty that the virus might bring. On the flip side, on the local side, um, you know, Prime Minister message, the New Year's message saying that um, year 2022 is going to be a year of transition, right? It's going to be a continued battle with the virus. Um, however, we believe that the reopening of the economy, uh, the story, remain uh, intact. And having said that, you know, um, industrials, like is it which sector, uh, I would say that um, REITs that include warehouse, logistics, uh, data center REITs should continue to benefit from the structural tailwinds, pandemic or not. Right, um, office risks definitely have a lo lower s downside risk, um, delayed by you know supply and demand kind of uh, from the new firms. Um, in terms of retail risks, right, um, suburban malls were definitely anticipated to be more resilient versus those malls along Orchard Roads uh, due to the lack of tourists at this moment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Moving on to uh, the economy, uh, for Hui Shi. Uh, we saw rising inflation this year and the Fed is likely hiking rates soon and there's also talk that the MAS may tighten this year. So which sectors do you think can benefit from this global monetary retightening? Uh, I, think, tightening? I yes. think a sector that could benefit from this uh, monetary policy tightening will be the local banks because the main interest rate benchmark for the Sing dollar uh, financial markets which is the Singapore Overnight Rate Average also known as the SORA generally tracks the US federal funds rate. And the net interest margins across the banks were flattish over the past year as SORA was at low levels. 
And so when the Fed starts to hike uh, rates later this year, I believe that SORA will also likely increase. And this will help to expand the net interest margins of the three local banks. And given that uh, about 50% of their revenue comes from net interest income, these rate hikes will benefit the earnings of the banks as well. Thank you. Uh, Yu Huan, do you agree that you have Yes, I do. And I mean, uh, along the same vein, uh, you find industries like, let's say, for example, indus uh, insurance will usually uh, benefit where interest rates rise because you know, their liabilities are longer dated than their assets. But aside from that, also, you know, very um, uh, you know, traditional beneficiaries of inflation like the industrials because they will benefit from, let's say, the commodity cycle that's uh, strong right now. Um, those are also sectors that we can look forward to that will benefit from uh, an inflationary environment. Okay, thank you. Adrian, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I would have to agree with the both of the, the speakers. Okay, so, yes. so both financials and uh, industrials. Mm. Yep. Uh, in, in addition to monetary policy, let's talk about fiscal policy instead. Mm. There's a strong possibility of a GST hike in the upcoming budget. So Yu Huan, how would this GST hike affect your stock picks? Yeah, so I mean a, a, a fiscal tightening uh, GST hike uh, normally would be negative for the markets, negative for the economy. Um, so for us at Nico, we are very much bottom-up stock pickers. So we go back to what we do normally, which is to pick stocks based on uh, positive fundamental change um, and also sustainable returns. So this is what we will still focus on. Um, amid such an environment, we will be looking for companies which are, have strong business models, strong franchises, that are able to you know, pass on some of these um, uh, you know, increases in taxes, for example, to, to the customers. So uh, we'll be looking for uh, companies which are, for example, in the new Singapore thematic that we favour. These are companies uh, operating in industries which are representative of the future of Singapore. Um, within these uh, names are uh, in industries like data, tech, renewable energy, for example. Um, so lastly, we could also look for um, companies which have corporate restructuring angles. So within such a challenging uh, environment uh, that usually is uh, brought forward by fiscal tightening, we will look for you know, more bottom-up ideas uh, with companies which are uh, on high-quality companies that will ride through this environment. Thank you very much for your thoughts. So um, moving on to uh, on the sector level analysis, uh, which uh, financials are a key sector of the STI and it includes our three major local banks. So do you think the financial sector as a whole in 2022 can perform well and which uh, banks do you think can outperform the others? Uh, so for the uh, financial sector in the STI, it mainly consists of four different stocks, which will be the banks as well as the Singapore Exchange, SGX. But within this sector, I prefer the banks more because I think there are a lot of developments that could happen this year that could benefit them and which in turn can help to drive an outperformance. So firstly, like I mentioned earlier, uh, rate hikes will definitely benefit those banks as this will help to expand their net interest margins. And besides this, I think another development to look out for this year will be loan growth. So loan growth, we believe it will continue in 2022, mainly being derived from the more resilient manufacturing sector, as well as uh, the recovery of the property-related sectors such as construction, following the gradual reopening of the economy. And lastly, another factor would be fee income, especially uh, wealth management fees. That would be a key earnings driver for the banks moving forward. So the three local banks, they are in a good position to capitalize on the fast growing wealth management space in Asia, which is being supported by rising income levels uh, from the wealthy middle class. And besides this, uh, card fees, which has benefited from the economic rebound uh, last year, is likely to continue on its uptrend this year, this year as well. And so overall, the banks, they still remain well capitalized. So this reaffirms their positions to maintain sustainable dividend payouts. And I think on average, uh, in 2022, investors can expect a dividend yield of about 5% uh, from the banks. And in terms of valuations, I think that uh, OCBC and UOB, they would be more attractive uh, for investors given that they have more room for capital appreciation. Uh, Yu Huan, do you agree? Um, yes, I agree that banks will do very well. Um, in general, in a rising interest rate environment, the Singapore banks all benefit from uh, having higher uh, net interest margins. Um, I'd like to highlight, though, of course, there are other factors, for example, like, um, let's say DBS, for example. It's the most liquid bank. So in an environment where liquidity is scarce, the most liquid bank usually does very well. Apart from that, we also uh, pay a lot of attention to another factor, which is the um, digital capabilities of the bank. So we think that digitalization will be a very important 
um, uh, thing to look out for when selecting banks because that would not only allow them to um, avail themselves of different uh, business opportunities, but also allow them on the back end to save a lot on costs. So obviously we think that you know, a name like DBS has a very strong digital capability. Um, and so that, that these are some of the factors which we believe uh, will be important for um, select stock selection in the financial sector. Thank you very much for your insights. Uh, moving on to another key sector of the STI, which is REITs. So, uh, Hui Shi, uh, among the different property names, which do you think uh, can perform best in 2022, both in terms of capital appreciation as well as dividend yield? In terms of both capital appreciation and dividend yield, I think that the industrial and the data center REITs, they could perform the best in 2022. Uh, for REITs, uh, capital appreciation usually comes when there are expectations of an increase in their distribution per unit, also known as their DPU. And I expect the DPU recovery of the retail REITs, especially those uh, that are focused on the Orchard Road malls, to be very gradual, especially if we take into account the near-term risk from Omicron. And on the other hand, like what to echo what uh, Adrian, Adrian mentioned earlier, when that, even if there's a pandemic or not, there will be strong structural drivers uh, driving the DPU growth of the industrial as well as the data center REITs. So for example, the accession of e-commerce and also the shift from just-in-time to just-in-case inventory management in order to cope with the supply chain disruptions caused by the pandemic is expected to drive the demand for warehouses. And the pandemic has also accelerated several long-term trends which drive data traffic and that in turn leads to greater demand for data centers. So such trends will include uh, increase in spending on cloud services, your emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things and 5G, as well as the growth of internet platforms. So I think that these trends, they make the industrial as well as the data center reads very attractive, uh, providing them with the potential for capital appreciation. And now in terms of the dividend yield, I believe most of the large cap industrial REITs like Ascenders, it is offering a yield of about uh, 5% in 2022. And that is still considered quite decent as that is around the sector average. On the other hand, for uh, data centers, the yield is slightly lower at about 4%. But that being said, there could be more room for a further yield compression uh, given that data centers are seeing robust demand post-pandemic. So in terms of total returns, I think this REITs uh, could do well in 2022. Adrian, do you agree on her stance on retail and industrial REITs? Yes, uh, I totally have to thank Hui Xu for backing me up in the sense that we, we prefer to look at a total return kind of uh, um, criteria rather than just looking at the yield because yield is just part of the investment story, right? Uh, high dividend yield stock means that either the price has been stable or depressed that's the reason why it explains a higher dividend yield, right? So we look at the capital appreciation and the yield as a total return kind of, 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 of a totality in terms of when it comes to investments, right? And the CSOP S-REITS Leaders ETF offers, you know, a very well diversified portfolios of, you know, large and mid-cap S-REITS, right? Or in this listed on SGX, or we call it Singapore REITS, right? To give investors, you know, very stable, long-term total returns, right? So in the last five years, the, the ASHREED's Leaders Index uh, has, you know, garnered a, a total return of about average 10% per annum, right? And, and what makes this leader very unique is because of the liquidity adjustment kind of strategies. There's 42 names in, in, in ASHREED's list on SGX. We get in the big boys into the club. And you know who, who plays in what position is actually based on the liquidity for the last six months, and for the last rebalancing in September, we've seen you know uh, there there is a huge uptick in in terms of retail, uh, retail uh, reads, and you know after rebalancing that has actually put up more weight into our index and into our ETF. Now what this liquidity adjustment does is actually it tr it tracks fund flows, it tracks um, investors. Um, um, interest into the particular sectors. This helped the index and the ETF to be more robust in terms of tracking, to be more relevant to the current economic situation. And having said that, um, our, in, our index, uh, leaders index ETF right now uh, comprises about 50% weightage and exposure into the new economy sector, such as industrial, logistic and data center. And so this is actually our preferred um, sector due to the strong uh, tailwinds of uh, you know, e-commerce going forward. 
And we also like office reads as, as a whole because they, they, fare bet they would definitely likely fare better in, in this year, 2022, um, as Singapore shift away from the full default 100% working from home, um, opening up a bit, bit by letting 50% of the workforce coming back to office. And then we believe that eventually um, they will come back to 100% setup, uh, return office setup. So again, office um, reads comprises about 23% of the leaders index in this case. Okay. Yep. Um, overall, it seems you're pretty optimistic on SG REITs. So um, I guess if you could summarize what you mentioned just now about your ETF, uh, could you perhaps summarize in a few sentences why you recommend this ETF? Yes. So again, this S REITs is uh, this S REITs in index, right? It's actually based on the large cap. We get into um, the large and mid caps S REITs on on SGX to be in the club. We rebalance it not on the based not on the traditional kind of market weight kind of weighting, uh, market cap kind of weighting. We weight based on the liquidity for the last six months. So if, if for example a REIT has been actively traded for the last six months, this reflects um, uh, you know investors fund flows, and then so during our rebalancing at every six months interval, we would actually put in we would actually put in more weight to this particular REIT. This just to signify uh, just to rebalance the portfolio to signify a particular um, sector that is actually very, very um, um, hot at the moment. So it keeps the index and ETF very robust and very um, um, up to date to the current market situation. Okay. So again, um, after two rebalancing, right now 50% is actually into industrial, logistics, warehouse and data centers. So uh, we let, let us do the rebalancing for, for the investors right now. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, moving on to Yu Huan. Yep. One of our recommendations today is the Nikko AM Singapore Dividend Equity Fund. So why would you recommend this fund for investors? Um, I think for investors who are looking to invest in our home market, Singapore, um, uh, the, they, they really do have to consider a dividend fund because Singapore is a fairly mature market. It's got a lot of high quality companies, uh, strong dividend payers. So uh, you know, having a dividend strategy makes a lot of sense, right? Um, and also the fund itself, I'll talk more in my presentation, but the fund itself is designed to offer the best total return proposition by focusing both on dividend anchors as well as dividend growers. And we think that that combination of um, uh, dividend anchors, which are strong dividend payers, plus a little bit of growth, um, is really uh, a very good package that uh, will give investors um, uh, you know, a, a strong overall return uh, for their investments. Okay, thank you. We look forward to hearing more about your fund later. Mm -hmm. But just to sum up today, uh, perhaps we could start with Adrian today. Uh, how will you rate Singaporean equities as a whole in 2022 compared to both ASEAN and global equities? Well, I, I think um, maybe Yuhan is actually the better. But I, I would say that, you know, based on the STI right now, right, um, it's actually 40% to the large banks and, you know, 14% into the, the REITs, which are, these are, these are actually both like like we want to say like for it offers you know growth in terms of the bank portion and, and the REIT side is actually very stable and yet also offers investors income. So I would say comparing Singapore equities to um, the ASEAN equities, I think that we actually just, we categorize Singapore equities as a a safe haven. Right. All right. Yeah. Uh, you find what are your thoughts? I think Singapore will do well because uh, Singapore is uh, traditionally a market that does well when interest rates rise because of the banks. Let's say for example. Um, and then traditionally, you will look at uh, some of the other ASEAN countries, perhaps like Indonesia, where in a rising interest rate environment, usually it is a little bit more challenged. Of course, the rising tide of the, of the reopening will lift all boats. But I think Singapore is very well placed, uh, both in terms of the interest rate cycle, as well as uh, the center, being the center of uh, ASEAN, where it's also doing a lot of business with the rest of the economies. And if they do well, we will also do well. Thank you very much to our speakers today. Yu Huan, Adrian and Hui Shi for joining us today and sharing your views on Singaporean equities. We will now hand everyone back to the MC. Thank you to our various panellists. We will now proceed to the next presentation where we will have Lai Yu Huan to share more about the Nikko AM Singapore Dividend Equity Fund and why we remain positive on dividend stocks. Let us once again welcome Lai Yu Huan. Good afternoon, uh, and thank you everyone for spending time this afternoon uh, to listen to us on our Singapore, uh, Singapore Equities Outlook uh, entitled On Firmer Footing. Um, this is the outline for my presentation today. I'll give you a very quick overview of Nikko Asset Management um, and then talk about the market outlook and why we think that uh, the year 2022, 2022 will see uh, Singapore on a firmer footing. 
we'll talk about how uh, we design our portfolio to take advantage of this uh, backdrop. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk a bit about our Singapore Dividend Equ Equity Fund. Um, straight on to the outlook, uh, straight on to the introduction on Nuclear Asset Management. Uh, we are obviously one of the largest um, asset managers in Asia, uh, headquartered in Tokyo. But what I would want to highlight is that we have been uh, managing actually Singapore equities for a very long time. Uh, and through our acquisition of DBS Asset Management in 2011, we've actually uh, have some of the oldest uh, unit trusts uh, uh, that's investing in Singapore, um, as old as the 1980s. So we are, we've been uh, uh, investing in Singapore uh, for a long, long history. Um, on to the outlook uh, on firmer footing. So I think on everybody's mind today would be, you know, what's our uh, view of what's happening with the pandemic, right? Omicron is certainly uh, on everybody's mind. So our view is that we are cautiously sanguine on, on Omicron. Uh, why? Because we think that uh, the uh, less serious effects of Omicron will mean that Singapore will, ride, will be able to ride through uh, the Omicron wave without uh, too much uh, uh, stress to the uh, healthcare system and without uh, be, uh, needing to resort to a further uh, clampdown of uh, social distancing. So we think that, uh, so that sets the base for our expectations for 2022 in that we are quite sanguine about, about COVID, the COVID situation. Um, so a recap about uh, the economy. We know that the economy in 2021 did very well. Yeah? We know that uh, in, uh, GDP growth was more than 7%. Um, and in 2021, we actually already uh, recovered all the lost ground of 2020 and the economy is already uh, bigger than in 2019. Uh, so that sets a very stable and strong footing for 2022. Um, of course, 2021 was driven by a very, very strong uh, manufacturing sector, right? We, have a, we had a boom in our exports. Um, in 2022, we expect this um, a level of activity in the manufacturing sector to persist. We don't think that it will, there will be a downturn, but of course, the rate of growth in manufacturing will be slower. But the good thing is, uh, we think that in 2022, the baton will, will be passed on to other sectors like services um, and also construction where the reopening will benefit uh, these sectors and they will be uh, taking over as the drivers of growth. Um, one of the things that we can look forward to 2022, I think we are, we are all looking forward to that, is the resumption of travel. Uh, we've already seen that in the, in the, in, in the last couple of months. Uh, and we've, of course, had the vaccinated travel lanes, right? These, um, uh, we've had uh, arrangements with a number of countries and the countries that we have VTL arrangements with now cover more than 50% of uh, the tourists that would have arrived uh, from these markets in any normal year. So, of course, uh, the capacity to these VTL countries are currently limited, but once we improve on the, uh, our ability to handle VTL uh, visitors, then these, uh, these, these numbers will, uh, will, will certainly, um, uh, these, these markets will, will be the big markets for us and will actually generate, I think, uh, a, a gradual improvement uh, in tourist traffic, which I think will gradually improve and to return to normal uh, over the next two to three years. So it's a good time also to recap on the um, you know, fundamental strengths uh, of Singapore. You know, you must, uh, I think that investors uh, sometimes forget and need to bear in mind that Singapore is a very uh, well-managed uh, um, economy. We have plenty of accolades, uh, which, we, which, we, which actually has allowed us to ride through this pandemic uh, quite smoothly. Amidst uh, the, the pandemic in 2019 and 2020, uh, in 2020 and 2021, um, FDI has remained strong. So if you look at uh, the chart on the left-hand side, you will see that FDI in 2020 is practically at an all-time high. Uh, 2021, is, uh, we've seen nine months of it, it's uh, slightly less, but I think still a very strong number. What's really, really interesting is the type of FDI that's coming in. If you look at the table on the right-hand side, you will see that these are coming in from a lot of new economy companies, uh, be they you know, uh, e-commerce companies or uh, companies like Zoom or even companies which are uh, uh, old economy companies but in new economy sort of like areas like, e, uh, like uh, uh, um, electric vehicles. So the investments are coming in in very interesting areas uh, in Singapore. Um, the Singapore economy is a very diverse economy. Um, uh, we, are, we are diversified between manufacturing, finance and services. Uh, and this um, is a strength that we have seen, uh, for example, in 2020 and 2021. Um, uh, in, an, in, in an era where, let's say, for example, the services sector 
was uh, badly hit by the pandemic, we've had the manufacturing sector pick up the slack. And we expect this uh, to kind of reverse in 2022, where you know, the growth is slowing down in the manufacturing side, but the services side, I think, will pick up the stack in 2022. So that this diversification of the economy is really a strength uh, when thinking about investing in Singapore. Singapore is also a leader in the digital race in ASEAN. Um, you will see that the, um, the, this is the GMV, uh, the gross market value of e-commerce transactions, is just a proxy for the growth um, of the digital economy. Singapore is not the largest part of these of this bar charts that you see here. Um, Indonesia is very large. But why I say we are leader is because you know, we have the people and we are the location for a lot of these companies. If you think about the two largest unicorns out there, uh, C, which runs Shopee and which runs Garena, uh, as well as Grab, they are headquartered in Singapore. In fact, Grab moved their headquarters down from KL to Singapore because of the quality of our manpower and the desirability of our um, location as a, as a HQ. So we are a leader and these, um, uh, the growth in the digital economy in, in the countries around us will definitely be uh, beneficial for Singapore. So overall, I look at uh, 2022 as a continuation of the economic expansion that we've seen in 2021. Um, so of, obviously 2021, we've had about 7%. And I think that 2022 will still be very attractive and will still be above trend um, and 2022 will still look like a very strong year uh, for the economy. Uh, and in tandem with that, um, uh, I expect that corporate earnings will also grow very well. So of course, in 2021, we've seen a huge rebound after the contraction of 2020. Um, but I think that this, mo this momentum will be maintained and the next, uh, this year and uh, even next year will be years where um, the, 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 the corporate earnings growth will actually be uh, still quite attractive. What's also very interesting about uh, corporate earnings growth is that in 2022, the makeup of uh, corporate earnings growth will be different from in 2021. In 2021, it was concentrated a lot around the banks, uh, but in 2022, you have a lot more other sectors, the services sectors, um, uh, the trade sectors, also benefiting from the reopening. So we, in, in, when, 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 it, when corporate earnings growth broadens out, it's a good environment stock for, for stock pickers like us because it just gives you uh, more opportunities to find good stocks. Um, and this is uh, uh, another chart that says the same thing. In 2021, you will see that you know, sectors like healthcare, sectors like manufacturing, of course, did very, very well. But in 2022, you will see the baton being passed on to sectors like uh, 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 transport, which is a, 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 a beneficiary of reopening, as well as sectors like gaming, which is a, a, a beneficiary of uh, the restart of international travel. Um, the Singapore market is not expensive. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the P-E ratio is kind of about, about average. Um, so we think that's, 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 that's not expensive at all. And on the right-hand side, the price-to-book ratio is actually uh, very attractive. More interestingly, Singapore remains a very strong dividend-paying market. Uh, so the dividend yield level around 4%, I think it's still a very uh, attractive level. And certainly, we are one of the highest uh, dividend-paying markets among our peers in the region. So uh, just to give you a quick summary of our outlook. So we are cautiously sanguine on, on Omicron. We think that the reopening uh, will be able to continue um, as well as uh, uh, together with the resumption of uh, international travel. Uh, we think that uh, there will be a continued expansion of the economy in 2022. Um, and we also believe that uh, the uh, corporate earnings would recover in, in tandem. So we continue to be positive. So what, do we, uh, what stocks do we pick, what sectors do we pick in such an environment, right? Uh, I'll go back to this chart because um, clearly it shows you uh, what's, uh, what, come, what, what sectors will do well. Uh, we, we've, we've done, uh, we, we're definitely uh, uh, invested in sectors like uh, transport, uh, which will benefit from uh, domestic uh, activity uh, uh, recovery, um, but also uh, uh, other sectors that benefit from the reopening like uh, retail, uh, like uh, hospitality a little bit. Um, uh, and, and as well as uh, even commodity side where, where um, commodity prices are also stronger. Um, the new Singapore is something that we've liked uh, for, for some time. Uh, it's a thematic that we, um, uh, that's very, very, very uh, core to uh, our, our strategy. Um, and what is the new Singapore is basically, you know, we coined this when, S when Singapore was uh, celebrating its SG50. And we were thinking, what sectors would be uh, the most uh, important sectors to the economy in the next 50 years for Singapore? 
And these sectors, I think, will be uh, the most interesting to invest in. So we, we looked at the Singapore landscape, and these sectors uh, will be, I think, in areas like data, tech, renewable energy. Um, and also, you know, tourism is there. I think that it will recover over the next two to three years. And some of the areas where Singapore is strong in, like, let's say, for example, food solutions. So these, we, we think, are the sectors that will benefit from uh, 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 you know, the economy of the future that we are also very keen uh, to invest in. Um, again, also, we are positive on uh, corporate restructuring. Um, corporate restructuring is a, is, is, is a constant feature of the Singapore landscape, right? Uh, amidst uh, a challenging economy, corporate restructuring um, is, is accelerated. And we've seen uh, many, many uh, opportunities uh, in 2021, including M&As, restructuring. Um, so there are many opportunities within, within some of the Singapore corporates where they are you know, basically reshaping their business to take advantage of uh, the economy of the future. And this, we, will, we believe, will be very interesting uh, investment opportunities. So uh, allow me to talk about uh, the Singapore Dividend Equity Fund and how you know, basically that uh, um, is uh, a good vehicle to kind of like capture all these opportunities that I talked about. Um, the key idea behind the fund is an, uh, is an attractive total return proposition. And that total return pro proposition comprises of both uh, dividend yield and capital appreciation. That is achieved by basically the design of the fund. So the fund is designed to invest uh, the majority of the fund in what we call dividend anchors. And this will be 70 to 80% of our fund, right? What are dividend anchors? They are mature companies. They are, in, uh, they are high quality companies, well managed in industries which are stable. Um, and they have the ability and the willingness to give you a very repeatable uh, and dependable dividend yield, right? A high dividend yield. Um, but we also invest 20 to 30% of the fund in what we call dividend growers. Now, dividend growers may not be very strong dividend payers today, but they are high growth companies that we believe will attain dividend anchor status over the next three to five years. You know, they will be the dividend payers of the future. So we believe that a combination like this is the best combination um, to achieve a very good total return uh, proposition. We also have the ability to um, invest outside of Singapore. Currently, we don't do a lot of that because we want to stay very close to our dividend anchor and dividend, an uh, dividend grower kind of strategy. We have a number of REITs which are outside of Singapore, um, and I think they also fit into that anchor and growth kind of profile. So um, this uh, strategy of dividend anchors and dividend growers, um, I believe, has been vindicated. We've uh, had a, quite a, uh, a number of uh, awards over the years for, for the Singapore Dividend Equity Fund, um, and I think that speaks uh, to the uh, returns that it has been able to generate for uh, our investors. So uh, to summarize, um, we are sanguine on COVID. We think that um, you know, Singapore will be able to ride through this Omicron wave without too much of a disruption and that reopening uh, will uh, again uh, proceed for the Singapore economy. We believe that the Singapore economy is very well placed. There is an uh, on ongoing recovery that will take place in 2022 and uh, the, the, the coming years and, and that this will, take, uh, this will come together with an, with an improvement in uh, corporate earnings. We believe that valuations are reasonable um, and that Singapore is one of the best dividend-paying markets. Um, and we think that uh, the, uh, the, the Singapore Dividend Equity Fund, which it, with its uh, dividend anchor as well as dividend grower kind of strategy, is a very um, good uh, you know, uh, kind of investment uh, vehicle to kind of express this positive view on Singapore e equities. Thank you. Thank you, Lai Yuhuan. This wraps up our segment on investing in our homeland, Singapore. Coming up next, we cast our gaze toward Asia. Asian markets have come a long way over the past 20 years, but the question is, what is there to come for the next 20? From JP Morgan, we have Alexander Trev's Mark Managing Director, Head of Emerging Markets and Asia-Pacific, Equities Investment Specialist, Asia to share on the multiple opportunities we see around our part of the globe in Asia and how we are able to capture these prospects. Let's welcome Alexander. Well, good afternoon. What a pleasure it is to be speaking to all of you today. And I'm full of enthusiasm and excitement, not just because I'm talking to you, but because we're all living through the Asian century. And that's what I want to talk about 
at this particular session. Now, I don't know what's going to happen over the next year or so, but what I feel very strongly is that we are living through just the most extraordinary transformation and that the, the, the Asian market environment will be so much stronger in 10 years' time than it is now. And all we need to do is figure out how to navigate from here to there. So let's go to my first slide, because I think that some of this narrative will be fairly familiar to, to you. Um, when you, we go into the next picture, you will see that, um, as you know, there are hundreds of millions of, of consumers in Asia joining the middle class. And the, the standard story that you will have heard many times is that as all of these people get a little bit richer, they will buy more things. And this is driving the, the Asian economic miracle. But I get a little bit frustrated by that because it really is only part of the story. Um, that's about creating demand. That's about the opportunity set. That's basically saying, here are the revenues. But unless you have the sorts of companies which can satisfy those um, that demand, which will create the goods and services in an innovative way to meet all of those, um, the, the, those consumers' needs, then you're not getting the full picture. And so what I really want to do is focus on the next slide, please, because this is where things have transformed during the 25 years that I've been investing in Asia. And what you'll be able to see from this slide is that um, China, for example, but also some of the other countries have gone from being, and if we go to the, the next slide, please, China and some of these other countries in the region have gone from being really consumers of other people's goods and services to being innovators who manufacture themselves. And let's look a look at, take a look at that um, sort of green line there on the left. Back in 1996, when I first arrived in Singapore, nothing you really bought or consumed was made in China, maybe some garments, maybe some low-end furniture. But actually, the story there was around China building out its own manufacturing capacity in low-end commoditized goods to satisfy the rest of the world. And what's really happened in record time is that China has gone from being this low-end commoditized mass market manufacturer to being one of the most innovative players on the planet. But that's just not a story only about China. That could also um, address Taiwan, South Korea, large parts of ASEAN, Indian financial services and, and technology, et cetera. And this is super, super important because if you have the consumption, but you don't have the supply, then you don't have investable ideas to make money out of. And that's why I get so excited about this chart. It's because Asia isn't just buying more things. It's also creating more things that people in Asia and around the rest of the world think are attractive. So when we think about how we want to invest in Asia, let's go on to the next slide, please, because there are various key themes which sit within our portfolios within the Asia growth strategy, which represent this. And these are really the conjunction of this, the demand side and the innovative supply side. So we have lifestyle upgrades. And I'll go into this in a little bit more detail. We have demographic changes, and we also have financial deepening. And each of those areas is broader than maybe you would appreciate at first glance. So let's go on to the next slide, please. And I'll give you some examples about the sort of lifestyle upgrades we're seeing. Now, at the most prosaic level, we've got a large, uh, relatively poor population in the region still who are going from just being able to consume the most basic staples to being able to enjoy rather better goods and services. And so on the left-hand side, we have this, this theme of premiumization, which is another way of saying upgrading. This is people buying higher quality food, better frozen food, uh, larger packets or containers of shampoo, better toothpaste, all of the branded things that you and I would take for granted in Singapore, but in a market like India is still quite aspirational. And as people get wealthier, they will only consume more of those things. But then in the new economy, firmly in the new economy, of course, we've got this growth of e-commerce. And while in Staples, I would argue that Asia is still catching up with consumption in the, the richer world in the West, in e-commerce, quite often Asian companies are leapfrogging what's possible in the West. And of course, the story is still unfolding. So we do have markets like China or Korea, where already the e-commerce industry is really quite well evolved. But then we've got the whole of the, the sort of the, the emerging Southeast Asian region, which hasn't arrived at the party yet. 
And all of that will come. We can be very, very confident about that. The question is partly when, but we can be patient, but also how we monetize it. And then, of course, all of this isn't possible, including the conversation that you and I are having now, without what we see on the right-hand side, which is the hardware which supports all of the services which take place um, in the digital realm. And this is, again, where Asia just leads the story in Korea and Taiwan, increasingly in China, and more broadly, as Asia provides the hardware, which powers the software, the e-commerce, the gaming, the, the online video conferencing, et cetera. So these are all different areas of lifestyle upgrades. And we can be very confident that these, this isn't just a 2022 or a 2023 story. These are phenomena which will persist for one or two or three decades from here. Now let's talk about the, the next thing. So onto the next slide, please. And here we have demographic changes. And these manifest themselves in different ways. One thing is that when you don't have much money, you buy more food. When you have food, you buy transportation. When you have transportation, you buy accommodation. When you have accommodation, well, then you start getting more involved in the, the digital realm, etc. But the other thing which happens, of course, is that you're able to spend more money on health. And one of the things that COVID has done is it's only underscored the need for all of us to pay great attention to our health. And the exciting thing here, back to my themes, it's not just around Asian people spending more money on their bodies and their minds. It's also around Asian companies being in a better position to provide the medicine and the healthcare and the medical equipment to, to satisfy those demands. So we have our now homegrown innovative pharmaceutical companies within the region. And on the left-hand side, you can see just how far China's R&D in healthcare is outstripping that in the US. Not yet in absolute terms, but in terms of the growth rate and of course, that R&D is what will underscore future revenues in the space. It's underpin it. And in the middle, we have something which is even more sort of mind-blowing, which is the CRO space. Now, you may or may not know what it means. And if you don't, this is contract research outsourcing, which is where we have companies in the region who are now doing drug development on behalf of pharmaceutical companies within the region and elsewhere. So this is really, really cutting-edge stuff. And 20 years ago, if I said to you that, China will have an entire industry where they will be producing Western medicine for people like you and me. I think you would not have believed it just yet because we really couldn't participate in that. Well, now this is a very, very firmly entrenched phenomenon. And then on the right-hand side, we have a different element to demographics. And this is really the flip side of this sort of um, a, a, a emerging middle-class miracle, which is, of course, one of the reasons that people in the middle class can afford to spend more is because they're being paid more. And if you're paid more, then you're more expensive. And if you want to manufacture things cheaply, then expensive workers aren't really what you're looking for. And so we see um, a, a long run growth in industrial automation for Asian companies as they replace increasingly the sorts of people who had done low end jobs with robots, which can do them cheaper, more effectively, safer, etc. And again, this will just free up people for the more exciting parts of life. So it's a, it's a positive social story. It's also something which has many years to play out. If we look at the penetration, for example, of robots in Asia um, compared with some other geographies. And then let's go on to my next slide, please. Because financial services is an area which maybe feels a little bit more sort of boring somehow. It's incredibly important. But is there really innovation in finance? Is there a technology angle to this? And the answer is, well, yes, of course. And the conversation we're having now is an example of it. Four years ago, it's highly unlikely that I would have been on a, a Zoom call with all of you on a, a Saturday afternoon using this format. But let's think more broadly around the, the larger populations in the region. The first thing is that Asia is still an underinsured market. And as I've said for both upgrading or premiumization, as I've said for healthcare, this is also the case for insurance, which is as people get wealthier, they have more discretionary income to spend on things like insurance in addition to the staples in their life. And so we've got very strong confidence that penetration rates of insurance will continue to rise. And it's a matter then of finding the companies who do the best job of serving those needs. Beyond that, in banking more generally, um, we know that retail bank services are underpenetrated in the region. And we have one 
particular data point here, which is the number of credit cards per capita. And you can see that in markets like India, these are still vanishingly low rates. And so all of this will carry on growing for a sustained period of time. And then, of course, mutual fund penetration is just another angle of this. So you might be saying, well, where's the technology in this? These are just mutual funds or insurance policies or current accounts. And let me take India to give you an example, but something like Indonesia would be a similar story. Uh, unfortunately, in India, a depressingly large number of people are still illiterate. Uh, now, that's not their fault. There's no judgment contained in that on my part. But of course, if you're illiterate and you can't read or write, then things like KYC, know your client, how you would onboard a new banking customer within all the anti-money laundering regulations and all of the restrictions, that's a seriously complex job. What India has done, and this might be old news to you, is they've got a unique ID system now where every single Indian has their own unique ID. And for people who can't read, they can use an iris scan in their thumbprint, which of course is unique to them to identify them. So that's just a, a fantastic example of technology being used to make a service available to hundreds of millions of people and households who previously were unable to access something as basic as financial, as financial services. And that's only going to continue the use of mobile telephones, the use of online banking, the use of UIDs and things like that. All of that will just massively expand the addressable customer base for these services. Now, I don't have to be clairvoyant to sort of imagine what you're thinking, which is I'm telling you this very, very positive story on a Saturday afternoon in January. Um, but, but over the last year, we couldn't open a newspaper or we couldn't log onto the internet without some piece of sort of mind-blowing news coming out of China. I mean, what about this? What are the risks there? How can we have such a positive outlook when there's so much news emanating from China? Now, let's go on to the next slide, please. And this sets the bigger picture for what Chinese policymakers are trying to achieve. And I will, I will let you into a, a secret here about the media, of course, which is they don't make money out of printing good news. And they don't make money out of printing no news. So if we just take a step back and have a look at the long-run view in China and trying to understand what the policymakers are really trying to achieve, that will help us cut through some of the noise that we all get distracted by in the media and focus just on the signal of what really matters. And the key here is that the Chinese government is making a very deliberate trade-off. They are willing to accept a slower economic growth rate in the future than in the past, which is just a, a mathematical inevitability as people get wealthier, in return for a more stable and sustainable growth rate. And that sustainability manifests itself in social terms, which is to have a, a fairer society. It manifests itself in environmental terms. They want a less damaging environmental impact as they carry on growing the economy. And it also manifests itself, manifests itself in terms of the volatility of that growth. So they want less of the boom and bust, which affected China in the past, and a more stable growth trajectory. And that ties directly back into balance sheets. So on the next chart, please, we're going to start by talking about the internet, because this will have um, distracted so many of us so much over the last year. And what I would say is that although I will absolutely take issue with how some of the policies have been communicated, our view is that the Chinese regulation in the internet space has been more logical, targeted, and consistent than many people give them credit for. If I say to you that one of the aims of the regulation is to crack down on, anti -mon uh, on, on monopolistic behavior, I don't think you would find that controversial. If I say that one of the aims of the regulation is that companies should treat gig workers fairly and pay their employees properly, I don't think you would find that controversial. If I say to you that the regulation is there to prevent regulatory arbitrage between different regulators in different sectors, and also that it is aims to ensure proper use of data and all of the rules around data and who's allowed to share what, I don't think you'll find that controversial either. In fact, regulators in the West have been doing this for some time. So our sense is that China, which has had a very, very light touch on internet regulation for some time, is basically just catching up with quite a lot of what's happened already in other geographies. And moreover, China is not anti-innovation. The government understands that so much of what China has achieved over the last generation is very firmly down to innovation. But what they want to make sure is that the big players don't unfairly squeeze out the up-and-coming smaller players. So that's what we see in the internet space. It's not always going to be a, an easy ride, but we think that taking a long-run view, there is still plenty of opportunity here. 
Now, let's go on to the next slide because there's another ah, but moment, which is going to say, but what about geopolitics? And there's good news and bad news here. The bad news is if you are expecting there to be a, an easing of geopolitical tension between the US and China anytime soon, then you'll be disappointed. And that's for a simple reason, which is you can't go from a multipolar to a, uni, a unipolar to a multipolar world, excuse me, which is to say you can't go from having one superpower to two superpowers without there being quite a lot of headbutting between the big beasts along the way. But once you've learned to live with that, everything is fairly standard. There will be tension between the two countries, but they also need to live with each other. And in addition to the headwinds, there are tailwinds, and this chart illustrates one of them, which is that in the face of this tension, China is absolutely determined to become self-sufficient in a whole array of areas which previously it relied on um, imported goods for. So integrated circuits, office software, robotics, um, lasers, et cetera, et cetera. Because of the innovation that China has been doing, it can now manufacture these things themselves rather than having to import them. And of course, there's a large listed space which we can monetize to take advantage of that. And then there's one more chart I would like to talk about on China, which is the next chart, please, which is real estate. What about the real estate market? And on the, the, the slide that you are about to see, um, so the, the next chart, please, there is only one data point I want you to look at. And it's really, really small on your screen, so I apologize. But on the top right-hand corner, there is a small orange square. And what that shows you is Evergrande's debt as a percentage of the overall banking system. And the point is, you can barely see it. So going back to what I said about Chinese political, um, the Chinese political agenda, they want a more stable growth path. That means they have deliberately clamped down on debt in real estate and elsewhere. That means there's collateral damage. And if a company overextends itself and can't meet its debt obligations, well, capitalism tells you that's too bad, I'm afraid. That's just running your business poorly. But we think this is going to create a uh, a growth slowdown for the market, but nothing which is existential or systemic. So we think that the, the Chinese real estate is a, a sector to be extremely careful of, um, but we don't think there is anything there which is going to threaten the broader economic picture. So let's go on to my final slides, please. The next slide is just um, a topic which really we you know, we should be addressing in every single meeting. This is around ESG. I'm sure you've heard a lot about sustainability recently. Simply to say that we have been ESG integrated in our research process for nearly a decade already for the very simple reason that unless you're thinking about the environmental impact of your companies or about the social impact of the businesses that you invest in or indeed the governance of the, the management teams that you're entrusting your capital with, well, then you can't make good investments anyway. And if you look on the right-hand side here, you can see that we're already overweight to leaving e leave leading electric vehicle battery supplier in China. Of course, this is an attractive area, irrespective of whether or not sustainable is a, a hot topic on a particular day. Of course, we invest in companies which look after their workforce and the broader community. And if a company doesn't take our interests seriously as minority equity investors, you can see in the bottom example there, then we will exit it. It's really, really simple. So my final two charts. So onto the next chart, please. This just shows you within our Asia growth strategy how we are positioned then at the moment. You can see that we are currently overweight financials for the reasons that I've illustrated. We're overweight communication services, and that can be a little bit misleading because that includes a lot of internet, such as social media and gaming. We're overweight IT, which tends to be physical IT, so hardware, semiconductors, DRAM, um, screens and cameras, all of that good stuff, you know, the camera you're giving your smartphone. And then we're typically underweight price takers rather than price setters. We're underweight capital intensive, low margin businesses. So things in materials, energy, real estate, utilities, these tend not to offer these attractive long run growth opportunities, which you and I want to invest in to benefit from the Asian century. And this at the moment leads us to be overweight Indonesia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, for example, to have less money in South Korea, where governance is trickier, where in China, where there's a large financial sector we're less interested in, in Malaysia, etc. But I should say that these sector and country positions are very much the outcome of bottom-up stock selection. And then if we can go on to my final slide, please, just to wrap up, an appropriate question to end with is, yeah, well, does this work? This is a nice story. How does it pan out? And if I can draw your attention, please, to the 
three, five, and uh, five year and since inception numbers, you can see that over time, annualized, this is annualized data, net of, um, actually, this is composite. So this might be gross of fees, actually. But so annualized gross of fees, five years, this has generated 476 basis points of outperformance for our composite performance above the benchmark. So to conclude, I'm excited because this is the Asian century and I'm thrilled to be talking to you about it. I would counsel you not to get too caught up in what's going to happen next week or something, but there's so much noise in the media. But actually, if you just set your sights on what you can feel confidence in for the longer run, that's a really good way to invest. And taking this structural growth approach, looking for these, these businesses with long growth runways and trends which we know will persist for a sustained period of time can yield some really attractive returns. With that, thank you very much indeed, and I hope you have a, a splendid, safe, and happy year. Thank you, Alexander. Coming up next, we take a look at the ASEAN, one of the fastest growing consumer markets in the world. The region is also a major global hub of manufacturing and trade, which has given rise to many globally competitive companies. In this session presented by Jason Wong, Research Manager at IFAST Malaysia, we will provide insight into one of the world's most dynamic regions. Joining us is Cyrus Wong, Macro Research Analyst from IFAST Singapore. Turning to one of the more underappreciated segments within Asia, we have Jason from IFAS Malaysia, who will share his views on ASEAN equities today. Thank you for joining us. To start off, Jason, could you give us an overview of performances of ASEAN markets in 2021? Thanks, Cyrus. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 2021 was a pretty good year for ASEAN markets, in particular the major ASEAN markets like Thailand, Singapore and Indonesia all posted decent returns, with Thailand being the clear outperformer with a 12.9% return in 2021. On the other hand, the only market within our coverage in ASEAN, Malaysia, underperformed. After lagging its peers for most, most of the years, they ended the year with a negative 3.7% return. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Malaysian equities. Uh, Malaysian equities were one of the among the worst performers in the ASEAN space. So why do you think they perform so poorly? Sure. Malaysian equities, our benchmark for Malaysian equities is the KLCI index, also known as the Kuala Lumpur Composite Index. It was down 3.7% in 2021. The weak performance was more or less in line with the weaker earnings during the year as the economy and businesses were affected by the prolonged lockdowns imposed by the government in order to contain the COVID pandemic. Furthermore, there were several key events that happened during the year. For example, in August, we saw some political maneuvering which resulted in a change of prime minister. In addition, in October, there was the budget 2022 that was revealed which saw some announcements that affected investor sentiment. For example, the one-time Chukai Makmo tax, the prosperity tax on corporates that earned more than 100 million ringgit per year, and also the increase of stamp duty for share transactions. The political and policy uncertainty have affected investor sentiment and weight on markets in 2021. Thank you. With so much uncertainty in 2021, uh, do you think there will be a turnaround in 2022? Yes. So, going forward with the economy finally reopening after the prolonged lockdowns, we do expect corporate earnings to improve. At this juncture, we think that earnings revisions have bottomed and priced in most of the negatives, such as the aforementioned Chukai Makmo prosperity tax. After being downgraded throughout 2021, we have seen earnings stabilize since October, which coincided with the tapering or the improvement in the COVID situation in the country, which allowed the government to fully reopen the economy and remove all these lockdown measures. In fact, in November, we are seeing slight upgrades to 2021 and 2023 earnings, which reflects better optimism from consensus or the analysts. 
KLCI earnings are expected to grow by about 6.9% in 2022 and 8.3% in 2023, which may seem a bit sluggish, but if it is mainly dragged down by glove stocks, which are who are expected to see some normalization in the their earnings post pandemics because as you all know they did very well during the pandemic and they enjoyed super profits but going forward we do expect some normalization uh, as we see demand from demand for gloves start to come down and average selling prices start to normalize a bit so if we were to strip out glove stocks from the equation KLCI earnings growth are at much more palatable levels of 13.9% and 7.7% in 2022 and 2023, respectively. On another positive note, uh, we are also seeing broad-based positive earnings growth in 2022 across most sectors, except for the aforementioned glove sector. So earnings growth for KLCI index will be mainly driven by the biggest sector in the index, which is the financial sector. It has a weight of about 30.7%. The financial sector is expected to grow earnings by an impressive 10.8% in 2022 and another 7.7% in 2023. Amid a few key catalysts for growth, including higher net interest margins, as the central bank, Bank Negara Malaysia, finally starts to raise interest rates in 2022 and 2023 after cutting rates to a record low of 1.75% in 2020. And secondly, we also see that uh, non-performing loans will improve and on the other hand banks will also start to ease these loan loss provisions because as the economy recovers and reopens uh, this kind of ratio should improve post-pandemic. Another key driver for KLCI earnings growth is the consumer product and services sector which is also expected to grow strongly in 2022 because of mainly the reopening of the economy after the lockdowns were finally relaxed. So we foresee that pent up consumer demand will be unleashed as consumers will be finally able to spend in brick and mortar stores or dine in, whereas holiday makers can resort to domestic travel to satisfy their travel itch. Thank you. Following up on what you have said about earnings, uh, it seems that you think that earnings uh, the earnings forecast is optimistic, but might stabilize. So amidst this recovery, do you think there is enough upside for investors into Malaysian equities? Yes. So, okay, sorry. <clears throat> In terms of valuations, Malaysian equities do look attractive. The KLCI index is now trading at around 13.3 times forward PE based on 2023 estimated earnings. We believe that markets are pricing in some political uncertainty as the much-anticipated general elections could be held in 2022. If we look at historically, okay, in the past decade or so, it has only been this cheap six times. So for value investors, this could be a good entry level. And our fair PE for the market is 16 times, which represents a target price of about uh, 1815 for the KLCI index by end 2023. This equals to a decent 20% upside potential from the current level of about 1500. On top of that, the estimated dividend yield of more than 4% in the coming two years could also bulk up the total return for investors. So all in all, we have upgraded our star ratings for Malaysian equities to three stars attractive. Previously, we have been neutral for Malaysian equities for some time, but now we think that it is time for investors to reconsider the underappreciated Malaysian equities. So we like the attractive upside potential, the cheap valuations, and the attractive dividend yields. That's my view for Malaysia. Thank you. So it seems you are very optimistic on Malaysia. So moving on to another ASEAN country with a significantly better performance in 2021. So Indonesian equities were one of the top performers in ASEAN. Why do you think they perform so well? Yes. So for Indonesia, it has been one of our favorite markets since the start of 2021. Our benchmark for Indonesian equities, the Jakarta Composite Index, also known as JCI Index, is up 7.8% in 2021, which is more or less in line with the 
positive earnings revisions that we have seen throughout the year, the EPS for 2021 was upgraded by about 10%, which reflected the better optimism by analysts amidst a better than expected economy, stronger commodity prices, and robust external demand for their products. So for Indonesia, similar to Indonesia, uh, similar to Malaysia, sorry, Indonesian earnings have stabilized and improved throughout to, towards the end of the year as the COVID situation in the country improved. As you can see in the chart here, they have uh, since the second half of the year, okay, we have seen a drastic drop in the number of COVID new COVID cases in Indonesia as the vaccination rates in Indonesia pick up. So that that's my view for Indonesia. Thank you. So with stronger earnings as well as improving vaccination rates, looking forward to 2022, which, sec which key sectors do you think can drive the Indonesian market? Yes, so for Indonesia, we are seeing also very broad-based earnings growth across all sectors, which is a positive factor. So in terms of the main contributors to this earnings growth are cyclical sectors such as financials, materials, uh, which constitute a big portion, about 39% of the JCI index is financial sector and 12% of uh, the JCI index is the material sector. So these two sectors are the key contributors. Additionally, there are a few other sectors, namely the consumer discretionary, consumer staples and communication services sectors, who are also expected to continue to benefit from the strong consumption growth from the young rising middle class population in Indonesia. So index heavyweight financial sector is expected to grow earnings by about 22.3% in 2022 and another 10.1% in 2023 amidst improving uh, net interest margins amid a rising rate environment and also stabilizing non-performing loans. The growth in the financial sectors will be mainly driven by the, three, the top three banks in Indonesia, Bank Central Asia, Bank Rakyat Indonesia and Bank Mandiri. In addition, the material sector is expected to see strong earnings growth of 22.6% in both 2022 and 2023, benefiting from the higher commodity prices and robust demand for the commodities and also its downstream products. But all in all, what we like about Indonesia is, is, is its broad-based growth, not, across, not just across a few beneficiaries of the reopening, but across all sectors. Thank you. It's good to hear that you expect uh, broad-based growth in Indonesian equities. However, given the strong performance we have seen so far in 2021, do you think there is still upside for Indonesian equities or has the rally run out of steam? Fundamentals for Indonesian equities still, still look quite solid going forward with uh, the earnings for JCI expected to see double-digit growth. So in terms of Valuations, the JCI index is now trading at around 14 times PE based on forward 2023 estimated earnings, which is a few multiples below our in-house fair PE of 16 times. So there's still some upside. So based on our model, well, our target price for the JCI index is 7525, a decent 14% upside potential compared to the current level of around 6600. So as a conclusion, yes, we think there's still upside for the market and we continue to like Indonesia. Hence, we continue to rate Indonesia equities, three stars attractive. So that's my view for Indonesia. Thank you for your views on Indonesia. Finally, let's talk about Thailand. Thailand had a decent run in 2021, uh, despite the lackluster economy. Is this reflective of fundamentals or has the recent rally outrun fundamentals? Yeah, so Thai equities, they have performed well in 2021. As you can see here, the SET index is up 12.9%, uh, th uh, which is quite in line with the earnings upgrades that we have seen in 2021. In fact, earnings were upgraded by as much as 13.7% by the end of the year. This is supported by the strong exports, manufacturing, and also the robust external demand for their uh, commodity products especially. They also benefited from stronger commodity prices like oil-related oil, oil products. 
Uh, despite a difficult year for the tourism industry in Thailand, because as you all know, Thailand is a major tourism country, but thanks to the export sector, it has managed to hold up quite decently. In terms of uh, going forward, the fundamentals for Thai equities look pretty solid. In 2022 and 2023, they're expected to grow, uh, see positive growth. And these EPS forecasts have also been upgraded since the start of 2021, which also reflects the, posit the more positive optimism from the analysts. Uh, going forward, the SET index are expected to grow earnings by 11.7% time, 11 .7 in 2022 and another 12% in 2023. So quite solid. And the earnings growth in 2022, however, is quite diverging with certain sectors posting negative earnings growth and certain sectors doing better. But overall, 2023 is expected to be a better year for Thai corporate earnings as we are expected to see broad-based growth across all sectors. So in 2022, earnings for Thai equities will be mainly driven by a few key sectors, uh, as, mentioned, as mentioned here. So firstly, there will be the commerce sector, which is expected to see EPS growth of 38.9% in 2022 and 25.7% in 2023. Very strong growth. This is led by the major uh, commerce sector companies like CP or PCL, which is the 7-Eleven store operator in Thailand, and also Central Retail Corp PCL, which is the leading mall operator in Thailand. So the common sector is expected to boom or grow in line with the recovery in the domestic demand and also to a certain extent, the return of international tourists. Another sector that's expected to grow strongly will be the financial sector. They're expected to grow 9.3% in 2022 and another 13.7% in 2023 amid strong demand for credit and loans and the stabilization of NPLs and easing loan loss provisions as the economy starts to re-emerge from the pandemic. The F&B sector uh, is also expected to see strong earnings recovery after the pandemic hit last two years. Uh, they are expected to see EPS growth of 98.9% in 2022 and 25.8% in 2023, led by agro-industrial and food conglomerates, uh, CP Foods PCL, and also the hotel and F&B retail operator, uh, Minor International, who runs uh, brands such as uh, Coffee Club, uh, Swenson's and so on. Other than that, beverage makers such as Carabao Group and also Allsop Spa PCL, they are also expected to benefit from the consumption recovery in the domestic and also their overseas markets. Thank you for the in-depth discussion on uh, Thai earnings. Based on the overall positive outlook for Thai earnings, do you think it is time then for investors to revisit Thai equities in 2022? Yeah, so as mentioned just now, Thailand had a strong run-up in 2021, but we think that it has priced in a lot of the positivity already. In terms of valuation, it's looking unattractive as the SET index is currently trading at around 14.9 times forward 2023 earnings, not too far away from our fair PE for the market of 15 times. Based on our fair PE of 15 times, we estimate the end 2023 target price of 16.05, which is only 1% above its current level which means that markets have probably fully valued uh, the positivity and has little upside potential. As such, we maintain uh, Thailand's rating at 2.5 stars neutral. And in fact, we think that uh, investors can probably opt not to revisit Thai equities at this juncture, but instead can allocate their investments to other ASEAN markets that have higher potential upside such as Malaysia and Indonesia that I mentioned just now. That's my view for Thailand. Thank you for walking us through the different countries within the ASEAN market. To end off, could you please share with us some of your final thoughts on the ASEAN market? Sure. Investors usually have little to no exposure in ASEAN equities in their portfolio because ASEAN equities are typically not in the radar of a lot of Asian equity funds. But Going forward, I think investors should consider adding supplementary positions to capture the growth opportunity 
in ASEAN, especially in the few markets that I mentioned just now. In addition, ASEAN markets do provide additional diversification benefits for investors' portfolios due to their lower correlation to global equities. Thanks, everyone. I hope our viewers have some key takeaways from today's session. Thank you, Jason, for joining us today and sharing your views on ASEAN equities. Let's now move back to the MC. Thank you, Jason. North Asian markets surged sharply in the first two months of 2021, but soon experienced a fallback due to the rapid uptrend and the high valuations. If you're wondering whether such a volatile environment is going to repeat in 2022 and what strategies would work for the North Asian region, stay tuned for this presentation as we welcome back Will Shum, Director, Portfolio Management and Research from iFast Hong Kong and Cyrus Ng to share more. North Asian equities generally underperformed the broader Asian region in 2021. Should you consider buying them in 2022? We now have Will from IFAS Hong Kong to take us through North Asian equities. Thank you, Will, for joining us today. Let's, you, start, off, let's start off with Korean equities. Korean stock market was one of the best performing markets in the first half of 2021, but then it underwent a correction and became one of the worst performing markets in Asia, excluding China. It also underperformed Taiwan, another cyclical market. What do you think is the reason behind this poor second half performance? Yes, true. Um, the underperformance of the Korean market uh, mainly happened since uh, the second half of uh, last year. Uh, it actually peaked out in uh, July and then uh, underwent a correction. So overall, KOSB, uh gained 3.6% uh, uh, in uh, 2021, uh, even beaten by, uh, actually underperformed uh, by uh, Asia's uh, uh, CSI 300 index being one of the worst performing Asian markets if we exclude Malaysia, uh, Hong Kong, and China. Here, China, I mean uh, uh, China H shares. So in general, uh, we see some uh, positivities uh, inside the market, like uh, the two internet giants, uh, Kakao and Nipers, uh, two automakers, Hyundai and Kia, and also uh, Samsung SDI being the uh, key drivers for Kospi uh, to keep positive returns for 2021. However, the performance of uh, Samsung Electronics, uh, LG Chem uh, uh, was disappointing, hindering the major market. But the disappointing performance last year um, uh, actually got nothing to do with the fundamentals, uh, like the corporate earnings are not, uh, should not be the one to be playing. Uh, they actually not quite strong. Uh, here is the table, uh, which shows you the, um, uh, the, the estimated earnings growth last year. Actually, you, you can see that the estimated earnings growth last year is close to 100% and six out of the top 10 constituents were expected uh, to record a three-digit uh, growth. Even Samsung Electronics uh, with the slower pace um, uh, among the top 10 uh, was also expected uh, to record more than 50% uh, worldwide growth. So given such earn strong earnings growth, uh, the Korean market performance so disappointed, mainly attributed to a few factors, uh, supply chain problem, shortage in chips, uh, which have resulted in a weaker than expected financial uh, uh, performance. And then uh, companies started to lower their uh, earnings forecast and also cut their earnings guidance. Um, then analysts start to downgrade their uh, earnings forecast. And then uh, we also see some uh, negative policy towards the internet sectors like the South Korean government uh, actually took aim at those uh, big internet firms on the antitrust issue just like what the Chinese government did uh, and then uh, we start to see some uh, big tech giants uh, to uh, hesitate on expanding their business uh, like Kakao uh, set up uh, additional funds to support those uh, SMEs and also uh, uh, workers and also withdraw some of their aggressive plans uh, uh, on the business expansion and um, the most important 
point I believe is that uh, in 2020, uh, the market performance actually quite strong, while on uh, at the same time, we see the corporate earnings, I mean, the earnings growth just uh, very close to zero. Um, so uh, I think for uh, 2021 as the year to uh, digest the, uh, the strong performance. Um, so yeah, that's the uh, key reason to explain the performance for the career market. Okay, thank you. Uh, looking ahead in 20 to 2022, do you expect the fundamentals of Korean stocks to improve? And will these fundamentals be strong enough to support strong market performance next year? And what do you think overall are the drivers for 2022 earnings? Yes, um, according to the Bloomberg consensus numbers, uh, Cosby is expected to uh, re uh, turn as strong positive earnings growth last year to negative this year. And six out of the uh, 10 sectors will record uh, negative growth in uh, 2022. Uh, the communication service sectors, including the two large uh, internet giant Kakao and Liber, is expected to have more than 50% YOY decline in earnings. Uh, in fact, the estimated earnings weakness for uh, this year is not um, because analysts too pessimistic over the market outlook uh, either on the corporate side or the economic side but of course yet yeah, they do have some concern like the uh, 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 persistent issues like uh, the supply chain problem but given such negative uh, growth forecast we're talking about 50% YOY decline uh, for the whole sector. Uh, it's not just about the pessimistic uh, uh, issues. Uh, some other issues also hinder the growth. Um, and uh, the key reasons is that some constituents uh, of the Cosby record huge non-recurring income last year, pushing up the earnings base and leading to a lower earnings growth. So we uh, exclude some one of factors and recalculate uh, the earnings growth for uh, 2022. Uh, the Korean market is expected to grow by 8.6% uh, for um, uh, uh, this, e uh, 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 this year. Um, among them, the uh, telecommunication service sectors, consumer discretionary, uh, healthcare, industrial sectors, uh, may see more rapid earnings growth. Uh, the adjusted Earnings growth can, uh, I believe, can better reflect uh, the reality, the real situation, like the two internet uh, giants in the telecommunication service sectors uh, will continue to benefit uh, from the uh, rapid growth of the new economy business, such as um, their uh, digital advertising, uh, e-commerce, uh, uh, cloud, and also fintech, and then uh, those uh, leading automakers in the consumer discretionary uh, space are expected to uh, um, uh, stimulus the sales uh, this year due to the launch of some of their uh, EV series and then uh, for LG Chem which is the battery stocks will continue to benefit from uh, rapid development of the EVs so in particular a a Apple has actually announced to work on the uh, EV project and it is said that the LG group uh, joint venture is highly likely to be included in in uh, Apple's supply chain. So uh, you can imagine that uh, LG display, LG Cam, LG Energy Solution, and also um, uh, LG Innovation, uh, which all under LG Group will jump into the uh, uh, Apple supplier list. So which is believed to uh, largely boost um, the whole uh, material sectors uh, uh, in terms of the earnings or even in the future, the, the share price performance. So these are the examples that shows um, despite the earnings figures provided by uh, Bloomberg or, or the market consensus, you may still find uh, many exciting investment opportunities in the market ahead. Thank you. One theme that you mentioned in 2021 was the supply chain issues around the world. And the semiconductor sector is a key sector of the Korean market. But its recent share price performance has been dragged by factors like the supply chain issues and chip shortages. So do you think these issues really matter? And how will the semiconductor sector perform in terms of earning next year? Yes. Um, market concern about um, the supply chain issues will affect the shipments and uh, cost 
uh, of the past and components and then the rise in the uh, infantry levels will cause memory price to fall and also the uh, consequence is that the decline price will further squeeze uh, uh, the, the profits. So analysts have lower their uh, earnings forecast for the uh, top two uh, semiconductor players in the Korean market, which is uh, Samsung Electronics and also SK Hynix. Some analysts even said that uh, winter is coming uh, for the memory space. So you can feel that the pessimistic expectation actually led to the poor performance uh, a share price performance of the t uh, uh, top two largest semiconductor constituents. And the main reasons of this downgrade are based on the fact that the DRAM uh, spot price have uh, plunged by uh, more than uh, 30% uh, since the end of June last year. Uh, some analysts uh, even believe that uh, the demand has been very sluggish in certain space like a uh, personal computer and also coupled with the rising infantry level, especially in the server memory and also sub over surprise uh, 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 situations seen in the graphic memory. Uh, so the memory price uh, may further drop in the uh, uh, fourth quarter last year. So, uh, but we believe that thanks to the technology development, uh, such as AI, uh, data centers, 5G application, and a uh, more hot topic recently, which is the metaverse, uh, memory will be applied uh, even more extensively. So uh, Micron uh, um, already predicted that the demand for the DRAM will increase by uh, 10 to uh, 20%, and also MAND will increase by 30% in its latest earnings uh, guidance. Uh, the big three uh, major memory makers already expect that, uh, expect that the supply chain issues uh, problems can be resolved uh, uh, in uh, by uh, mid of next, uh, this year. So the main reasons uh, for a decline in PC, PC shipments uh, uh, last year is uh, the shortage of the norm memory components. So it is expected uh, the memory cells in this uh, area will rebound. Uh, so I think that uh, the earnings prospect of Samsung and also SK Highlights are uh, expected to remain solid. Thank you. To summarize Korean equities, uh, are the current valuations of Korean equities still attractive? And what's your target price for the cost in 2022 and 2023? Yeah, a cost B valuation has uh, uh, fallen uh, uh, from uh, about uh, 15 times uh, at the beginning uh, of uh, uh, this year uh, to the current, um, uh, sorry, last year uh, to the current uh, 10.6 times. So even during um, the pandemic period in uh, 2020, uh, the valuation was as low as uh, like on two times, showing that the market uh, not only ignore um, the robust earnings of last year, but also uh, uh, too concerned about the earnings prospect uh, for this year due to uh, different issues we just talked about. And of course, uh, one of the key factors we make um, the consensus number doesn't look quite positive is because uh, those one-off gains last uh, year. But we, we're trying to exclude those one-off factors. Uh, the Korean stock market is expected to grow its earnings by um, yeah uh, around eight uh, uh, percent this, uh, this year based on our calculation, which is not uh, very strong. But of course, it is also not uh, as bad as many uh, investors uh, may think. Uh, so most important is that uh, the performance last uh, year uh, basically ignored the strong comeback in earnings uh, um, in 2021, and market too concerned about the supply chain issues. So when the supply problems uh, can be uh, resolved and also uh, uh, reference concerns can be relieved, uh, so the market will recognize uh, the, the improving fundamentals uh, in uh, this and also next year, then I believe that the valuation for the Korean stocks will be referred back to the historical mean. So based on um, the fair PE of 12 times, our target price for the cost B will be uh, 3,650 points by end of 2023, with the potential uh, upside of more than 20%. Thank you for your insights on Korean equities. Moving on to Japanese stocks, what are your views on the fundamentals of Japanese stocks next year? 
Yeah, for Japan, uh, it is uh, actually even more volatile than the Korean market last year. But um, you know, uh, basically uh, in twenty twenty one, the returns for Japan market is very similar, very close to the Korean market. So both of them actually didn't really perform well. Uh, actually underperform um, uh, uh, most of the uh, Asian single countries. Only uh, outperform uh, Hong Kong, China, and also Malaysia. But uh, for for Japan, uh, don't want to spend too much time to describe our market performance. But back to, uh, to the questions uh, about uh, yeah, the, we 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 saw strong uh, earnings come back um, uh, last year because um, the. Uh, uh, 2021 fiscal year earnings growth is estimated to be uh, close to 20%. We also see uh, analysts keep uh, revising upward the earnings uh, estimates. So in terms of the sectors, uh, apart from um, the decline seen in the temporary communication service and also utility sectors, the rest of the sectors uh, expect to record positive growth. So uh, in particular, consumer uh, discretionary uh, finance and also uh, uh, industrial uh, have stronger growth uh, last year, the, co- the recovery will be continued in this and also next year. Uh, but you can see that the pace will be slower. Now, market expected growth will be at uh, 7.2% and also uh, uh, 4.6% uh, in this and next year. The numbers are far from strong, of course, uh, in particular those sectors which uh, have made large contribution to the overall market earnings uh, last year was no. Uh, for example, financials and also industrials. The two sectors earnings growth uh, will, will grow at a 4.3% and also a 3.8%. A type of communication sectors will continue to drag as uh, people think that uh, SoftBank will suffer from uh, the decreasing number of IPOs and also um, uh, of its underlying holdings uh, in its vision fund and also the uh, SF valuation, especially those uh, uh, Chinese holdings will drop um, uh, due to the uh, uh, the market corrections uh, and also as, as affected by the China regulatory uh, crackdown. So it is the main reason for the telecommunication service sectors to be expected to record negative growth in this and also the next year. Thank you. Drilling into earnings for the index, which sectors or constituents of the index do you think can drive, drive the index performance in the, ne- in the coming years? And do you have any key points to note when, for any investors into Japanese equities? Yeah, uh, despite the slow overall uh, market earnings growth, we find that there's still some uh, sectors to continue to perform well, uh, at least better than the overall uh, growth uh, factors like the consumer discretionary uh, sectors. We find that top constituents in the K225 index, uh, fast retailing uh, will grow over uh, 12% uh, uh, next year. Sony is also expected to record a double-digit growth. The overall auto uh, maker sectors uh, uh, also expected to deliver uh, 18% growth uh, this year. Another sector that uh, contributes to the overall uh, earnings is the uh, IT sector. The two largest constituents in the sectors, which are the semiconductor stores, are both expected to deliver uh, double-digit growth. So in the top 10, six of the uh, top 10 stocks uh, can record a double-digit growth, uh, three can uh, only provide single digit, while one, which is soft band, will be negative. But if we exclude soft band, the top nine can actually achieve uh, 8.9% growth uh, uh, next uh, fiscal year, which is close to the overall market growth. One point I think, uh, I believe that investors should uh, uh, take note is that the currency appreciation, uh, given that the Fed uh, or the major central bank uh, in the different world uh, is considering uh, to quitting their uh, um, uh, loosening monetary policy while the BOJ uh, emphasized first several times that 
they have no plan to create any quantitative easing plans or asset purchase program. You can uh, imagine that the yield spread will be widened between the different world uh, as compared to Japan. As a result, we believe that the yen will uh, likely to under pressure or to depreciate, uh, to pre uh, depreciate uh, this year. Uh, as a result, we believe that investor can choose uh, the, um, the USD hedge class uh, or the hedge class uh, for the Japanese equity fund to hedge against the potential um, uh, currency appreciation risk. Thank you for your insights on Japanese earnings as well as the Japanese yen. Moving on to valuation, do you think Japanese stocks are still cheap compared with other developed markets? And how much upside do you expect for the market over the next two years? Yeah, in terms of the valuation, the low of um, last year was at uh, 17 times, um, while the uh, latest uh, numbers is around 17.5 times, which is still uh, below its uh, fair PD of 18 times, uh, one of the few uh, different markets which is still trading at discount in terms of the valuation. So I think in terms of the uh, valuation, Japanese market is definitely still attractive uh, uh, if you look at the different markets perspective. And in terms of the earnings, the growth over the next two years are uh, not very strong, uh, mainly dragged by the soft bank. But if, um, yeah, one point can take note is if, if Chinese test stocks can rebound and um, there will just uh, one a large IPO or few large IPOs for fishing funds holdings, then maybe there will be some uh, uh, revisions uh, towards the soft bank earnings. Uh, but of course, soft bank still uh, one of the uh, risks that we should take note in the Japan's market. But overall, based on the 18 times fair PD, we calculated that Nikkei 225 uh, target price by end of uh, 2023 will be 34,000 points, which implies um, around 20% potential upside. Thank you, Will, for your in-depth analysis on North Asian equities. We will now hand everyone back to the MC. Thank you, Will and Cyrus. The Indian equity market has generally not been the focus of many retail investors. However, investors should not ignore the fact that the Indian equity market has been performing very strongly relative to many Asian and global markets for the past two to three decades. Given India's strong growth and development potential in the coming decade, investors should definitely put India in their radar screen. Here to tell us more about the opportunity is Kenny Jen, Investment Director from IFA Singapore. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Kenny Jen, and I'm the Investment Director at uh, IFAS Fund Management. My topic for today is why India deserves to be on your investment radar. I'm not sure how many of you have uh, invested in Indian equities or Indian mutual fund before or currently have any exposure in Indian funds or Indian stocks. My guess is that not many of you uh, have uh, Indian equities and I would also guess that many of you are much more familiar with China or the ASEAN market as compared to India. I have to uh, say upfront here that my purpose today is not to hard sell India to all of you or that the Indian market is so attractive now that you should immediately start to invest in it. The purpose of today's presentation is to share with you some of the key facts of the Indian market that you may not know so that when you decide to invest in India, you can make a more informed investment when you think the time and the valuation is right. I will basically divide today's presentation to three main parts. Firstly, I will give you some perspective why the Indian equity market has performed so well last year into 2021. Secondly, I will also share with you what are the key challenges that are faced by the Indian market this year. And last but not least, I will highlight the case why India will be an important market in the Asian region and why you should keep a close watch at it on your investment radar. Let me first show you how the Indian stock market has performed last year. 
So how well or how badly the Indian stock market has performed in 2021? As you can see from the chart here, uh, and this is uh, unfortunately dated only 10 December when I prepared the slides, the India stock market has returned more than 20% last year. And this performance has only lagged behind the US and the Taiwan market. It has significantly outperformed almost all the other Asian markets. So you may ask why India has performed so well in 2021. This chart shows you the six key reasons. Ample liquidity, supportive monetary policy, better than expected macro recovery, positive earnings momentum and surprises, a sharp decline in COVID cases, and a rising retail participation rate in the stock market like what you have seen, also seen in the US. I will go into more details in the following slide. India, like many central banks globally, has cut interest rate aggressively during the COVID pandemic to support the economy. As you can see from the chart here, the repo rate, which is what we call the repurchase rate, is also equivalent to the Fed fund rates uh, in the US, has fallen to a 20-year low of 4%. The pre-pandemic repo rate in India is usually hovering around 5 to 6%. The cut in interest rate has released quite a bit of liquidity into the market, and some of this liquidity has found its way into the market and fueled the stock market rally in 2021. On the economic front, India's macroeconomic outlook has also improved vastly. After hitting a rock bottom of negative 7% in 2020, and this has been the worst for many, many years, GDP growth has rebounded sharply to 9% this year, I mean last year in 2021, and is forecasted to stay above 8% in 2022, that's this year. Although there will be some expectation of moderation to around uh, 6% in 2023, it is still a very strong growth. India's current account balance is also in a much better shape today as compared to a few years back. Its current account balance as a percentage of GDP has improved from a low of negative 5% in 2013 to a positive balance of 0.9% in 2021. Foreign exchange reserve has also surged from around 300 billion a few years back to almost doubled right now, 600 billion currently. When you look at every stock market in the, in the world, earnings momentum is a critical factor that will uh, dictate the performance of many stock markets. As you can see from the chart here, India's EPS, which is earnings per share, has almost doubled after hitting a trough in mid-2020. This sharp rise in EPS has been the key catalyst for the strong performance of the Indian stock market last year. Investors' confidence has also received a big boost as COVID cases saw a sharp decline from a daily peak of almost 400,000 cases a day to maybe only a few hundred or a few thousand cases currently. Although the Omicron variant is uh, ringing alarm bells again, but indications so far has been that uh, Omicron causes less severe cases. So this can be treated as a consolation, but we must nonetheless monitor the development closely. Last but not least, more people were under lockdown during the pandemic and work from home became like a, a norm. And we have seen as a result of this more participation in the retail space in the Indian stock market. Retail participation through mutual funds or online trading platform has increased from 30 to 40% during the pre pandemic period to a recent high of as much as 70%. Although we may see this percentage fall as the market corrects, we are likely to see the retail participation rate hovering in the 50 to 60% level. So after the strong performance of the Indian equity last year, the general consensus in the market right now is that Indian equities are not likely to perform as well in 2022. So far this year, it has actually done reasonably well. Uh, it has actually uh, still in positive territory. But in other words, what many investors believe is that India is likely to underperform, underperform the other regional market. 
So what are the key challenges for the Indian equities in 2022? If you look at the chart here, uh, this are the few uh, key challenges. Firstly, India's valuation is trading at the high end of the valuation range relative to its history and also relative to the rest of the region. Secondly, other regional markets such as China or Hong Kong, which has underperformed significantly last year, may attract more money flows. The potential size of US tapering and the magnitude and pace of interest rate rises will also be a wild card in 2022. Rising energy costs and supply chain constraints may lead to inflationary pressure picking up rapidly, and this will have a negative impact to market sentiment. Last but not least, the Omicron spread and severity has to be monitored very carefully, as to me, this is a wild card that can be real economic momentum. You can see from a chart here, uh, this chart, what I'm trying to illustrate to you uh, is the valuation of the Indian market. It basically shows that Indian market's valuation for the past 10 years. And you can tell that despite uh, a bit of correction in the month of December, the India's market valuation is still not cheap relative to its 10-year history. India's current market P is around 80, 28 times versus an average 10-year price of to earnings ratio of around 22 and a half times. The price to earnings peak at around 39 times in mid-2020. If you look at the valuation of the India market relative to the region, I just want to show it through this slide. It is also trading at a premium. Uh, the average premium over the past 10 years is around 58%. So India has actually been trading at a premium consistently over the past decade versus the other market. The current premium is around 71%. So this is actually higher than the 10-year average. Although we have seen it corrected from the recent peak premium of around 100%, there's still a real risk of rotation of money out into other Asian markets such as China this year. Another indicator uh, to monitor very closely in India, and this is a very important indicator, is how the inflation trend will pan out this year and the subsequent year. Currently, inflation in India is still within the central bank's comfort zone of 4 to 6%. However, with rising energy costs and supply chain constraints globally, inflationary pressure is likely to tick up in the coming year. And this will see interest rate in India picking up, which will impact liquidity negatively. India is actually quite dependent on crude oil import. Oil import amounted to close to 30% of its total import bill. So a sustained high crude oil prices uh, will definitely be inflationary and hence uh, will not be a good news for the stock market performance. So if 2022 is expected to be a challenging year for Indian equities, you may ask, why bother? As I have already mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, my purpose here today is not try to ask you to rush to invest in Indian equities right away. The purpose is to share with you some of the facts to, so that you can make an informed judgment in the event that you wish to invest in India. From an investment perspective, this chart highlights some of the argument why you should put India in your investment radar. Firstly, Indian equity market has pre produced superior long-term performance. Secondly, India equity market has relatively low correlation with US equity market, providing diversification benefit. Thirdly, India's economic prospect is looking very promising, and like China, is evolving into a strong Asian economic giant. Lastly, there are positive secular trends developing in India's capital market, such as rising retail and institutional participation. And also, we have been seeing increasing IPO activities in recent years. When I show you in my earlier slide how well Indian equities have done in 2021, you may wonder, is this just a one-off anomaly? Let me now show you a 30-year performance chart. Uh, the chart may look a bit small, but let me summarize some of the numbers. You can actually see from a chart here, which is starting from the end 
of uh, January 1993 till the middle of December last year. Indian equities have a total return of 1,117%, which translates to an annualized return of 9%. This is superior to many other markets, except the US market, which has an annualized return of around 10.5% over the same period. I'm not suggesting or predicting that we can expect the same level of long-term returns, but we just simply cannot ignore the fact that Indian equities have been a good long-term investment. And another interesting to note about Indian equities is that it can experience large drawdown at times, such as the GFC, especially during crisis time. And it turned out always that investing into Indian equities when there's such a large correction to be the most rewarding. From a portfolio diversification uh, or allocation perspective, India also provides a good diversification benefit. When you, when you are investing in the US market, for example, you can see that the Indian equity actually have a very low correlation with some of the developed market equities such as the US equities. So this definitely will help to kind of like offset some of the positive correlation that you get from investing in the same market. On the economic front, we also believe India is another Asian economic powerhouse in the making. Uh, just to show you some perspective, both China and India has very similar nominal GDP in 1990. That's around 300 plus billion. However, in 2020, China GDP has ballooned or soared to US 14.72 trillion, 5.5 times larger than India. And you know that China and India has about the same uh, number of people in the population. So we believe that this gap will narrow in the next decade as India economic growth accelerates, averaging 6 or 7% over the next few years, and China moderating uh, in its economic growth. And also with rising personal consumption, private KPEC cycle, and infrastructure spending, this will continue to fuel the economic expansion in India. The COVID-19 pandemic and China-US trade war has also provided India a great opportunity to capitalize on the shift within the global manufacturing and supply chain. India has the benefit of a very large domestic population and domestic demand potential is therefore there. And, and that's why it attracts a lot of uh, foreign companies into India. And it also has a very large working age population. Global manufacturing firms has been setting up manufacturing facilities in India. For example, uh, as this uh, uh, chart shows you, Foxconn Technology, I, I think some of you may know what is Foxconn Technology. They are a Taiwanese company. They are the largest iPhone assembler. They have already set up numerous manufacturing facilities in India and is planning to expand more. The other example is Samsung, also one of the largest electronic maker in the world. It has inaugurated the world largest mobile factory in India. And Samsung has also launched its Make for the World initiative in its India plan, whereby it aims to export mobile handset produced in India to overseas market. I mentioned earlier that there are also several positive secular trends developing in the India's capital market. Firstly, the COVID pandemic has fueled a sharp increase in retail participation in the stock market over the past 12 to 18 months. Retail investor share has grown from 33% in 2016 to about 45-50% last year. This was largely a result of a lot of the support of technology via easy-to-use online investment apps and the popularity of social media apps such as Twitter, Reddit and Telegram. The penetration of internet to the remotest corners of the nation has also opened up a wide world opportunity and a whole new world of online access for the Indian population. This also meant improved accessibility to investment, education, market news, and growing awareness of the various forms of investment. 
Secondly, financial investment such as equities and mutual fund accounts for just a very small uh, portion of the household financial assets, about 10% currently. With growing wealth and improving education, there's ample room for retail participation to grow. And lastly, IPO activities were very buoyant in 2021, amounting to more than US dollar 16 billion. This is likely to continue over the next few years with companies in the traditional sector such as automobile, insurance, and the new age technology such as education technology, e-commerce. Numerous companies in these few sectors are already lining up for IPO in the next one to two years. Now, perhaps I want to share you a quote with a, a veteran emerging market investment guru, Mark Movius. He recently said in a Bloomberg interview on India, and I quote, India is on a 50-year rally. Even there are short bouts of bear market. India is maybe where China used to be 10 years ago. So you may ask, how can a foreign retail investors gain access to the Indian equity markets? Unfortunately, due to Indian's regulation, foreign retail investors are currently unable to invest directly in domestic Indian equities listed in the Indian stock exchanges. However, one can still gain access to India via managed fund, which is your mutual funds, the exchange traded funds, uh, which is listed in a lot of the exchanges. Uh, selected Indian companies are also listed in, as ADR in the US exchange, but currently there's only 13 of them. So for more details, uh, you can refer to the FSM1 website. And with this, I have come to the end of my presentation, and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Kenny. We now turn our attention to the West and explore the West side story of growth. Europe and US equities has run up significantly in 2021 and valuations are at record highs. In this session, Chin from The Smart Investor is joined by Colleen Lowe, an Assistant Manager, Macro Research at IFA Singapore, and Cyrus Ng, Analyst, Macro Research at IFA Singapore, to take a look at whether you should continue investing into these equity regions and discuss areas and sectors in light of the impending global recovery. U.S. and European equities saw solid performances in 2021, especially compared to their global counterparts. Today, we'll be taking a deeper dive into both equities with Colin from IFAS Macro Research Team and Chin from The Smart Investor. Thank you for joining us today. Starting off with U.S. equities. They performed very well in 2021 with the S&P 500 recording gains of over 30%. Uh, perhaps Chin could start. Could you explain what to the audience what drove equities in 2021? Sure. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I, I think that uh, where I like to focus on is the S&P 500 because it's an index which consists of roughly around 500 companies. And these 500 companies make up, uh, in terms of market cap, around 80% of the total market cap for the US stock market. So it's a significant and broad indicator of how stocks are performing. Now, when you look at the S&P 500 in 2021, it's the third year where they've actually recorded a double-digit return. And that's interesting, but for 2021, what is even more interesting is that all 11 industries which make up the S&P 500 have all recorded double-digit returns, which means that this is a very broad-based gain for the index itself. Uh, in fact, 8 out of 11 of those industries recorded 20% or more gains in, in terms of um, their individual industries, with the three biggest uh, or best performers being energy, real estate, and IT. And of these three, I think IT deserves special mention because in terms of weightage, it makes up roughly 29% of the S&P 500. So it's a significant contributor for the S&P 500 compared to the energy and real estate, which only makes up 5.5% in terms of weightage. So if you want to boil it down to one major factor, I would say it's IT uh, and big tech in particular. Colin, do you agree that IT and big tech drove U.S. equities in 2021? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think what Chin said was uh, right spot on. So if you look at the S&P 500, which returned about 29% uh, uh, for last year, and you can look at the performance, index performance for, for S&P 500 IT uh, index itself, they returned about 35% in their local currency terms. And of that, the, the composition or what drove the 29% of the uh, total return for S&P 500, a good 9% comes from IT. So you can see that the, the strength and the size of IT and the importance it plays. And really a, a big factor that contributes to why on, and how IT drove such performance is the earnings power of the, the sector itself. So if we look at the past uh, few quarters, we see very strong earnings beat coming from the tech sector. And a lot of companies have, uh, it, the, both the magnitude as well as the number of companies beating uh, earning estimates have been increasing over the past couple of quarters within that sector itself. So tech sector is definitely one uh, key, key driver of the S&P 500. And the second uh, driver of S&P 500, I would say, is the financials uh, uh, index itself. If you look at the financial index itself, it drove about 4% out of the 29% uh, gains in, in S&P 500 in, the year, in, in last year's uh, year-to-date performance. And within financial itself, you see that it, it, on aggregate, it holds about 11% of the S&P 500, but uh, it contributes about 25% to its uh, earnings in, in aggre on aggregate. And with such a huge, uh, com huge uh, uh, driver of earnings, being from financials, if you look at the uh, different uh, uh, banks and what how the banks have performed over the past couple of quarters, we see stellar earnings results for from uh, coming from these banks, and all these uh, positive and uh, earnings results have actually generated a lot of positive price reaction within the financials uh, company, and therefore driving the S&P 500 as well. And uh, aside from the sectoral perspective, if you look at a from a style perspective. You also find that in the first half of the year, the S&P 500's performance is largely driven by the single sectors such as your energy as well as your financials and, and uh, your materials and industrial as well. And on the second half of the year, we see some rotation uh, towards the growth sector, so sectors such as your IT as well as your comms, uh, discretion, uh, comms services and consumer discretionary, the big uh, tech companies. And we see that style rotation are also answerable for, for how and why SBA 500 performed uh, in that particular way over uh, in, in 2021. Thank you. Following on your comments on big tech, valuations for the S&P 500 have risen significantly, especially in that sector, and are currently at record highs. So our question is for Chin first. What are your thoughts regarding uh, valuations, and do you think they present a risk, uh, or can they rise further? Sure. So for me, valuation is a risk, but uh, it may not be the biggest risk uh, in terms, if you come look at it from the point of view of an investor. For me, what is better to do when you're confronted with a scenario where you feel that valuations are high is to put aside val the question of valuation first, put aside share prices, and look at the, share, the businesses which you want to own for the next decade. And I think that's really more important uh, area to focus on because business risk is not something you can manage easily. Valuation can be managed by portfolio management. But business risk is based on your choice of the company. And to me, that's a way more important a piece of your investing process, which you need to focus on with, by choosing a group of companies which you're comfortable to hold, you can then look at the valuation of those particular companies. You will have a list of companies to look at and uh, be able to focus much better regardless of whether valuations are high or low. Now, I will make one comment about the NASDAQ, where uh, it's down uh, close to 8% from its high today. But uh, 4 out of 10 of the NASDAQ stocks actually down by 50% or more. So if you're worried about valuation, there's a group of stocks which just got cheaper. Thank you for your comments. Colin, do you agree on his uh, views on valuations? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think valuation itself, uh, to some extent, presents a kind of risk. But uh, what the, the, the risk that I am looking at is the underlying catalyst that should or will be driving a possible valuation contraction. So where we are seeing valuation right now for the US, uh, for S&P 500 in particular, with the, uh, with the current level of valuation, I think it lends a certain risk to a uh, valuation contraction or valuation uh, or a drawdown. So what uh, we think will drive this valuation com uh, contraction 
are two things. Firstly, a disappointment in earnings, and secondly, in the expectation of that the Federal Reserve will turn more hawkish than what market expects. So for the, the first factor is the one that we are actually more focused on, we are more uh, vigilant on. And because uh, if you look at earnings uh, and how analysts are, are looking at uh, earning estimates right now, we see a lot of optimism on, on, on their end and a lot of expectation that uh, that uh, earnings should, uh, will continue to remain high for the next couple of quarters. But really beneath the hood, we are looking at uh, some, some faults are starting to occur. So for example, if you look at uh, cost metrics for, for the S&P 500, look at uh, the, the, uh, some of these important cost metrics, you'll find that in fact, material costs as well as wages have been rising. And with, uh, with, uh, with that as our base case, we do expect some uh, form of profit compression, especially in the second half of the year. And that, uh, if that results in uh, earnings disappointment, we might see a, some valuation contraction, therefore uh, some drawdown in the US, uh, the US market. Thank you, for Colin, for your comments on valuations. Uh, back to Chin. Uh, one thing you mentioned that is that for companies, we need to look not just at valuations, but at the individual companies itself. Uh, part of, uh, the big tech forms a big part of the S&P 500 index. How do you think big tech will perform in 2022? Mm -hmm. And do you have any preferred picks in the sector? Wow. Okay. <laughs> so um, full disclosure, I've owned uh, all the shares in FANG. Uh, before they were even called FANG. So my lo longest holding is actually Netflix from uh, January 2007. So that was 15 years ago. And I can tell you, uh, having lived through this entire 15 years, uh, I've not, I, I don't remember many moments where FANG was ever called cheap, right? So uh, there's this interview from 2012 by Mark Andreessen, who's from the Venture Catalyst from uh, Andreessen Horowitz. And this interview on Wired uh, said two very interesting things, right? Number one, he said that there is no tech bubble. Now, remember, this is 2012, right? And back in 2012, people were already talking about a tech bubble back then. And if you Google every single year after that, you'll find that the, the, the tech target price bubble appears all the time. And I, I think everyone knows that if you had invested in FANG stocks any time in the last decade, you would you had done pretty well. If you missed out on that, you would have missed out on s substantial gains. So what, why do people keep on calling it a tech bubble? I think that the one factor, and this is the second part of the interview, is that people have con con consistently underestimated the size of the market possible to, to grow. There has never been a time where there's a smartphone in the pockets of 5 billion people. There are 5 billion people connected to the internet before. This is a scale which has never existed before and I think is severely underestimated till today. Now, today, of course, there's uh, close to 5 billion people connected to the internet, but I, we just got here, right? I think the opportunities for internet scale businesses are substantial to build multiple trillion dollar businesses in the future. Thank you for your views, especially on internet companies. Uh, moving back to Colin, uh, do you see any key derating risks for investors to look out for in 2022? Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, I think the number one derating risk that we are uh, keeping an eye on is of course uh, potential earnings disappointment. And that trigger for earnings disappointment will come uh, in the form of higher costs for the US companies. And if you look at the recent data out there, the NABE, the National Association of Business Economics data, you will find that um, more and more companies, in fact, an increasing share of companies are reporting higher material costs as well as higher wages. And with the current level of debt survey, it is also approaching what we are, what, what, uh, it's also approaching the historical peak level, which is seen from around third Q or fourth Q of 2018. And that is a time where we see we saw costs uh, skyrocketing for many of these uh, U.S. companies. So soft data is also is already pointing to the fact that uh, higher costs is a possible reality. And when you look at the index level data, look at the COGS uh, level data, uh, data, as well as the OPEX expenses of many of these companies, we are seeing that both uh, index uh, both. Uh, both uh, metrics are in fact rising and in fact have uh, bottomed out and turned higher over the past couple of months. So if you combine the soft data as well as index level data, 
we have quite a conclusive evidence that okay, cost is indeed rising. But is it time to actually worry now? We think no, because earnings are still coming in hot, and the and what's driving earnings is the if you look at at it, the under, underlying uh, economic fundamentals, the the corporate fundamentals are still strong. So we do believe that uh, profitability will come in, continue to come in strong over the next couple of quarters. But this uh, the the issue with cost as a headwind might come in the second part of the year and we therefore see more room for profit compression in the second half of the year and therefore that may trigger some uh, uh, level of earnings disappointment if consensus continue to, uh, to maintain such optimistic level and therefore could be a major uh, de-rating risk that, we are, that, that I have my eyes on. Thank you both of you for your views. Let's move on to the pandemic. The US seems to be managing the Omicron situation decently compared to other parts of the world. Do you think the economic reopening will re remain a key theme in 2022? Or should investors show greater concern about the Omicron COVID risk? Perhaps we could start with Jin. Sure. So I, I think in the case of uh, COVID itself, uh, uh, including Omicron, the one thing which we've learned, uh, having lived with it for the last two years or so, is to expect the unexpected, right? Now, the good news here is even though uh, that doesn't sound like the most reassuring message, uh, we are not without a playbook. We are not back in 2020 where we do not know what's going to happen. I, I think that if you are concerned about any impact to the business, look at 2020 data, right? That is when shutdowns happen. It will show you exactly how those businesses are impacted. You don't have to guess. You don't have to speculate. You have hard data of how a company will perform during a lockdown, right? And if your concern is whether or not they are able to recover from that lockdown, look at 2021 data, right? Last year's data and see how these businesses are able to recover. Are they recovering stronger? And again, you have data. So in fact, I believe that the stock market has given you a gift where you have all this data available. You, have, you can make your own playbook about which company you want to own and which company can sustain or recover um, based on the data which you have. So you're not flying blind, even though there's uncertainty. Thank you for your views. We are indeed not flying blind. Uh, next, uh, we'll move on to monetary policy. Uh, we'll start with Colin. Inflation is currently running pretty hot in the US, and the Fed is set to do about two to three rate hikes in, the, in 2022 itself. So Colin, do you have any thoughts on Fed's rate hike plans, and what does this mean for equities? Right, right. I think that's a good question because this is definitely on most investors' mind after hearing what Fed uh, uh, had to say over the, the meeting in, in earlier this week. So after looking through the minutes of the meeting, I think it, is, it can be said that there is a really high chance that we'll see rate hike and multiple times this year. So markets right now is in fact expecting rate hikes to, be, to come in around March and for at least two to three times for this year. So I do agree with that. I think we are likely to see, very likely to see rate hikes this year and for about two, two to three uh, hikes for, for this year. So if you look at uh, the data underneath and supporting why uh, there will be rate hikes, you look at the uh, primarily two things, inflation as well as the labour market. So when you look at inflation data, you'll find that components of inflation which are more sticky, which are like your wages as well as your rent, so these are the sticky components that result in more persistent inflation. Those data are indeed rising, and in, and in fact rising at a, at a pretty rapid rate. So with that said, if you look at the, the labour market data, you'll find that, okay, uh, job is growing at about 200k per month, and that is really at a healthy level, despite the recent job number being a bit of a disappointment. But I would say at this stage of the economy, it is still it is a very healthy number. And if you look at wages, which is the more important thing, which is what the Fed looks at when it comes to making uh, interest rate decisions. Uh, uh, you will find that wages itself has risen on an annual, annual basis about 4.7%, and that has exceeded uh, uh, analyst estimates of 4.2%. And wages being such a, such a big and uh, important driver for, for inflation really comes into play and really tells uh, the picture that the labour market itself is in fact very healthy and, and, and growing well and there's not much of concern for the labour market. So all in all, if you look at the labour market as well as inflation data, it really supports the fact that uh, there is a high chance that we have uh, rate hikes coming in soon. And on top of that, uh, the, the, if you look at the, the potential impact of a rate hike on equity markets, like uh, the 
the key thing to note here is that there is always a historical relationship uh, where higher rate hikes will tend to put some pressure on, on equity valuation. So I'll uh, give an example. So if you look at S&P 500 over the past few decades, you'll find that whenever interest rates are, are, are uh, have been rising, we'll find that uh, the valuations for US equities have in fact at best level and at worst have contracted. So we think this time around will be no difference. And if the rate hike comes in faster than expected, I think there would be potentially larger uh, uh, valuation contraction. But if it is well telegraphed, telegraphed and, and guidance for the, from the Fed is clear, then I think valuation may face less resistance. But that is the sort of potential impact I see from, from monetary policy on the equity markets. Chin, do you agree with his views on the rate hike and what stocks do you think can benefit? <laughs> So I think in terms of rate hikes, uh, the way I think about it is it has to happen at some point. So uh, Colin already pointed out some of the uh, preceding indicators that, that is, uh, probably will lead to rate hikes. Uh, for me, that uh, there hasn't been many periods or many years, if you look back in the last 20 years, where you have uh, rate hikes actually happening. We have enjoyed quite a long period of uh, low interest rates. For me, when I look at stocks uh, confronted by such a situation, I look at their earnings power, right? I'll look at whether or not they have debt because uh, interest rates will impact the companies which have debt on their balance sheet. But if they are able to sustain themselves without uh, any debt, if they are able to fund and sustain and grow their business without needing more capital to grow, then I think those companies are the ones which you want to focus on. Thank you, Chin and Colin, for your views on US equities. Moving on to European equities, Colin, how do you think they performed in 2021 and what do you think uh, will their performance be in 2022? Right, right. I think European equities have been quite a dark horse for many years until recently where we see, look at flow data, we see more hedge fund has been allocating into European equities and, and it has had to pick up some uh, steam. So if you look at what drove return for European equities, we must first understand the nature of European equities, which are in fact a more of a value cyclical play as opposed to the US, which is more of a growthy market. So there are three uh, attributes that, that, uh, that supports a, the very strong cyclical performance. So firstly, it is the, if you look at, for example, stock 600, uh, which is uh, uh, the representation of European equities, you'll find that uh, about 60% of the, the revenue is derived internationally. Then if you look at the, the composition for the stock 600, you'll find that around 60% are the more cyclical sectors as opposed to the more uh, growth slash defensive sectors. And also, if you look at the, the monetary policy direction in Euro right now, it is relatively more dovish than, than the Fed. And in also compared to many parts of the world. So these three factors, when taken all together, really points to the fact that the, if the global recovery should continue, and in our base case, we think it will continue for, for this year, it's likely to, to uh, is likely to be very supportive for European equities given its uh, cyclical tilt. And that itself has driven a lot of the performance uh, last year. If you look at the, the very cyclical sectors such as your auto sectors, your industrial, your energy in, in Europe, those are the ones that have, have driven uh, the first stage of the recovery. And when we look at the second stage of the recovery, which is the more of a second half of this year, a second half of last year and the early parts of this year, we see that the consumer sectors are the ones that are driving that recovery. So the, the ones that are more cyclical, but at the same time, less sensitive to the, to the, the energy and industrial sectors. So we see a two-part cyclical recovery. And what do I think about uh, European equities moving ahead? What I see, uh, I see two, two things that I really like uh, as opposed to the you know, US equities. Firstly, uh, valuations level compared to US equities are still relatively cheap. So I believe European equities are trading at a 26% discount to US equity based on a 4P ratio basis. And that is compared to a historical discount of 16%. So it is 9% discount more than what it's trading at historically. And if you look at a, the, 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 the com what has happened over the past uh, two to three quarters, we'll find that European equities are getting cheaper and cheaper relative to the US, while prices are very comparable. So gains over the past two, three, two to three quarters are quite comparable, but valuations are getting cheaper. And in fact, when you, you take that and 
together with the, the, the discount trading at the US, with the US, we find that there is definitely relative value in, in, in Europe and there is a scope for, for valuation expansion. And if you look at the uh, earnings, uh, corporate earnings for European equities, you'll find that uh, European equities uh, tend to have a 10-year CAGR pre-COVID of about 4%. And moving ahead over the next uh, two to three years, we are looking at a growth rate of 7 to 8%, which is about double the historical level. And a big part of it is driven by the cyclicality, like I mentioned. And overall, taking both factors together, we have strong earnings growth, uh, relatively stronger earnings growth, as well as room for valuation expansion. We do see very strong upside as compared to the US. So for Europe, for example, we are looking at a 14%, 13 to 14% upside over the next two years. For US, we are looking at about 6% because of its uh, valuation and on, and on average. So therefore, comparing both uh, upside as well as the underlying drivers, yeah, we are leaning more towards uh, European equities. Thank you for your views on US equities. Uh, for one final question for Chin, sure. uh, for on, the, on the US market, how do you think investors should allocate their investments and uh, overall in the, in the US market and beyond? And overall, do you have any final thoughts? Sure. So I, I think in the US, uh, what you actually get is a market which is pretty homogeneous. You have uh, same language, uh, fairly large market, uh, just the GDP in the world, high consumer spending. And I, I think if you take it for that benefit, uh, you, you are able to find a lot of businesses that can build uh, a substantial uh, or, or have a very long growth buff just based on the local U.S. market itself. So that is what the U.S. market offers you, right? So I, I do see it as a core part of your portfolio. It's, it is personally a core part of my portfolio. If you like to venture into emerging markets and so on, you may be facing uh, currencies which are less stable, political systems which may be not as mature, and also uh, you know, situations which uh, we, are, we don't see very often in Singapore. Right? Uh, recently, I found out that in Kazakhstan, there has been riots, and the government just shut down the entire internet. Right? So these are the kind of risks which uh, we usually don't think of. But when you go into developed markets, uh, such risks are typically uh, less present. Thank you very much to both Colin from our macro research team as well as Chin from uh, The Smart Investor for joining us today on our discussion on US and European equities. We will now hand everyone back to the MC. Thank you, Chin, Colin and Cyrus. With US equities recording yet another strong year in 2021, what can we expect in 2022? How can the macro backdrop of monetary policy, inflation and the pandemic shape the landscape in the coming year? Coming up next, we have Vanessa Huang, Vice President, Financial Institutions at Franklin Templeton in uncovering the key drivers for continued growth in the US, the potential headwinds and how Franklin US Opportunities Fund continues to unearth attractive opportunities for investors in the long term. Hi, good afternoon everyone. I'm Vanessa from Franklin Templeton and today I am very excited to be here to share our insights on how the US equities market will fare in 2022. Okay, so before I dive into my presentation proper, I wanted to give you a quick overview on Franklin Templeton and who we are. Um, I'm sure Franklin Templeton is a brand name that many of you will be familiar with as we've been veterans in the asset management industry for over 70 years now. And as of today, we have over 1.5 trillion US dollars worth of assets, making us the sixth largest asset manager in the world. So of this $1.5 trillion of assets, we manage a very good mix of fixed income funds, equity funds, multi-asset, and even alternatives. And slightly over half of our assets right now are from retail investors like myself and yourself, while the remaining of our investors are actually institutional clients like sovereign wealth funds and pension funds. So here you can see that we have a very diversified uh, suite of products and also a very diversified uh, uh, client base. So with that, let me now move on to our market views on the US. 
All right, so let me just take stock of what we've seen so far in the US. Um, in this chart here, you can see that the US is now back to pre-pandemic levels of output. Um, the green line here shows the nominal GDP of the US, and you would notice that it dipped very severely in March 2020 in that grey bar there. And as a result of the pandemic, um, but it recovered very sharply in the second half of 2022. So this resulted in a V-shaped recovery of the economy. So this is a term I think you would have heard very frequently last year if you were keeping up with the financial news. So um, this is actually the deepest recession that the US has seen on record, but it's also the most short-lived. And essentially what this chart is showing is that the levels of output are now higher than what it was in 2019 before COVID happened. Uh, putting the U.S. equities in a very strong footing and steady path for 2022, in our opinion. All right, so moving on to the next slide. Overall, we think that U.S. growth is expected to remain very healthy despite this moderating economic momentum, which we think is very natural given such a huge upswing in the second half of 2020. So the chart on the left uh, left side here shows that the economic data has begun to moderate after this record recovery in the second half of 2020. Thus, this line chart is trending downwards. However, uh, we are not too worried by this because if you look at the chart on the right side of this page, um, the light blue bars indicate that US growth is forecasted to grow well above the long-term trend, which is typically um, 2% on a quarterly basis. So if you look at this light blue bars, you would see that you know it's forecasted to grow anywhere from 3 to 5% in the upcoming quarters. All right, so it's also worth noting that not every country or region out there is forecasting a growth that's that above of their long-term average. Thus, this makes the case for why investors should continue to look at US equities this year, as we believe there are still legs for the market to run. Okay, so now let's address something that's on every investor's mind right now. Um, is the US equity market overvalued, especially with the S&P 500 finishing the year at about 28% last year? So this is the third year in a row where it finished double-digit returns, right? So in our opinion, um, the strong returns that we have seen are very explainable, and we really don't think that this is a bubble waiting to pop. But instead, um, we believe that there are strong fundamentals backing the valuations as corporate earnings continue to be very strong. Um, on the left-hand side of this page, you can see that corporate earnings have recovered and are now surpassing pre-pandemic levels, while the chart on the right shows a large percentage of companies in the US are actually beating analyst expectations and surprising on the upside. So all in all, we believe that as the global economy starts to reopen this year in full force, the US companies will stand to gain and corporate earnings will continue to trend upwards, which will be a positive for US equities if you remain selective. So the next question is, um, within US equities, right, do we prefer large or small caps, growth or value stocks? Okay. So the chart here is very busy, but what it's trying to sh show is that uh, the large cap growth and quality stocks have been in favour since last year. Um, the blue line compares growth versus value stocks, while the green line compares the returns of large cap versus small cap stocks. So you see here that both lines have been trending upwards since the middle of last year, and this is despite the number of COVID infections in the US, but illustrated by the grey bars in the background, right? So um, it's worth noting that our focus in the Franklin US Opportunities Fund is on growth and quality stocks. Hence, this makes us really excited as the data presented in the chart shows that this may be the sweet spot to be in if investors are looking for additional returns this year. Okay, so now um, within US equities, there's also many sectors to be invested in, right? And not all sectors within US equities are valued equally. Hence, um, we think that it's very, very important to stay active and use a portfolio manager with a very strong track record in investing in US equities, as we believe that investors will be compensated if they invest in the right sectors with stronger earnings potential. 
So the chart here, you can see that sectors such as IT and consumer discretionary stocks tend to trade at a higher PE ratio. And what this means is that they are a bit more expensive than other sectors. However, if you look at the horizontal axis, right, the growth potential is much higher in these sectors. So all in all, in short, although the long-term earnings forecast across many of these sectors may look compelling, um, it's still very important to remain active in your sector and stock allocation when you are investing in the U.S. equities. So moving on to the next slide, where are we seeing value and opportunities right now? Okay, so at Franklin Templeton, we think that digital transformation is still in the early days of adoption and it's forecasted to spur company growth as what's shown in this chart. So um, going into 2022, many of our investments still remain very focused on the ongoing digital transformation of the global economy. And we believe that this move towards digitization is allowing companies to, number one, better understand their customers, number two, improve business processes, number three, increase productivity, and all in all, uh, this will eventually lower costs and hence making U.S. companies more profitable. All right, so, and if you want to invest in digital transformation as a theme, we believe that the U.S. is actually the best place to be. So the U.S. is home to leaders in digital transformation. And in this slide here, you can see in the survey, uh, the U.S. actually came up, up on top versus other regions in terms of world digital competitiveness. And... All right, so if you're still not convinced why you should be looking at U.S. equities this year, I think this chart is one of my favorite charts that summarizes it all. Okay, so uh, U.S. Over here on the right-hand side, you see U.S. is actually trading at a modest premium relative to other regions, right? So that's why it's in the top right-hand corner. But then, um, you know, when you look at the horizontal axis, you see the ROE, the return on equity, it is actually growing at a much faster pace compared to the other regions out there. So at Franklin, at Franklin Templeton, we do acknowledge that valuations are really actually not looking cheap right now, right? Hence, we expect earnings growth to be the driving force of returns moving forward. And it's important to focus on what we consider very high quality businesses with sustainable growth drivers that may not be reflected in current valuations. And moreover, like what the previous speakers spoke about earlier, monetary policy, right? The Fed has already started tapering and we are going to expect at least three interest rate hikes this year. And this oftentimes it will not bode well for growth stocks on a broad level. Hence, we think that it's very important to stay active. And, you know, these are the high quality companies are the kind of stocks that will eventually, uh, uh, that it will weather through the market volatility that we are going to see for the rest of it, uh, for the rest of the year. So with that, I hope the past couple of slides has helped us to set the stage for our outlook on U.S. equities and the economy. Uh, right now, I will give a quick intro and recap on the Franklin U.S. Opportunities, Opportunities Fund, our flagship core U.S. equities fund. Okay. Okay, so this fund, this is a high conviction fund where we typically own about 60 to 90 stocks on average. And think, just, you just think about this as our best ideas portfolio where you can get access to Franklin Templeton's top stock picks in the US equity space. And as mentioned earlier, um, this portfolio has a very huge focus on digital transformation and innovation, and it only invests in very high quality, high growth companies that are benefiting or will benefit from the shift to more digital ways of doing businesses. And uh, we also believe that there's a huge long term secular tailwind for growth in these type of companies. And this may not be fully reflected in current valuations like what I mentioned earlier. So one interesting thing about this uh, fund uh, that you can take away with yourself today, uh, the lead portfolio manager, Graham Bowers, and his entire team, they're actually based in San Mateo, California. Uh, if you're familiar with San Mateo, California, this is actually right in the heart of Silicon Valley where all the action is. So we do believe that being situated at the heart of Silicon Valley is one of our true advantages as the team is near all the leading tech companies and VC firms. And this proximity really helps our analysts to gain first-hand insights to what's going on in the tech scene. So, um, so we do believe that, you know, since we are investing alongside the digital transformation theme, being based in Silicon Valley is a true advantage. 
So now let me just move on and uh, touch on some sub themes under the digital transformation theme that have emerged coming out of the pandemic. So th these are just a few of the themes. So firstly, uh, healthcare innovation. So uh, during the pandemic, consumers like myself and yourself, I'm pretty sure uh, uh, at least half of us would have used telemedicine, right? So we were kind of introduced to this whole concept of you know uh, video calling your doctor and you know talking to him, and then after that, you don't even need to go down to the clinic to pick up your uh, medication, but instead he can uh, they they will just deliver it to your doorstep. So we do believe that this has created more efficiencies and is reducing time spent waiting in the clinic. So we're very positive on this sector. And on top of that, uh, we are also very positive on genomics. Um, the pandemic has showed us how advances in gene sequencing can lead to faster and better treatments for disease. And this expedited research uh, and development process for the COVID-19 vaccine is the result of genomic advancements. So we, do th we are very excited on genomics and we do believe in the next five to 10 years, this, this, this is an area that uh, we should be looking very closely in. Okay, so secondly, another sub-theme that we're looking at is financials, okay? So in this portfolio, we do not have any exposure to banks, but instead we are more interested in fintech companies. Uh, as we start to move to a cashless society during the pandemic, you know, we're seeing the rise of many of these fintech companies that's focused on um, providing this service. So uh, while these companies in the fintech sector were really not immune to the effects of COVID-19, uh, we do believe that these contactless habits are uh, uh, and the shift towards a cashless society spurred by this pandemic are likely co to continue, uh, especially with this rapid growth in e-commerce, which has accelerated credit card use and other online payment services that allow for contactless transactions. And last but not least, uh, I'll just touch on consumer spending patterns. I think this is a sub-theme that a lot of us can relate to. Um, over the past two years, one and a half to two years, uh, we have been introduced to a tremendous number of new options on how to go about our daily lives and hence changing the way we spend our money. So uh, we expect many of these digital behaviours pursued during the pandemic, like remote working, shopping for groceries online, in-home exercise or telemedicine to continue long after after the economy fully reopens, right? So this is the, a couple of the sub-themes that we're positive on in this sector that makes us really excited. And next up, I'll just talk about our uh, sector allocation. So this is our portfolio sector allocation versus the two benchmarks which we measure ourselves against. Uh, firstly, the Russell 3000 index and the S&P 500 index. Okay, so these portfolio weights actually um, reflect the PM's conviction, the portfolio manager's conviction and not the benchmark. So we really do not tie ourselves down to the benchmark, but instead these sector weights are a result of the various sub-themes that the investment team is positive on. So over here, you can see that the portfolio is currently overweight in IT, healthcare and financials. And just to note, uh, the financials that we own are fintech companies and not, not your traditional banking stocks. Okay, so um, next slide. This is uh, our track record, our very strong track record. The fund has been around since April 2000. So we have close to 21 years of very strong track record record. So in the chart on the left, you can see that we have outperformed our peer group, other US equity funds out there in the three, five, 10 year period. And the chart on the right shows the cumulative performance of our fund versus the peers. So what this really means is that if you bought into Franklin US Ops 10 years ago, you put in a thousand dollars and you stayed invested all the way. You didn't put in extra money, right? Um, so if you fast forward 10 years to today, your money would have more than tripled by now versus if you put your money in other, uh, other US equities funds, it would have probably only doubled, slightly more than doubled. Okay, so that's how you read this chart. Okay, so I've come to my, the end of my presentation, but before I go, I really just wanted to summarize what we discussed earlier, okay? So why U.S. equities now? Uh, firstly, we think U.S. markets offer exposure to long-term secular growth trends, such as digital transformation, which we think is still in its very early days, and there's still a lot more value to be unlocked. So secondly, we think the U.S. growth still remains very attractive relative to other markets, and really not many regions out 
out they are forecasted to grow at the same pace as the US. And last but not least, we do believe as long-term investors, um, you can benefit from being exposed to US equities. So next, why Franklin US Opportunities Fund? Uh, we have close to 21 years of track record, like what I mentioned earlier. And the main aim of this fund is to capture leading US companies poised for growth. And we like very high quality, high growth companies. And these stocks are selected from a bottom up basis by our team based in Silicon Valley. So uh, this is also a very diversified portfolio that has exposure across market caps and multiple industries. And like what I mentioned earlier, it has a very strong track record so I'll just let the number speak for itself. So with that, I've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I really hope you found this session insightful. With that, I'll just hand the floor over to our MC. Thank you, Vanessa. In just a short moment, we will head over to our speakers at the Q&A panel, where Catherine, Colleen, Hui Shi, and Wei Ren will be on hand to respond to your questions from today. However, if you have any more questions, you can leave them in the Q&A function. But of course, don't go away just yet, because after the Q&A session, we will be holding our daily quiz. This is sponsored by our platinum sponsors, CSOP Asset Management, East Spring Investments, and Nickel Asset Management. Six winners will each walk away with a $100 worth of FSM multi-currency cash account credits for the fastest and most accurate answers. We'll be back with the Q&A shortly. The internet basically opened up a, a new channel. You can reach out directly to consumers, to investors. iPlus TV is going to be so accessible and there will be a lot of programs, many different types. I'm here on FEX, please. Welcome to Last Station. Welcome to Retirement with Ease. Hey guys, welcome to this roundtable. Welcome to another episode of Our Two Cents. The ideas and plans we have for IFAS TV gets bigger and bigger as we get more excited over all the possibilities of what we could do in this new department. And here's my investment resume. Welcome to another YouTube channel. Welcome to another episode of Money Masses. Welcome to the IFAS TV Market Outlook 2022 series. Tune in to iFast TV if you want to hear all these different programs in the different languages and dialects. Thank you for joining us uh, for the Q&A session. Uh, we really um, appreciate uh, your attention throughout this whole uh, very long day of presentations and uh, investment ideas. I do hope that uh, all of you have learned something from all the presentation and also thank you um, for your questions that you have um, keyed in in the comment boxes. So today, um, with us on this um, panelist, uh, we do have uh, Weiren, uh, Colleen, as well as uh, Hui Shi to answer some of these burning questions. 
So I think one of the very um, popular questions, especially among the investors that we speak with, and also um, in one of the questions in the Q&A comments, is that um, given that Fed uh, will actually increase the rates um, in the coming months and years, like uh, how should we actually position our portfolio and whether or not uh, investing in fixed income funds uh, would still be relevant? So I will direct this question to Colleen. Yeah, so this is in fact a very valid question. If you look across the history of investment, there has been multiple times uh, interest rate were high on in by major central banks of the US or even in the other emerging markets. So uh, looking at it in isolation, I do not think it is rate hike means a bad thing. I think that is uh, false because if you look at uh, the underlying conditions now, growth, economic growth itself is in fact has in fact rebounded quite relatively strong. And if you look at the liquidity condition right now, despite the fact that we are moving into easing mode, we are still uh, liquidity is still abundant as compared to pre-COVID level. And therefore, we, when, when we look at, uh, when it comes to assessing rate height, we don't think it's, it has a negative impact uh, right now. So we really have a, a negative impact on fixed income. I, I think my short answer is no. No doubt there is some price risk whereby if Feds are to uh, hike rates, we will definitely see some uh, price volatility, spread volatility, and potentially some price decline in certain segments of the fixed income markets. But overall, if you look at history, for example, you find that when uh, interest rates are, are, are raised, uh, the high yield bonds themselves uh, tend, tend to do uh, much better than your investment grade bonds. And high yield bonds can be an area to, to also look at when, when interest rates are hiked. So within the high yield segment itself, there are multiple areas where, re where it remains more uh, susceptible to, to price risk coming from rate hike. So these are the segments where they tend to have a longer duration. For example, like your emerging market debt, your hard currency, as well as your local currency. And the same goes for IG bonds, where IG bonds, more, more segments tend to have a higher duration. Therefore, I would say they are slightly more risky. But uh, if you are trying to invest in a rate high environment, I would suggest also to look at the high yield bonds, for example. Some of them really have a lower duration. And also, uh, like I mentioned earlier, when the Fed high rates or uh, when uh, the emerging markets high rates, the economic, itself, the economic growth itself tends to be on, on an uptrend. Yeah, they, they seldom high rates when economic growth is decelerating and because that itself can be catastrophic. So economic growth is already supportive and you look at the underlying uh, corporate conditions so supportive for the issuers. So the backdrop itself tends to be uh, already supportive for these uh, high yield issuers and coupled with uh, the fact that the, even if the rates are, are high, I still tend to believe that certain areas of the high yield bond markets uh, can do well and definitely should not sell your, your fixed income funds. Okay, thank you for your very comprehensive answer. So I think this leads me to my second question um, because there's somebody uh, asking also about like Asian high yield um, specifically. Perhaps you can share a bit more about these segments. Like, does this still warrant um, this investment in the portfolio despite the decline in the bond prices? And also, like, um, I mean, maybe uh, another of our panelists can add in whether should we go with an active fund or like um, follow an ETF? So uh, maybe Colleen, you can start. Yeah, sure. So earlier on in my presentation, I talked briefly about Asian high yield bonds, and it's one of our pick within the high yield uh, region. So uh, looking at Asian high yield, I think the main thing on everybody's mind is definitely China property sector. And if you look at the China property sector now, I think over the past couple of months, in fact, the last year, there have been multiple concerns, and in, indeed so because some of the issuers themselves are facing a lot of difficulties. So. It, looking ahead, does it warrant uh, any more uh, concerns? We think yes, but the situation is definitely getting better. Uh, firstly, if you look at the policy direction itself in China, it's going decisively eas easing. So that is uh, for sure because if you look at the, the central bank in China, look at government policies, they are definitely in easing mode and have done a lot of uh, recent measures to support liquidity as well as credit condition in China. And also you look at the, what uh, the government is doing right now for the property sector, they have implemented tons of measures on, on the credit side as well as supporting the issuers to tide through uh, this tough time. So 
policy direction is favoring the China property sector. So that is one thing. And the second thing uh, that we note is that if you look at the uh, yield spreads for Asian high yield, the credit spreads for Asian high yield right now, it is about 8 to 9%. So I would argue that a lot of this uh, risk, in fact, is being priced in to, to credit spreads. No doubt we have dropped from about 14% to 8 or 9%. But compared to historical average, it is still about five, uh, 4 to 5% above historical average. And that, uh, to me, has already priced in a lot of this uh, credit risk. So spreads are at a level where uh, right now we are comfortable entering and we, are, we see uh, when we look ahead, there is potential for spread compression if the, uh, the, the support from the Chinese government as well as uh, the economy is there. The, when we spread compression, we see potential for upside. And coming from this level, there could be some significant uh, upside looking ahead. And uh, thirdly, if you look at the, the, the yield as well as the duration, the yield to duration ratio, also known as the Sherman ratio, it is one of the lowest, uh, it's one of the highest amongst the different segments. So what this means is uh, uh, the Asia high yield bond segment is more resilient to changes in interest rate, meaning that it takes a lot more uh, increase in rate hikes to wipe out the yield of Asian high yield because it offers such a high yield and such a low duration. So uh, looking at those three factors, those are really positive factors for Asian high yield. And looking ahead, I think the, the final concern that many people have is will Asia how you manage the upcoming maturity for this year, which many things is quite significant. We do believe so, yes. And if you look at the, the macroeconomy for most of these uh, uh, key countries, within the Asia high yield segment, China included. We are looking at, uh, at the, uh, the Asian economies improving this year and policy direction still remains uh, supportive. So all in all, we do expect the issuers to be able to handle the, the upcoming maturity for this year. And alongside my three previous factors, I do uh, believe that the Asia high yield for this year will do much better than last year. Yeah, thank you for your response. So like maybe on the second part of the question um, is that whether should we go for an active management or um, in times like this, we should be more concerned about the fees and go for something that's cheaper, like perhaps the ETFs. So maybe, um, Wiran, you can share some thoughts on this. Well, um, if you look at um, historically, I think IFAST, FSM, we have always been believers in active management. Uh, whenever we find that there is a, a good active fund that is able to outperform the market, then uh, of course we're always very inclined to recommend investors to go for um, active strategies. Uh, in this case, we're talking about Asian high yield, which uh, we all know in 2021 has undergone a significant correction. Um, this is also um, a segment whereby there is a lot of uncertainties, uh, policy uncertainties, and uh, also credit selection is important because not all Chinese uh, property developers are made equal. Some are stronger than others, um, and there are also others that are, you know, that our investors should ideally stay away from. Uh, but there are still good companies within um, the Chinese property market that still warrants investors' attention. And you ideally want an active manager to be there to, um, you know, pick up the better ones from the not so good uh, bond issuers. You want to go for an active manager that has a robust um, credit selection process that will be uh, that will enable investors to uh, take advantage of uh, any uh, upside potential uh, in the year ahead. So I think uh, specifically for um, the Asian high yield space, um, I think my recommendation and personal inclination is to to go for active management instead of passive, even though it may be more. Um, more expensive in terms of fees, but I think that additional fees that you pay are uh, it's more than uh, more than compensates for, um, for 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 the upside potential that you you could get from um, this particular segment. Yes. Okay. Thank you for your response. So I guess um, overall we are still um, recommending an active strategy over a passive one, especially within the Asian high yield bond space, um, due to the um, extra homework that the fund managers do. And uh, leading up to the next question, uh, I could um, direct this to. Um, perhaps uh, Hui Shi, because she covers the um, Asian uh, real estate markets. So this question is asking whether like the default, um, I mean the default of all these um, high, yield, uh, high yield Chinese property developers, will it trigger like a systematic risk um, to um, Chinese equity as a whole? Yeah, so in 2021, we have seen a couple of defaults uh, across the Chinese property sector. Uh, we have uh, 
China Fortune Land and liquidity, liquidity crunch at Evergrande. So all of this has uh, led to a uh, property slowdown. And given that uh, the property sector contributes a large share of China's economy, uh, China's economy is also facing a slowdown. And the econ economic slowdown is also being compounded by uh, shortages uh, in the energy sector, as well as uh, the resurgence of COVID-19 cases. Uh, but here we believe that the slowdown in China's economy has, uh, has reached a level that policymakers could not ignore. So in recent times, we've also seen uh, policymakers uh, fine-tuning the regulations on the Chinese property sector. So they have helped to sp uh, speed up uh, mortgage approvals and also they've granted uh, more credit to those higher quality developers. And as such, with this supportive policy fine-tuning, I believe that uh, this will help to reduce the systematic risk to the rest of the property sector and also to the rest of China's economy. And right now, in terms of valuations, I think that most of the uh, downside risk uh, towards the Chinese, property, Chinese equities has already been priced in. And so investors are likely to be able to com be compensated for taking on the risk right now. And uh, in terms of the different sectors, we are still remaining neutral on Chinese property equities, given that uh, there are still tight regulations in place, which are likely to uh, lead to developers storing up cash and leading to lower earnings growth. And also the supportive policy fine-tuning is more likely to benefit uh, China property bonds rather than China property equities. And also investors can also consider some of the sectors uh, within China equities that are expected to benefit from the country's uh, long-term devel long development plans. So this will be sectors such as uh, Chinese semiconductors and your Chinese uh, EVs and even the clean energy sector. So some of these sectors are well positioned to ride on uh, trends that are being laid out by the Chinese government. Okay, thank you, Hui Xu, for your very comprehensive uh, reply. So leading to the next question as well, I think there's a lot of questions asking about um, Chinese um, tech companies, especially like those names that were being bashed um, through the regulatory um, pressures um, last year. Um, and also, uh, one of the questions here asks, like, what is our forecast for um, Hang Seng Tech? And um, even though like those people who have invested last year, uh, what should they still do? Because I think currently most of um, the investors are looking at a double digit losses so what what should they do like in the coming year yeah. um yep yeah, I'll, I'll take this question um we actually have a segment on um uh, china tech next week uh so i don't want to steal the thunder of uh, my colleague who will be presenting on this segment but um just to answer this question uh very briefly i think uh the Hang Seng Tech Index, China tech stocks in general, I think that is one of our best ideas for 2022. Uh, in 2021, uh, we have recommended this, and uh, no doubt with the benefit of hindsight, uh, there, there were several uh, factors that, uh, that, blindsided, um, that, that we were blindsided by, such as uh, the re regulatory risk. Uh, but I think moving ahead, uh, I think Hui Shi has uh, just now mentioned also with uh, China now shifting to a more pro-growth stance with a stability as one of its main focus for 2022. Now, uh, I think this is uh, uh, an important development because when stability is a key priority for the Chinese government, that also means that um, coming up with drastic policy changes, uh, coming up with drastic regulatory changes, uh, I, I don't think that is something that will fit into the overall theme of uh, stability. So we do see um, the worst. Uh, we think that we have already seen the worst of uh, China's regulatory crackdown on the tech sector. We think that moving forward in 2022, there probably will be an easing of uh, these regulatory pressures instead. So uh, I think that's our base case for 2022, which also means that uh, for 2022, we are actually quite um, upbeat and uh, quite optimistic about the Hang Seng Tech Index. Uh, we see 2022 as a year for China tech stocks um, to rebound. So um, we, we think that this overall change in the government stance, that is uh, going to be a potential uh, catalyst for, uh, for Chinese tech stocks. And their valuations are at um, quite low levels. Uh, I think record lows since uh, it was first incepted. So, so I think from a valuations perspective, I think Chinese tech stocks, they are very attractive at this point. 
Okay, thank you everyone for your answer. So um, there's also another question related to the China, uh, China tech stock, which we do get quite often amongst um, clients. It's actually whether, um, I mean, uh, these companies, some of them are dual listed. So they are listed in China as well as in um, New York. And I mean, there's a lot of um, headline concerns about delistings of companies um, from the exchanges or like, um, like example, DD uh, and so on. Is there any like very major concern that we should pay very particular attention to these kind of um, headlines? Um, well, um, to answer the question of whether we should um, stay away from the US listed Chinese tech companies, I mean, right now, uh, what we are seeing in um, the asset management industry is that a lot of uh, the fund managers, they are swapping the exposure from um, the US listed companies to the Hong Kong listed ones. And uh, increasingly, we are also seeing uh, a lot of these Chinese companies uh, switching over to Hong Kong as their preferred listing place uh, instead of uh, the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, but of course, um, having said that, um, I think there is no need for you to immediately uh, dump your um, your US listed stock holdings just yet uh, because the first delisting that we could potentially see from the US is still three years away because uh, the new regulations actually states that um, the delisting will only take place uh, if and only if Chinese companies they fail uh, to abide by um, certain uh, regulatory uh, reporting requirements for three consecutive years. So the first listing will actually still be three years away. And from now until three years later, a lot of things can, can potentially happen. And one potential thing that could happen is perhaps uh, there could be a compromise made between um, the US and the Chinese government uh, for US listings to, to, to continue. Uh, I mean, this is just pure speculation at this point, but this is something that could potentially happen. And even if three years later, if the delistings do take place, um, I think another mitigating factor is that um, the US listed shares are actually fungible, uh, which means that they can be swapped into the Hong Kong listed uh, equivalent. And with a lot of these Chinese companies maintaining dual listings in both the US and the Hong Kong, then uh, I think from the investor perspective, I don't think we should be um, fearing too much and uh, dumping um, all our shares at this point. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so um, there's also one question about um, the um, US equity. I uh, understand that US equity comprises largely on tech and with the rise um, in the potential rise in the interest rates environment, um, tech might not perform as well. So, um, and also if you look at the valuation wise, um, they could be slightly overvalued at this point. I mean, due to the run out for the last two years. So just wanted to share if, um, yeah, I mean, if you guys have any um, opinions to share about this segment. Um, yeah, maybe I'll go first. Um, I think uh, addressing specifically on the topic of tech, uh, I, I just wanted to say that uh, not all tech is made equal. Um, in a rising interest rate environment, I think there will be certain tech names that will be affected a lot more than um, the others. So I think the, the ones that will primarily be affected in a rising interest rate environment are particularly the smaller uh, tech players, um, your startups, those that are still loss making, um, those that are highly leveraged. So, so those tech companies, they will be um, the, the first ones that will be um, affected. And on the other hand, you also have big tech, the likes of Microsoft, um, Meta, and uh, Amazon. So these are big, mature companies with a lot of financial resources. And I think in a rising interest rate environment, they do actually have um, opportunities to continue uh, expanding their business. So I think this distinction between um, the, the better, the bigger tech versus the smaller tech, I think this distinction should be made. Um, I think in a rising rate environment, there is um, still the potential for um, the, the more the healthier, the bigger names to um, continue to, to, um, to outperform. But having said that, I, I think at this point entering 2022, I must say that um, if you look at US tech names, um, big tech names in general, I think the valuations are running perhaps to the expensive side of things. Um, a lot of expectations are being built um, into the share prices of these tech companies. So I think in general, um, US tech, probably um, I, I don't see a lot of upside potential for US tech. And uh, again, I reiterate my view that perhaps China tech is something that you might want to consider um, in, in, in this kind of environment. Right, I will just add on to what Maren said. So I believe the, the, the question, the first part of the question also says that if the, viewer, the, the investor view is long-term, say more than 10 years, should we still venture in the US uh, unit trust? 
I think if you're you looking at the track record for US equity, especially the, the 10 year Kager pre COVID, is the earnings growth is growing at about 9 to 10%. So that is already higher than some of the other developed markets like US and Japan. So <clears throat> I think with the exposure to the secular growth trend in, in the US, especially the from, from the tech, uh, big tech companies, there is this uh, potential for very strong long-term earnings growth ability as demonstrated over the past 10 years. And I do think that if an investor's uh, horizon is, is uh, more than 10 years, there is still definitely room for, 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 for the investor to venture into US equity because of a very, very strong uh, earnings power, especially proven earnings power over a longer term period. And if you look across the different markets, right now it is hard to get into a market where, uh, where, there is, where the market provides such a growthy, uh, growthy trend as well as a, a, the exposure to such long term, very strong secular trend. So I think US is a good example. And with that said, I think we still have to bear in mind with the, 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 level of, uh, the current level of valuation as well as uh, in which area the investors want to enter into the US equity market. So I think taking all that into consideration, I will still say, yes, uh, shouldn't, because if you have a long horizon, you still should venture to the US uh, despite all these uh, near-term issues, but keep aware of the current valuation level, especially as a market and as the different sectors and industries. Okay, thank you for answering all the questions. So maybe just a very last question to wrap up today's session because we are running a bit out of time. So um, could you just share with us like uh, one key takeaway uh, among all the um, events that we have today? Like uh, what can our investor take away that one thing? Yeah, I'll start with uh, Weirun first. Um, yeah, I think for me the takeaway is uh, really diversification. Uh, we, we have seen in 2021 um, the emergence of um, you know, Delta and more recently Omicron. Uh, I think uh, our battle with um, the pandemic is not over yet and that also means volatility is uh, likely going to be high. Uh, uncertainty is going to be high in the markets as we move into 2022. So the, the, the only way for us to navigate this kind of environment is, is to really have a diversified portfolio to weather through all these uncertainties. And for you, Hui Shi? I think one of the key themes that uh, we have shared throughout this entire program today, as well as one of the major themes in 2022, I think that would be rate hikes. And in terms of equities, uh, one, poten one, very, one potential sector that investors should be looking into in 2022 will be the financial sector, in particular uh, the banks, as they will benefit from uh, the rate hikes in terms of their net interest margins. And uh, most of the banks, especially those in Asia, they derive a lot of their of a lot of their revenue from their net interest income. So rate hikes would definitely be a significant development uh, for the banks in 2022. Yeah. And last of all, Colleen. Right. I would just say that looking at the title, the show must go on. I think the show will go on. You look at markets. Markets will go up. Markets will come down. So no matter what you decide to buy, be it a company, an issuer, or a market do know what you're buying into. So for example, you look at the company, do know what you're buying into, what the company is about, are you comfortable buying into that company? If you look at the market, do know the basic stuff is, uh, of, of the market. So what the growth trend is like, are you comfortable buying into it? So knowing what you're gonna buy into, I think that really helps and elevates a lot of uh, unnecessary concern as well as uh, emotional fears as well as uh, all these uh, different distortion. Thank you so much for all of your insights. So I hope uh, all of you learned something from this Q&A. And uh, do stay tuned for the quiz section. Uh, and now I'll just pass back the time to Gladys. Thank you, panelists, for answering our questions today. Before we head into our quiz segment, I'd like to share with you some of the promotions available at fsm1.com. Firstly, receive 3,000 rewards points by opening a new FSM1 account. Already have an account? Refer a friend to open an account and both of you could receive 3,000 reward points. The promo code to use is WAWTI2022. From now till December as well, secondly, FSM1.com is offering 0% processing fees on ETF RSP. Pick from a wide range of over 60 ETFs listed on the SGX, Hong Kong and US exchanges. With ETF RSP, you can start growing your investment portfolio on a regular basis with as little as $50 a month.
Finally, check out this limited time promotion, Power to the Portfolio. From 8th of January 2022 to 31st of January 2022, receive $10 bonus units for every $10,000 invested in 17 unit trusts, spanning across 10 different markets, sectors, and themes that you can consider incorporating into your portfolio in 2022. You can also enjoy three free trades into selected ETFs covered during what and where to invest 2022. Of course, terms and conditions apply. You can refer to the fsm1.com homepage to browse the list of funds and ETFs on promotion. Now, let's begin our quiz for today. To access the quiz, you'll need to be on Event Live. Click on Agenda and Activities on the left-hand side menu. Under the Agenda section, click on Quiz. Click on the Join Quiz button. The activity window will be displayed on the right. After each question, the leaderboard will be displayed and once the quiz ends, you may check if you are one of the final winners. Six winners with the correct answers will each win $100 worth of FSM1 cash account credits sponsored by our platinum sponsors CSOP Asset Management, East Spring Investments and Nickel Asset Management. Note that your results will be based on the accuracy as well as the speed of your answers. If you're ready, let's begin with a trial question to get us warmed up. In three, two, one. Warm up question number one. What does FSM in FSM1 stand for? Is it Funds Mart? Or is it Funds Market? Or could it be Funds Supermart? Or Funds Supermarket? What does FSM1 in what does FSM in FSM1 stand for? Remember, your results are based on the accuracy as well as the speed of your answer. And the results are out. It seems that most of you are aware of the correct answer. 91% of you got fun supermart. The correct answer is indicated by the green tick, tick on the right hand side of your screen. 9% chose fun supermarket. I see you were quite close to the correct answer. Now this is just a warm-up question. We'll be moving to the actual questions very shortly. So get your fingers ready. The leaderboard will also show up for the actual ones and not for this warm-up question. In three, two, one. Question number one. Which of the following statements is true? FSM1 believes equities will outperform fixed income in 2022. Or is it the second statement? FSM1 believes the Hang Seng Index will rise to 34,000 points by end 2023. Or is it that FSM1 is most bullish on these three sectors in China? Utilities, industrials, and consumer discretionary. Which of the following statements is true? And look at that. Over half of you have got the statement correct. It is the first statement. FSM1 believes equities will outperform fixed income in 2022. It seems that 28.7% believed in the second statement that Hang Seng Index will rise. But look at that, we have our results out already. We will only have six winners, mainly the first rank one to rank six, but you all have a chance to rise up the ranks. So buckle up and get ready. This is our leaderboard. Let's move on to the second question. Which of the following statement about the Nickel AM Singapore Dividend Equity Fund is false? The fund is available for investing via cash, SRS, and RSP. DBS and Capital N can be found within the fund's top five holdings. The fund does not take a balanced approach of capital appreciation and dividend yielding income. Quite a lot of words out here, could be a little tricky, which is the false statement. Remember, you have to be fast. 
And let's see, 21% chose the first statement that it's available via cash, SRS and RSP. 11.3% chose the second statement, but it seems that the majority of you have got this question right. Yet again, 66.96% chose the last statement. Alright, congratulations. We've got Chi Ho, IGS, Bani Manto, Chongqin, Julie, and JH Chai. It seems that our top six ranks have pretty much kept their positions. Let's see if our next four ranks will be able to catch up. Good luck to all of you. Let's move on to question number three. Which of the following markets have underperformed in 2021? Is it Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia? or Singapore. This is a pretty important one. Which of the following markets have underperformed in 2021? Note, if your result screen shows you between rank 1 and 6, at the final leaderboard, make sure to take a screenshot showing the whole activity window, including your rank, score and nickname. All right, this is question number three. Just a few more questions to go. It seems that the majority of you have got it right yet again. 70.59% chose Malaysia, with only 4% choosing, choosing Indonesia, Singapore, and Thailand. Congratulations to all 70.59% of you out there. We'll be moving on to the leaderboard and then question number four very shortly. Wow, it seems that some of the names have jumped. Now it's Chi Ho, IGS, Chongqin, Bani Manto, Julie, and JH Chia. Let's see if our rank 7 to 10 managed to switch. How did you guys fare? I see some new names. Congratulations once again. Let's move on to question number four. Which of the following is not a reason why India should be on investors' radars? Which of the following is not a reason? Positive secular trends in the capital markets? India, like China, is evolving into a strong Asian economic giant. Or is it the third statement? India equity market has high correlation with US equity market. Which of the following is not a reason? Once again, you have to be quick, but you have to be accurate. Which is, which is not a reason why India should be on investors' radar? Wow, impressive. 85.12% of you got it right. Yes, it is the last statement. India equity market has high correlation with US equity market. Only a small percentage of you chose the first and the second statement. So good luck. We've got one more question to go. Let's check out our leaderboard. Well, I see the names have pretty much maintained. Come on, you can do it. Rank 1 to 6, we still have Chi Ho, IGS, Julie, Bunny, JH Chia, and Chong Chin. Let's see if the ranks will change for our final question. Which of the following is not an investment theme in the US that have emerged coming out of the pandemic? Firstly, financials. Secondly, real estate. Third, healthcare innovation. And fourth, consumer spending patterns which is not an investment theme in the US that emerged out of the pandemic. Once again, we'll show you the leaderboard very quickly. So make sure to take a screenshot for our rank, rank 1 to 6. All right, Make sure that the entire activity window is captured and it shows your rank score and nickname. And impressive, the majority of you got it right again. The correct answer is real estate. All right, and coming up in second place in the voting, it was consumer spending patterns, but real estate is the correct answer. And this is our final question. Congratulations to all six of you rankers, IGS123, Chi Ho, Julie, JH Chia, Chongqin, and Bunny Manto. To our rank seven to tens, congratulations. It was a great try and you were so close, but don't worry, we've got more to come. And to the rest of you, thank you for taking part. To our winners, make sure you email the screenshot, all right, of the leaderboard. Make sure you have the whole activity window. Email the screenshot, including your name, FSM account number, and the daily quiz date to events at funsupermart.com. Once again, the email is events with an S at funsupermart.com by 31st of January to claim your prize. All right, and this wraps up day one of what and where to invest 2022. But of course, 
the show must go on. So please join us again next week on the 15th of January, 10 a.m. for another lineup of insightful presentations as well as another chance to join the daily quiz and our lucky draw. You can check out what is ahead as well by visiting whatandwhere.fsm1.com and clicking on the program tab. Thank you and see you next week.